It's just loading again. Babe. Ma'am, you're live. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone from the UK. Good afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Welcome to our Slow Loris, uh, Slow Loris Outreach Week, first ever annual conference. I'm really excited that we've had nearly 200 people as of yesterday sign up to watch this meeting, and I hope you are joining us. Thank you for all of our speakers um, who are already here with us. And um, yeah, so I would just like to give some information about the day, how it's going to be wo to work. We are streaming live on Facebook, so all of the talks will be recorded so you can watch them again at a later date. Some of our speakers will be speaking live. Some of them are using pre-recorded talks because some of them are on unstable internet. So I do suspect there will be some technological hiccups along the way. Please be patient. Although the power of the Zoom meetings is really wonderful and helps us to connect, we also can have um, we also can have technological issues as well. So I hope everything will go well. So um, I would just like to say something about Slow Loris Outreach Week. We started this in uh, uh, nine years ago uh, as a way to let people around the world know about slow lorises and their conservation plight. We now recognize nine species of slow lorises. And in the last year, they've all come out on the IUCN red list as uh, endangered or critically endangered um, or in a threat category. So there are still three species from Borneo that are listed as vulnerable. We of course also have the slender lorises and their IUCN updated red list categories will be coming out soon. But we know that um, these animals are also declining rapidly. And in Sri Lanka, they actually are all endangered or critically endangered. So it's very important that we uh, can recognize that people around the world are finally starting to study these animals for the first time. We have some speakers today from countries where there have been very few published studies of slow lorises and, sl and slender lorises. So we're going to be seeing some of their data for the first time. We have researchers from the field, researchers who are working from rescue centers, and also um, researchers working on taxonomy and health of lorises. So hopefully we are going to get a whole new perspective from across their range and um, be enlightened how about about these animals and inspire some of you to study them for the first time in, in many sites. As we know with other primates, we have a single species that's studied hundreds of times at novel sites. We're lucky with slow lorises if we have one small place where people are, are studying them as well as the slender lorises. I'm just gonna say lorises. I just would also like to say, I just had a message that if you don't have a Facebook account, it seems not to be working. So, I think, I, I think we're gonna to have to send an email to participants to invite them to the Zoom meeting. So if you've had a, a, a message from someone that they cannot watch it on Facebook because they don't have a Facebook account, if you can have them email us, um, I suppose we will put an email address in the chat where you can email us or we'll put an email address on Facebook. We can put info at littlefireface.org. Um, and that way we can, we can only know if one of your friends can't watch it, but we're going to try to send a message to the attendee list as well and see what we could do about that. So I already apologize for this first technical glitch. I would just like to thank the two co-organizers or the main organizers, Anna Watkins and Smitha, or Daniel Smitha. Um, they've been amazing organizing this and emailing everyone and getting these talks to work for you today. And Smitha is going to be your main host introducing the speakers today. And so you will, she's working on Slender Lorises in India, and she's going to be speaking later today. I think I actually don't have much more to say as an introduction. Uh, I would like us just to be able to make sure everybody can watch since I've had these messages. So um, our first speaker today, uh, Smitha, are you going to introduce our first speaker today? So I'm gonna pass over to Smitha and I'm gonna go check my info at littlefireface.org email and just make sure everything is operating. So, um, and I will be back later today when I'm more awake because I'm completely nocturnal and it's very early here in the UK. So I hope everyone really enjoys the day and um, I hope we have some exciting messages in the chat 
Don't feel shy, ask the speakers lots of questions. And if you do see anything like you can't hear or can't see, just let us know and we will try to accommodate the technological issues. So over to Smitha. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, our first speaker today is going to be uh, Dr. Hiroko Somura, who is an assistant professor at the Jikai University School of Medicine. She studies the genetics of the slow lorises in Myanmar. However, today she will be talking about the biological research in Myanmar on the slow loris. Over to you, doctor. Yes. <laughs> okay. Can I start? <laughs> okay. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Hiroko Somura. I'm very glad to join this remote conference. Uh, today, I would like to introduce my research in Myanmar. Basically, my major is genetic research in genus nicked caves, but uh, today's topic is not genetic, but the uh, biological one. The reason I started this study in Sloloris was the captive conservation of uh, smuggling Sloloris in Japan. Mainly, I study species identification by DNA, and I classify the specimen kept at the zoo. Since there were uncleared specimens genetically among them, the research in the native countries were started. The most notable things in to clear, uh, clarify what is happened in the area where Nicktekebs Kokan and Nicktekebs Bengalanges sympatrically in South Thailand. And I also interesting in confirm, confirmation the existence of Nicktekebs Kokan in Southern Myanmar and the current status of the former subspaces named Nicktekebs Kokan Tenasenimensis in Southern Myanmar as well. Therefore, my investigation was started. However, when I started the survey in the southernmost area of Myanmar, I heard the following stories from local fishermen. Slow lollies eat crab. I see slow lollies from the boat at the working area in Mangrove. I've seen slow lollies walking on the Tidal Flat. They can swim. My impress was that the primates living in the mangrove was a club eating macaque, so I was surprised. And then I became know the truth. I conducted a survey using four methods. They were approved by MOU between Myanmar and our university and a cook for the university. We also obtained CITES permission to bring back hair samples to Japan, which are indispensable for my main research. About interview. First of all, I asked uh, several questions about respondent oneself, such as religion, nation, sex, age, and occupation. The main purpose of the questionnaire was to grasp the habitat situation of Sloloris in mangrove area. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Additionally, I asked about other animals that they find in the same areas. About the habitat survey, observed from the waterway, both environment and wildlife and landed and investigated inside of the forest. The bird camera trap, I decided the location of the camera trap according to the purpose, uh, according to the purpose. For example, the point to cross the waterway, the point that the sororis creep over the mud flat, the point of a flowering tree at where we caught a slow lorries before. And about uh, radio telemetry. 
Since the mangrove area is constantly subject to blackish water and it is difficult to land at night and walking around while tracking animals, we adapted data collection using a GPS color. Since the total weight of the colors is 33 grams, the wearing animal was selected so that weight of the color does not exceed 5% of body weight. They had no custom and catching and killing or eating slow lollies. Slow lollies have been in the mangrove since there was a steel forest uh, around. About other wild animals, respondents told me otter, mouse deer, crab eat macaque, civet, bat, etc. As the answer was given in the interview, Footprint of club eat macaque and oriental small claw otter were found. Mangrove tree spaces are abundant. We could observe apple mangrove, black mangrove, liver mangrove, cannonball mangrove, gray mangrove, which grow at the waterfront. In addition to aquatic organisms and lots of us as well. Most of them were insects because they were shooting videos at night. In addition, the camera was submerged to, due to the influence of the high tide and there were scenes which fish were swimming. Only one mammal could be photoed on the tree was a squirrel. I was able to photograph an animal moving on the ground at low tide, but uh, unfortunately the animal species could not be identified because rough image. From the size and its movement, it might throw lollies, but not concluded. And uh, about the radio telemetry, four GPS color were attempted to be deployed. The first one dropped into the blackish water by the next day, and the second one used the color of the first one as it was, and put it on for a short period of time. However, no data was obtained due to a problem caused by the submergence. The third and fourth color were deployed at the same time and retrieved uh, four months later to collect the data. Sur surprisingly, the second individual, K34, has a baby at the time of recapture. Regarding the third and fourth individual, number K42 and 44, the reception of VHF signals were completely cut off from the day after deployment. And the condition of the color when we retrieved them was as shown on the slide. From the situation of damages, it seems that the damages were done by someone else, not by person himself. The image on the slides are the point of all GPS information of, for uh, number K42 and K44. Consider, considering the accuracy of location information, we select the one with HDOP value of two or less and uh, adapted only the result of our location information obtained by five or more satellites. The next table shows the calculated area of active activity over 12 days from the date of deployment. The analysis software QGIS version 3.4 were used for the calculation. The total area used by K42 and K44 as home range during the 
21 days were 6.1665 hectare and 16.9391 hectare respectively. The slide shows the GPS locations information of a K42 at 6 a.m. Uh, light green, noon red, 6 p.m. light blue, and midnight yellow using the analysis software ArcGIS. This slide is the GPS data of K44. Comparing to K42, whose habitat is limited to mangrove forest, K44, whose home range is faced to mixed forest and rubber plantation, usually rest, uh, rest in mangrove forest during the daytime, but uh, at night, it seems to be widely active from the waterfront of the mangrove forest up to the lava plantation. About swimming. Unfortunately, I didn't have the chance to see Sororis was swimming. However, there is some evidence Sororis can swim. First one, not only a person, but several fishermen saw Sororis swim. Second, Sororis' hair on the tree were wet. And third, there were track that crossed the waterway by GPS road. The width of the waterway is about 13 meters and the canopy does not intersect. And I try to make the animal swim. After sampling, I release the animal to the surface of the water from, from the boat and observed. Please see the video. He didn't seem to swim for the first time. Sometimes lorries were found on the tree isolated from the land. It is well known that the lorries fall off branches and escape to avoid attack from the predator and or to avoid a struggle for territorial battles. They may not swim willingly, but it seems that he may have fallen into the water and run to swim from such behaviors. We need more research about it. Mangrove are plants that have important characteristic in soft global environment problem. For some plants, Pollination efficiency affect the maintenance of uh, ecosystems. During night survey, many sororis were found in flowering mangrove, especially upper mangrove. Some individual has a pollen cover face. This mangrove flower begins to bloom around 6 p.m. and secretes a large amount of nectar once at night. In addition, many insects also gathered at the time of bloom. Many of these insects also can be diets of sororis. Such an environment was also considered suitable for the habitat of sororis. The mangrove forest was home to make many kinds of birds, such as play, waterfall, parakeets, and woodpeckers, as well as mammals, such as a uh, crab eat macaque, river otter, civet, bat, and squirrels, reptiles, and a wide variety of insects and abundant aquatic organisms. The environment of these mangroves seems to be retained a uh, sufficient habitat compared to the original habitat of Sloloris. Fishermen in this area do not actively captive wildlife such as slowlories. About slowlories, they have the image of an unlucky animal 
in the old tradition. So they said, I want bring it back home. But they didn't drive through Loris away or keep when he saw it in the working site mangrove. Loris, who contributes to the growth of mangroves as a pollinator and the villagers who obtain the various foods and the materials from the mangrove forest that are cultivated and maintained by it. The relationships between villagers and Sorolores seems very nice. Okay. I'd like to say thank you to the Nature and Wildlife Conservation Division, Ministry of Forest and Environment, and villagers in Marijuan Co-Town, GK University School of Medicine Co-Research Facility for Basic Science. At the last, I hope, please check for Sororis in the mangrove forest for you, uh, of your countries. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so uh, Dr. Hiroko, we have some questions that has come in. Uh, okay. Our first question. So our first question would be from Amin. Uh, his question is: did, did is there any predator live in the river? Did you find any predator in the river? Uh, me too. Mm -hmm. Excuse predator. me. Did you find any predator for the slow oh. lorises in the river? Uh, not directly to observe, but uh, um, civet or some uh, many kind of uh, play, um, so pl play, you know, the birds um, mm -hmm. are, are there, <laughs> the same place. Okay. Uh, our next question is, for such field survey, camera trap studies, do you think placing cameras higher on trees would be helpful? and the uh, usage of law, like something to camouflage them? Uh, excuse me, I'm not so good at doing this, so maybe, okay. So, uh, cameras, uh, do you think using camera traps would help? Yes. And uh, would it help if the cameras are kept high up in the trees? Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. because of the um, tide is uh, very changed. So uh, sometimes we need to put the camera on a higher place. Mm -hmm. Okay. So but the, even though the, sometimes the more than the four meter, around the three or four meters, the water level is a change. It's a very difficult to set up the camera. Nice. Yes, I can imagine. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hiroko. Uh, okay. Because of the shortage of time, I'll have to, I cannot take more questions. But if anybody have any questions, please write to us. Uh, and uh, we will be forwarding them to Dr. Hiroko. Thank you, sir. Okay. Up next is, uh, up next is Hassan Al-Razi from Bangladesh. Hassan is a wildlife biologist and has begun his studies in Sachadi National Park, where between 2000 and, uh, 2015 and 2016, he conducted some uh, uh, Bengal slow loris activity uh, studies. And then later on, he conducted research on the distribution and conservation of the species in the entire state of uh, Northeast ba Bangladesh. So he has over five years experience working in the field. He will be talking to us about the slow loris research and conservation in Bangladesh. Hassan? Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Hassan al Raji from Bangladesh, and I'm going to share my experience on slow loris research and conservation in Bangladesh. Uh, before stating the main part, I want to share uh, the beginning story of uh, our, my work. Okay. Okay. 
uh, in 2015, I was thinking uh, about uh, doing something for slow loris, that means uh, any kind of research and conservation on Bengal slow loris. And I con conducted with uh, Dr. Anna Nikaris, and I surprised that uh, uh, very quickly I uh, got a response from her, and she appreciated me to start that work and give some advice. Uh, uh, how can I do this work? And then I discussed with our very own Dr. Sabir Ben Mojafur. Uh, he is an associate professor of uh, UAE University, and he managed some fund for this work. And finally, I went to the forest, and it was our preliminary survey because I was very uh, tensed because. Uh, uh, I thought it is possible or not uh, to find out any slow loris in the wild, but yes, we got two slow loris in that uh, trip, and this is a photo of one. I'm very sorry for this uh, horrible photo because that time we didn't have uh, enough equipment uh, to reduce the, the disturbance uh, of slow lorises. Uh, that's why one of my friends. Uh, captured this photo and uh, he used flash and now we know that it is very harmful uh, for any kind of nocturnal animals and finally uh, I uh, started the Bangladesh Slowlorist Research and Conservation Project uh, with uh, some of my juniors and by some equipment and here you can see a uh, Slowlorist it is a male individual we named it this individual as Montu, and it was the first uh, individual that we started to uh, took activity data. And it was the story of the beginning. And now I want to say a little bit about uh, slow loris in Bangladesh. Uh, we know the distribution range of a Bengal slow loris. It is a little bit uh, wide range animal and found in Bangladesh, Cambodia, China, India, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. In uh, Bangladesh, it is the only one uh, nocturnal primate. Uh, it is uh, globally endangered and endangered in Bangladesh as well. Um, according to IOCN 2020, uh, slow lorises are found in these regions of uh, Bangladesh but the reality is a little bit different. They are only found in the, the Southeast region that means Chittagong and Chittagong hill tracks. There is some uh, forests and some hilly areas and the uh, Silet region that means Northeast part of Bangladesh. And very rarely we uh, found some slow lorries in the Maimanshing uh, division, which is adjacent to the Meghalaya uh, the state of India. And very recently, a few days ago, I got a record of Bengal slow loris from the central part of uh, Bangladesh from the Modhupur National Park. Though it historically, it, it's, uh, it was a good place for Bengal slow loris, but this record is, I think, after 20 or 25 years. Uh, and we uh, conducted our research in two phases. First phase was activity pattern of Bengal slow loris in Shatshuri National Park. And second was population status threat and conservation of Bengal slow loris in Northeast Bangladesh. For the first two works, that means for the activity pattern, we selected a very a small uh, patch, forest patches of Northeast Bangladesh, that is Shatshuri National Park. It is a semi evergreen forest and uh, connected to the other forest of uh, uh, Tripura division, uh, Tripura state of uh, India. For the field method, we uh, spend a 48 night uh, from 24th June 2015 to say 3rd June 2016. And we uh, usually walked uh, through the pre established trail to, um, the trail to find out the slow lorries at an average speed of one kilometer per hour. The recorded activity data, we used the instantaneous focus sampling with uh, five minute intervals. And we, 
we classified their act, uh, the activity of Bengal slow lorises as uh, feeding, traveling, hanging, resting, sleeping, grooming, and others. We conducted the observation of Bengal slow loris for average of 113 minutes on east of the survey night. Uh, it is very difficult to distinguish the individuals in the field, and that's why uh, to the in identify the individuals, we <coughs> the anatomical features. That means shape uh, and size of body, size of the body, shape of the nose, uh, distinct uh, facial mark, ear notch, and elongated nipple of uh, female. And to distinguish the male and female individual, we took the uh, help of the presence and absence of the escorter. Uh, if you see this photo, uh, here is a male individual with a prominent escortum and a female individual with an escortum. And uh, that was the ma field method. Now the result part, uh, total of 120 hour activated, uh, we uh, recorded uh, 120 hour activity data from 1,427 scan. Uh, at first, uh, uh, for this, uh, I want to say about the uh, home range. Individual home range size varies from 0 0.09 to 1.73 hectare, and uh, some individuals share their uh, home range with other individuals. In this table, we can see if, uh, Gultu and Maluti. Gultu is a male individual and Maluti is a female individual. Sorry, they shared their uh, share 22.75% of their total home range with each other. On the other hand, uh, Pintu is a male uh, individual, uh, didn't share any home range with others. Uh, this is the result of uh, the uh, home range. And here is the time activity budget of six slow lorises in, the, in different uh, portion of the night. And uh, this activity, uh, activities for uh, six slow lorises are almost similar in all part of the night. There is no significant difference. But if you see the uh, difference between uh, male and female activity, we can, we can see for feeding, traveling, and hanging, uh, male spend uh, more time than female. But uh, if we see grooming, resting, and sleeping, uh, there is significant difference. Uh, male, uh, female slow lorises spend more time for grooming, resting, and sleeping than uh, males. And uh, for the seasonal variation, uh, we, uh, uh, for rainy season and winter, feeding, uh, grooming, uh, re uh, resting, and sleeping, uh, slow lorises spend more time in the winter season than uh, than the rainy season. But for traveling, uh, slow lorises spend more time in uh, rainy season. That means uh, in rainy season, slow lorises travel uh, more than the winter. And uh, this was the. Uh, result part of our first the research that means activity budget and for the second one population status uh, we selected four forest patches of northeast bangladesh first one is uh, shatshuri national park uh, second one is lawachara national park ramakalinga wildlife sanctuary and adampur reserve forest uh, all are in the uh, northeast part of bangladesh for uh, population survey, we used uh, the Reiki survey method in conjunction with the transit method. And uh, we walked through the uh, pre-established transit at a speed of one kilometer. And we used the escort light eye shine method uh, to find out the lorises. Uh, obviously, we used a headlamp uh, with red uh, filter to reduce the disturbance of light. And here is the result part. Uh, of population status. We covered 107 kilometer over 53 night in the survey, and we found a total of uh, 75 individuals uh, in, in the four protected areas. Here is the detail. Uh, the encounter uh, number was high in uh, Shatshuri National Park. It is 
uh, uh, 34 and in Adampur it is lowest, uh, it is, uh, that means 6. And that's why the encounter rate was higher in Shatshuri National Park, 1.53, and uh, lowest in uh, Adampur uh, Reserve Forest, uh, that is 0 0.16. And uh, we are still working on this data, and that's why it is, uh, that's it for the result part of this work. For the threat, uh, we think uh, the roadkill and electrification mortality is the main threat of Bengal slow lorries uh, in the four forest patches of uh, Northeast Bangladesh because there is a road and electric, uh, electricity supply line through the forest, uh, is, uh, every forest uh, of the Northeast Bangladesh. We recorded two um, the uh, roadkill of two individuals, one from Shatshuri National Park and one from Lawachara National Park during our study. And also six electrocution incidents, so where two individuals died and uh, four injured. If you see this photo carefully, you will see uh, this individual has uh, lost its uh, left hand. It is due to electrocution. And uh, the good thing is uh, this individual has survived. The forest department released this individual in the forest uh, after <laughs> Uh, uh, the treatment, and I heard from the heard from the forest staff. Uh, they have uh, they seen this uh, individual several times, and it is now very healthy and okay. For the conservation uh, initiative, as conservation initiative, we try to convey the conservation message uh, to the forest adjacent people, especially the school going student. We prepared some poster and uh, leaflet with important message and distributed it uh, through the uh, forest, forest adjacent people. And I thought that it is very important to introduce uh, this uh, uh, little known nocturnal primate with the urban people. That's why I give some speech uh, among the school going urban student the university student, the conservationist, and obviously uh, to the forest staff to uh, uh, convey the basis of the importance of slow lotus conservation. And in 2017, for the first time, we have uh, we arranged uh, the slow lotus week on the occasion. The, on this occasion, we arranged a drawing competition among the school going student uh, and they uh, shown a very good performance uh, they uh, draw very very nice uh, slow lorises and other uh, slow lorises and uh, slender lorises and we also rescue uh, two uh, slow loris uh, two individuals one from uh, this one from uh, the Netrokona district which is adjacent to the Meghalaya, the estate of uh, India, and another from a village uh, adjacent to the Shat Lawachara National Park. And we successfully released both individuals uh, to their natural habitat. Uh, uh, overall threats of uh, uh, Bengal slow lorries in Bangladesh, like other primates, uh, the main threats are habitat uh, destruction, forest fragmentation, lack of uh, feeding plan, roadkill and electrification, illegal trading. Uh, to mitigate uh, these uh, the threats, we recommended the forest department to stop the deforestation and protect uh, slow lorries habitat, to, the, to mitigate roadkill and to avoid electrification fatality of the slow lorries in forest patches in Bangladesh. We strongly suggest avoid construction of road and power supply line uh, inside the forest. If it is not possible, then uh, strict control of the speed limit of vehicles inside the forest by creating speed breakers. To avoid electrocution mortality, we should use uh, coated power lines in the forest areas and maintenance of uh, natural canopy breeze and uh, if needed, prepare artificial canopy breeze uh, over the roads and power supply lines for slow lorises uh, as well as other primates. 
And that's it uh, for my part. Thank you, everyone. That was a lovely talk from uh, Bangladesh. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Hassan? Give us a moment, Hassan. We're just trying to find okay. questions on Facebook. I have a quick question for Hassan. Thank you yep. for your talk. It's lovely to see you, Hassan. Um, I'm wondering, in your opinion, with the use of canopy bridges in areas where Loris has also used the electric lines, how would you structure the canopy bridge? Because if you have a Loris getting used to an artificial substrate, like an artificial bridge, they may also then still want to use the, the electric lines because they may be a similar size and shape. So how might you change it so they don't think they're the same thing? Uh, <laughs> it's a good question. And it will be very difficult, uh, but uh, I'm thinking about that because uh, the electric power supply line uh, height is uh, not similar to the canopy of the forest. If we connect the canopies, uh, then I think they will uh, avoid to use the power supply line. If we get uh, uh, away from the tree to tree, then they will avoid uh, power supply lines, I think. Can I ask one more question? In your area, when they're electrocuted on the power supply line, does it happen if they touch a single line or do they have to touch two lines? Uh, two lines, obviously okay. two lines. That's what we see in other places as well. Yeah. Uh, there's one more question, Hassan. Uh, between which individuals relation in the grooming behavior apply amongst low lorises? Sorry? Between which individuals relation in the grooming behavior apply amongst low lorises? Question. Have you observed any grooming behavior in the slow lorises? Could you like inside uh, talk a little bit about the slow loris grooming behavior? Yeah, uh, we have seen. And have we got the question? Yeah, the so individual have... wants to know if any grooming behavior exists, and if they do, uh, yeah, we, yeah. I, I have uh, I have show uh, the, that uh, in the activity budget, um, uh, they have shown the grooming behavior and it is uh, auto grooming, obviously. Okay, so, um, okay, I think we are running short of time. Thank you very much, Hassan. If anybody have questions, please keep posting them. We will be forwarding them to Hassan and he will be answering you later. Up next, we have uh, Dr. Funso Tinle a wildlife biologist, and he's working for the Royal Society for Protection of Nature in Bhutan. He is one of the six recipients of the prestigious Whitney Award for his lifelong work to preserve the rare alpine musk deer. He works on the slow lorises too in Bhutan. Today, he will be talking to us about the preliminary distribution of the Bengal slow loris in Bhutan. Take it over, sir. Dr. Tinle, yes, you're up. You need to yeah. unmute, sir. Uh, you need to unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I just, uh, I'm, I'm not really familiar with the disable annotation. Is it okay with it? Ah, uh, that's okay. You can just continue. Okay. With it. Okay. Okay. So yeah, uh, I'm just getting. Uh, with the power share, so I'm just trying to blow up. Can you see my slides now? Yes. Just on a double check. Okay. Okay. So voice is fine. Can you can you all hear my I'm voice? Fine. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. So, fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm, I'm just. I'm not a. I'm not a technologically savvy person, so uh, I'm very much uh, sort of apologetic uh, if. Uh, uh, you know there are some glitches along the along the way. Uh, please bear with me. Thank you so much. Okay, without much ado. Okay. I think you uh, need yeah. to just put your. You need to make your slideshow full screen. Okay. Right. Can you? Okay. I think maybe. Is it full screen? Can you see? Yes. Yes. It, uh, you need to make it full screen. Uh, do you see the uh, third one? Uh, the third icon with the box. Just press that. Third icon with the box. That one, yeah, the one, yes. 
this one uh no 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 no, no. just press this one you mean no okay ah uh, maybe uh, because i have two windows because i'm i have two computers uh two screens so i'll just uh, disable the other screen yeah okay just can you hold on yes okay uh Okay, I'll try to do once again. Okay, can you see now? That's yes. great. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, I just disabled the, the second screen, so that's it. That's okay. So without much ado, I would like to present uh, about the slow loris in Bhutan, uh, the preliminary distribution of Bengal slow loris in Bhutan. Uh, there were some anecdotal information about uh, snow leopards, in, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, Bengal slow loris in Bhutan. And uh, we really didn't know where they were exactly occurring. So we uh, wanted to uh, understand their distribution in Bhutan. So that's one of the primary motivation. So I have structured my presentation uh, uh, with uh, six themes. So first I wanna introduce about, uh, and then I would like to give a short uh, 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 explanation about the study objectives, then materials and methods, results, con uh, conservation implications, and then the future plans. Okay, so with the introduction, uh, slow loris, uh, everybody knows, are, are poorly known because of their predominantly nocturnal habit. And uh, the Bengal slow loris, among the I think the eight recognized uh, species of uh, lorises. I think Bengal slow loris is most widely distributed, uh, and uh, it's recently categorized as uh, end endangered in the IUCN red list. Uh, previously, it was vulnerable, and uh, its occurrence and distribution in Bhutan uh, uh, was poorly known. Uh, and uh, until recently, Bhutan was not recognized as a Bengal loris uh, range country. So we just wanted to uh, find out uh, where these low lorises are distributed in Bhutan. So that's why we wanted to understand uh, loris distribution and also would like to recommend uh, further directions uh, for, uh, for future investigations. So with the methods, uh, you know, uh, before I talk about methods, I would like to talk about Bhutan. Uh, briefly talk about Bhutan. For those of you who are wondering about where Bhutan is, Bhutan is a small country in the Eastern Himalayas, uh, bordered by China and India. And uh, Bangladesh is a little closer uh, towards the south. We have Nepal towards the east. So this is uh, where Bhutan lies in the South Asia. And uh, this is the map of Bhutan. Bhutan is size of country is roughly uh, 38,000 uh, square kilometer. And uh, the country is, uh, is administratively, administratively divided into 20 districts. And uh, we have uh, roughly uh, half, almost 50% of the country designated as protected areas, uh, protected areas network consist, uh, comprising, uh, consisting of uh, uh, national parks and the interconnecting biological corridors. So we have uh, 10 protected areas uh, and uh, biological corridors. So the protected areas uh, constitute 40% of the country and the biological corridors constitute uh, most of the country. So uh, we, uh, we uh, you know, since basically we, are, we were starting from the scratch, you know, uh, so therefore we uh, started with uh, interviewing local people. So we printed out uh, some images, uh, color, color photographs of uh, lorises. And then we went out to the, to the places where they, are, where, where they are expected to occur. So we uh, showed the color printed images of lorises uh, and uh, told the villagers whether they have seen these uh, uh, in, the, in the adjacent uh, forests. Uh, and uh, and we asked uh, uh, you know both males and females, and then we also asked uh, uh, forestry professionals because uh, they are also constantly uh, in in touch with the locals as well as 
uh, sometimes you know they 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 also each of the duty they have to be constantly in the in the forest uh, and you know they might have uh, chance upon this uh, species uh, knowingly or unknowingly so we also showed them uh, the loris uh, photographs because uh, uh, slow loris because uh, it is a, it's a nocturnal and highly cryptic uh, animal uh, not many people have seen so i think uh, showing the uh, printed uh, color photographs uh, of the species was really helpful. And then uh, we also visited uh, uh, forestry offices and we dug up their field reports, wildlife rescue reports, and, uh, and uh, you know, we personally talked with the, the field uh, offices as well. Uh, and uh, the results. So first I would like to begin with the rescue reports. So in 2014, uh, the staff of Royal Manas National Park and the uh, staff of Sarwang Territorial Forest Division, they, uh, they rescued an individual from uh, Southern Bhutan in, in Sarwang district, uh, closer to uh, the Indian state of Assam. And uh, this individual was uh, rescued uh, seemingly after a forest fire incident in the, uh, in the Indian, Indian sta uh, site. So it just crossed the border and it was uh, found a little injured. So they rescued it and uh, it had, uh, I think, uh, injury on the right hand. So again, a similar incident in 2016 in the same locality, uh, another individual was again rescued, uh, probably after a fire incident again. And uh, so uh, if you look at the respondent profile, you know, we interviewed around 447 individuals uh, and these are the age profiles. So we uh, interviewed uh, individuals greater than, uh, older than 20 years. And uh, most of the, our respondents were within this uh, age range. And uh, uh, if you look at the number of people who have actually seen the slow lorises, uh, there are uh, out of 447, uh, only 22 people actually saw the loris. 11 people they claimed uh, this, they claimed to have seen the lorises, but uh, when we uh, asked follow up questions and we, when we have the description, the, the phenotypic description of the uh, animal, uh, the morphological descriptions were more or less uh, similar to other creatures like Chinese pangolin and uh, uh, Indian palm civets. So we, we disregarded them. And uh, of the 22 people who have seen the loris, uh, 18 were the local people and only four were the forestry staff. So this is the profile. And uh, you know, uh, in 2017, one of the forestry staff who works in the forestry resource, uh, sorry, I'm so sorry with this one, he works at the Forest Resource uh, uh, Management Division in Thimpu. He was on an official tour in South and he luckily saw a slow loris actually walking along the insulated power cable. So I think uh, in the previous presentation, Mr. Hassan uh, uh, referred to incidences of uh, loris death uh, as a result of electrocution. Uh, we, we do not have any records as of now, but uh, you know, uh, we have seen, we have the documented evidences of lorises uh, tra traversing along the uh, insulated power cables. Although we don't have any lorises death uh, uh, because of the, uh, as a result of electrocution, but we have many incidences of uh, lorises killed, uh, no, uh, many incidences of golden langurs, another endangered uh, primate, uh, you know, being killed uh, as a result of uh, electric shocks on the power cables. So if we, if we actually now uh, try to georeference, so we, when we ask the local, locals, we also uh, told them to pinpoint, uh, you know, and uh, we, we told them to actually give us uh, some locations uh, of the places where they have seen, the location attributes of the places where the, they have seen the lorises. So we georeference them, and this is how we found uh, their distribution along the southern, uh, southern border. And uh, this is how it looks like when we zoom out. 
So if we if you look back here, uh, most of these distributions are along the uh, uh, international border with India in the south. So now the uh, conservation implications. Our study is the first of its kind uh, on the slow, uh, Bengal slow loris in Bhutan. And our study confirms the presence of Bengal loris in Bhutan in addition to the an anecdotes. So Wang Chuk, 2004, and Mr. Chowdhury, et, uh, Chowdhury uh, he's, he's an Indian professional who happened to visit Bhutan for some time. Uh, for a, or for a kind of a primate excursion trip in Bhutan. And he confirmed, uh, he, he actually wrote in his paper about uh, seeing some lorises in Bhutan, but he hasn't given the location attributes. Uh, so, and uh, uh, what we would like to assert is that uh, from our study, we would like to actually assert that uh, local people and uh, uh, field staff are important reposit uh, repository of uh, information about wildlife. So, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, especially with regard to lesser known species and cryptic species, uh, in, sometimes we can actually get information about those species from the local people and field forestry staff. And uh, as I remarked earlier, uh, most of the sightings and rescues were made uh, closer to the Indo-Bhutan border. So this actually necessitates uh, transboundary uh, conservation collaboration uh, between Bhutan and India. Uh, it's not that we are uh, such a thing, uh, it's, it's not that such a thing is not happening as of now. We have uh, good uh, records of uh, transboundary collaboration, uh, especially with uh, tiger conservation. So um, there is a WWF funded project, Tramka, which uh, actually brings uh, together people from uh, Royal Manas National, National Park, from Sarbang Forest Division, from 50 Wildlife Sanctuary, uh, and the uh, Indian counterparts from Indian Manas. So there is a transboundary collaboration already happening. So we can actually broaden the scope of those uh, transboundary collaboration by incorporating some additional species like uh, primates, uh, especially primates like lorises and and, uh, and golden angus. So yeah, this is uh, what I've uh, said earlier. So the future plan, you know, now you know this is just a snapshot uh, view of uh, slow lorises in Bhutan. Now we need to actually really do some more detailed study to confirm, you know, uh, to open up uh, and to actually. Uh, understand their real distribution in Bhutan. Uh, we might also uh, have to do some detailed, uh, maybe population study to understand the population status. So like uh, our previous presenter, uh, uh, Mr. Hassan from Bangladesh, he showed about uh, camera trapping and night search and all those uh, survey methodologies. They, we would like to actually experiment. We would like to actually replicate them in Bhutan to understand the uh, the uh, uh, to estimate uh, population abundance and density, and also the exact distribution, and then uh, we would also like to conduct long-term ecological studies such as feeding and habitat selection and all those activity patterns. So we would definitely like to actually dig deeper into the ecology of the species, and then uh, then following up on those findings and studies. We, we would also like to pursue with some awareness campaigns for locals, uh, especially, you know, to report to the forestry officials, which they have been doing uh, right now, especially if they encounter upon some injured uh, uh, animals, they can definitely actually uh, uh, report the uh, nearby forestry offices. So uh, what I have presented is actually, uh, it's, it's just a, uh, summary or is a distillation of the nuggets from our paper uh, recently published in journal, uh, IUCN Journal Primate Conservation. So you all are uh, welcome to actually download this. This is an open access uh, article. And uh, if you are interested in further detail, all of those what I've said and further details are actually can, are available from this paper, uh, which is uh, accessible from the journal Primate Conservation. So with this, I would like to thank you all. 
for your patient listening and I would be happy to take in some questions. Uh, yes, Dr. Tinley, that was wonderful. Uh, yeah, there are some questions. Uh, is there evidence to show that slow lotus deaths by electrocution have been prevented or reduced due to the insulated power cables? Uh, no, not really, because just now in Bhutan, uh, as I've say, said earlier, we don't have many uh, evidences of slow loris uh, occurrences in Bhutan. Those are the only evidences we have so far. So we don't, uh, we don't have any answers uh, just now for lorises because we need more evidences. But uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have evidences of uh, you know, animals uh, being protected uh, from electrocution by those insulated cables. Like for example, uh, the, uh, we have uh, in Popjika, which is in, in central Bhutan, we have, uh, I, think, I think somewhere in Western Bhutan, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, insulated cables uh, in, in the Black Night Crane area. So Black Night Crane areas are actually, uh, actually safe uh, from those insulated power cables. Okay. Uh, Benjamin would want to know, uh, he congratulates you. He says, nice work with the Bhutan Morrison. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank did you. Did you serve yeah. in higher altitudes? Sorry? Is it, did you survey in higher altitudes? Is there an uh, altitude gradient? No, no, not yet. Just now, whatever we have found out is based preliminary on social, uh, social studies. So we have actually uh, uh, interviewed local people and we just uh, got the uh, location the georeference locations from what uh, the locals have reported. So we uh, we actually didn't do any service. It's all based on uh, the information provided to us by the locals. And uh, you know the the locals uh, actually they have already seen this uh, uh, this creature in Bhutan, and they have been wondering you know uh, what kind of a species it would be because it really looked weird to them. Some of them they saw this for the first time in their life. And uh, they already had a mental picture of this species. So they were really delighted when we showed them the photographic evidences, we, when we showed them the, uh, the color printed uh, image of the loris. And they said like, you know, they saw it, especially when they were. So uh, in Bhutan, uh, we have uh, mostly the men, they roam into the forest for collection of timber and non-timber products. Some go for cattle grazing, some go for maintenance of power cables. So that's the time they encountered this species in the forest. Oh, okay. So I, I can imagine they would have thought it's a complete different animal. In India, people think they're ghosts in many parts. Uh, uh, just to follow up again, I just would be very brief in my response. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chowdhury, 2008, uh, just 2008, because he's uh, referring to his 2008 study. In his uh, paper, he published the same uh, paper in Primate Conservation. In his uh, study, he mentioned that uh, the slow lorises could be found below 500 meters in Bhutan. Okay. And Adrian wants to know, uh, did you survey on the local people's belief system or traditional belief system with regards to the lorises? Uh, yeah, we asked them, but, uh, you know, as I've said, uh, most, for most of them, this is the first time they have seen. Uh, and uh, that's why, uh, you know, uh, since it doesn't even have a local uh, a local name, so to actually uh, see whether there is any kind of uh, cultural uh, belief associated with the species. And uh, yes, Louis was going to ask if the local people are scared of them as just seeing shiny eyes in the night. So did you. Doctor, you, yeah, you mentioned about Dr. Chaudhary's reaction. So did you, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, some of them expressed really fear. Some thought it would be a very bad omen to see such a weird creature. And, you know, definitely with a very bulging and round eye and, uh, and moving very slowly, uh, like uh, very suspiciously. So some of them, yeah, they really uh, expressed some kind of a frightening experience with this uh, upon seeing the species. Yes. Anna, ma'am, do you have any questions you want to ask him? Yes. Um, thank you so much for your talk. And uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm delighted you 
said yes and agreed to speak and I was really happy to read your paper as well oh, because um, Thanks. having done the red list assessment etc for slow lorises when I found the Chowdhury paper and I saw that Bhutan was the location I was mm -hmm. surprised you know I was very surprised because as you say it was very rarely written about as a location and so I have a couple of questions for you um, when okay. you did the interviews did you only cover that area with the border to India or did you do it in other parts of the country, in the north or the west particularly? Uh, no, we didn't do that because we just followed uh, the previous anecdotal information. So that's how we zoomed into the, uh, uh, the 3,000 areas, uh, 3,000 districts, uh, Sarbang, Shemgang, uh, uh, Pemagasal and Samdurang, I think the four districts, yeah. So we just focus on those uh, southern uh, areas where they are likely to be found. So we really didn't cover in other areas. But maybe in future, if you really want to do the extensive study, we might actually uh, sort of broad, broaden the study area and uh, see where they are actually found. So my next question is, especially in the western part of the country, I'm looking at a map at the same time. Um, are, mm -hmm. What is the habitat like in the west? Because you had a yellow, very large national park in the sort of yeah. northwest. And are there other primates mm -hmm. that you know are there that are sympatric with the lorises in the uh, Indian border area? Yeah, actually lorises are sympatric with uh, golden langur, uh, then... Uh, lorises are sympatric in the east, southeast of Bhutan. Uh, the lorises are sympatric with uh, cap langur as well. Then lorises are also sympatric with uh, Assamese macaque and rhesus macaques. Yeah. But uh, in the, uh, we are actually ruling out the presence of lorises in the, in the uh, western part of Bhutan because uh, that is the one which is adjacent to West Bengal state of India. And those areas are, are densely populated by humans. So, and there is, there is much actually forest adjoining. So we ruled out that, but I think in, in, the, in the future service, we might have to actually uh, extend our service there to really confirm the presence or absence of the species there. Because the last thing I would like to say on that point is I've um, always wondered what might be the geographic boundary that wouldn't allow lorises to go into that area. For example, no one has ever found them in Nepal so that's why I was looking a lot at the West because there's that gap with India and then you move into Nepal and it would be amazing if we found yet another Loris range country. Um, but is there is there a geographic boundary that you think would prevent their movements further north? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, I would like to actually pick up on that. I think that gives me a good uh, avenue to actually talk about biogeography of primates in Bhutan. If you look at the langurs, especially, if you look at the, gold, we have three langurs, we have golden langur, the, uh, the Hanuman langur and the cap langur in Bhutan. So if you look at the, actually the geographic distribution of the langurs, uh, we have found out that the big rivers, river systems in Bhutan, they were the physical geographic barriers for the distribution of the species. But recently with the uh, increase in the construction along the rivers, uh, some species have been actually uh, moving across the bridges and there were some hybrids, especially we have the hybrids of golden langurs and cab langurs because they belong to the same genus. Uh, so you know, Trachypithecus is the genus. So there are, we, we have now seen uh, well-established uh, uh, population of uh, hybrids between golden langurs and cab langurs. So definitely, uh, you know, with the increase in the man-made structures like permanent bridges, uh, definitely the species uh, geographic isolation is a little bit diffuse, it's, it's getting complicated. Uh, so yeah, I would, I, would, I would say the big river systems, because in Bhutan, we have the three major river systems. One is the Puna Sangchu in the west, in the, in the middle, uh, middle we have the, uh, uh, the Manas River Basin. In the east, we have the, uh, yeah, the Kolongchu uh, drains into the Mangdichu, uh, I think the Dangmechu drains into the uh, Manas uh, river system again. So all the big river systems, the big rivers, they uh, actually were serving as uh, physical barriers for the distribution of the species. So I would, su I would suspect that Puna Sangchu or, uh, in the West could be the westernmost limit for slow lorises. That's just my hypothesis, yeah. It's yet to be proven. Uh, Samrat has a question for you. Are they okay. most commonly found in the foothills? 
till what elevation extent have you recorded them yeah uh, yeah so as i've seen uh, as i've said earlier i think the slow lorries actually uh, in india the that's just my again uh, uh, wild scientific guess in uh, in india i think the stronghold for slow lorries is assam because there is a rich forest cover in assam in the foothills so assam is basically the elevation would be like uh, um, uh, 90 to 100 uh, meters above sea level. So uh, uh, the, uh, the areas along the southern border in Bhutan, uh, adjoining India, the, uh, the elevation is uh, somewhere between uh, 100 to 500 meters. So uh, my, my, my uh, wild scientific guess is that the distribution limit in Bhutan is from 100 uh, meters to 500 meters. 500 meters above sea level is the maximum limit, I'm guessing. In Bhutan. Okay. Okay. So thank you, uh, Dr. Tinley. Okay. Thank you very much. So next up, we have a speaker from Singapore, which is rich in diversity of nocturnal mammals, including the elusive Sundra slow loris. Uh, Dr. Tianjiao Li is manager of terrestrial biodiversity at Singapore Botanical Gardens, and she will be giving us a talk on the Sundra uh, slow loris from Singapore. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Right, so um, good morning and good afternoon everyone. I'm Tian Jiao or TJ from Singapore National Parks Board. And surprise, surprise, I'm going to be talking about the Sunda Slow Loris research in Singapore, which most of you would not have known about. So uh, without further ado, let me pull up my presentation. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Right, okay. So um, I will be telling you a bit about the Sunda Solaris research in Singapore, which I have been working on for the past four to five years. And we are just a tiny red dot in Southeast Asia. We are a very small island country state with a population size of about 5.6 million people. And um, uh, we do have quite a lot of rain and only with more than 2,000 millimeters. And the climate is um, always very humid and uh, the temperature is also quite high with 28.4 degrees Celsius um, throughout the year. And because of rapid development uh, in um, the past few decades, we have unfortunately lost about more than 95% of our primary rainforest. But uh, despite of this loss, we are still one of the cities with the highest green cover. And this is because of our efforts put into greening up the streetscapes, the uh, roofs of urban buildings in Singapore and so on. So even though we are a highly urbanized country, we still have a quite a good green cover in terms uh, of uh, Singapore. So um, within our country, we do have four nature reserves. There are two right in the heart of the island, which is the Central Catchment Nature Reserve and the Bukit Tima Nature Reserve. And we have another two nature areas which are on the northern side, the Sukhan Bula Wetland Reserve, and one at the south, which is the Labrador Nature Reserve. And on top of the four nature reserves, we also have about 20 nature areas all around Singapore. And these nature areas actually serve as very good green buffers at the edges of the nature reserve. And together, they form a dense network of um, green spaces around Singapore, which allows for wildlife to um, move around, um, mostly for the birds and the insects, and of course, for some of our um, other mammals as well. So uh, within our core habitat areas, we do have a good diversity of native animals in Singapore, including 61 species of mammals, quite a number of birds, a lot of insects, and in fact, we have more, more than 8,000 spiders. And spiders is one of our prides because throughout uh, the years, we have been discovering new species on a yearly basis through our very comprehensive biodiversity surveys. And inside our forest, we also have a good network of freshwater streams, which uh, harbors uh, quite a good diversity of freshwater crabs and fishes. And um, of course, we also do have uh, quite a number of herpetofauna. So zooming into the primates, 
we have three species of native primates in Singapore. The most abundant and widespread one is the long-tailed macaques, found in both the forested areas as well as the edges of the forest and even some urban areas. And not so common is the rapper's banded langer. And just recently, this um, langer has been uh, determined to be of a separate species on its own because in the past, it was actually uh, thought to be a subspecies instead. And of course, our topic of interest today is the Sunda snow lorries, which is uh, also critically endangered in Singapore and is only found in our core forested areas. So among all these snow lorises in the world, so far we have recorded two different species of lorises in Singapore. First is the pygmy slow lorries, which is actually a non-native species. And we believe that um, this record uh, actually came from the illegal pet trade and from release of its owners after they decided not to keep the lorries anymore. But predominantly, the species that we have in our forest is the greater slow lorries, also known as the Sunda slow lorries. So locally, the Sunda slow lorries is critically endangered in Singapore. It only exists in uh, isolated pockets and at very low densities. And globally, the status is vulnerable. So in Singapore, it is found mainly in the Central Nature Reserve, as well as one of the offshore islands uh, in Singapore as well. And the most distinguishing feature of the Sunda slow lorries is its very big forward-facing forward, uh, forward eyes and its short muzzle. The skin color is pale grayish to reddish brown with a brown mid also stripe and a dark ring around its eyes. So in terms of habitat and ecology, the Sunda Sol Loris is mostly nocturnal, uh, arboreal, and uh, tends to be on its own. And it feeds on both insects and fruits, as well as some parts of plants, for example, the nectar, the sap, and the gum as well. And it is the only venomous primate and only nocturnal primate in Singapore. So what have been doing? Uh, what have us been doing about this cryptic species in Singapore? The first sighting of the lorries actually uh, came in 1965, which is also the year where Singapore became independent. And subsequently, we did receive some anecdotal reports of the lorries as well, both within the nature reserve as well as some random uh, urban areas as well, believed to be again from the illegal pet trade. And we do have records of this species in the offshore islands as well. But it is only until late 2007 that uh, the first researcher decided to do a comprehensive survey of the lorries in the central catchment nature reserves as well as the buffering areas of the forest. And um, after this comprehensive survey, there was also a, a survey of the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve focusing on all the different flora and fauna in it. And as part of this survey, there were seven sightings of the Sunda Solaris recorded within the reserve. So um, from the history until now, this is about all we know about this species in Singapore. Now, going back to the first comprehensive research done in 2007, the researcher actually covered a total of seven transects. Um, and from the survey for the tra seven transects, unfortunately, he was only able to record two lorises in total. And one of them is the non native pygmy slow loris. The other one is, of course, our Wasunda slow loris. And the pygmy slow loris that was recorded was found actually really high up in the tree, about 30 meters high. And because uh, this researcher also uh, researched on the, the threats to the lorises in Singapore and found that one of the main threats to this species is actually road kills because we do have records of lorises found um, dead on the roads. And uh, he observed that some lorises uh, actually use rattans and lianas to cross the different uh, forest fragments in the forest. So it shows that canopy linkages are actually very important for the survival of this species in Singapore. And uh, knowing, um, with building on the knowledge of the past research, we actually uh, came out with this species recovery program for the Sunda Solaris. And we also came up with a species action plan for five years so that we can uh, have detailed action plans on what we should do to conserve these species in Singapore. It started in 2017, so right now we are in the fourth year of this moving to the five. And our key objectives of this program is really just to understand the basic things about this species, including its density estimates, the spatial distribution, and also to understand this basic ecology. 
And we also hope that um, after we know where they are found, we can call, already call out some of the lorises so that we can further understand like the sleep sites, their home range and the activity patterns. And ultimately, we want to know what we can help um, these lorises by increasing their connectivity, maybe to plant more of their food plants and so on. As part of the spatial distribution survey, we uh, actually went to 17 different transects, both in the Central Catchment Nature Reserve, the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve, and some of the other buffer parks. So the transects are uh, selected based on past uh, research data. So we included the seven that was surveyed by FEM in 2007. And we also uh, included those from anecdotal record, uh, records of Lauris societies. And we um, estimated the locations where they might be found but have not been found in the past. And throughout the uh, one and a half years, uh, we mainly use the method of visual encounter surveys by spotlighting, but uh, because the lorises are really difficult to find, so we try to use um, a better technology in the form of night vision equipment so that we can possibly increase the uh, encounter rate and successful rate. During the surveys, the surveyors work, work at no more than one kilometers per hour. And when we do record a lorries, we recorded information such as their location, their abundance behavior, and also the tree height where the lorises are, are seen. And to uh, also to make the uh, surveys more effective and to make the best use of it, we also recorded information for all the other arboreal mammals that were sighted along with the surveys. And to test for or whether the lorises have a preference to any specific kind of vegetation in a forest, we also collected leaf samples from the trees that they were sighted from, and we sent them to the herbarium for species identification. So uh, earlier I talked about the, the using of night vision equipment, and this is something like a handheld video camera, which you can use to look for animals in the, the wild. And how they work is they actually detect the animals using thermal sensing. So when a hot animal passes through uh, your line of vision, they will actually be illuminated in white color, as you can see like a pangolin here. Uh, that is captured by the night vision equipment. And this is actually a pretty good way of observing them because it's non-intrusive. And you can observe the animals in totally dark conditions without any light at all. So you tend to be recording the natural behavior of the animals without the disturbance that is normally caused by the spotlighting technique. And the, the good thing is you can also record the um, videos of the animals so you can play back them at a later time to review their detailed behaviors. And one advantage of using the night vision equipment above the spotlight panning is that you are able to detect the animals that is masked by dense vegetation. So even if it's in a tree that is about 10 meters deep into the forest, you can still uh, spot the lorries, which is not really possible by using the normal spotlighting technique. And on the right here is a short footage of the Sunaso lorries captured using the night vision equipment. You can see that it's able to capture some patterns of the lorises, and uh, you can tell quite uh, clearly that it is a loris because of the, the forward pointing eyes. They are very big and shiny back at you. And it's also a very good way of uh, capturing their, their behavior in the wild, which you can review at a later time. Right, so the preliminary results for the spatial distribution study is that out of the three cycles of surveys to 17 transects, we managed to record them for a total of eight times, which really shows that the population density of these species in our reserve and nature areas is really low. And when they are recorded, they are recorded at random areas as well. So the distribution is quite spread out and they are not localized to like one or two spots within the nature reserves. And when we spotted them, they are always on a different uh, tree species. So we didn't really uh, find out any obvious preference on vegetation species. But the common uh, thing between all this is that they're usually found on more uh, on taller and emergent trees that are at least 20 meters tall. We did record uh, two lorises on the same tree before, but we didn't see any kind of interaction between the lorises. So, and the rest of the lorises are always recorded uh, on their own. So they are mostly solitary. And we also uh, recorded a loris, which is actually at the edges 
of the nature reserve and within the boundaries of the nature park as well. So it shows that the buffer parks also serve as important habitats for these species. These are the seven different plants that we have identified from our surveys and all of them are native to Singapore. You can see that some of them are also um, locally threatened, some of them have uh, endangered status, some of them are vulnerable and some are even critically endangered. So it shows that the conservation of the different uh, tree species is equally important in order to preserve their natural habitat. Right. And in 2018, we had the honor of going for a study trip to Java to learn about the uh, Javan Solaris research in Chipaganti. And this is really a game changer for us because from this uh, study trip, we actually learned about um, how we can refine our survey techniques better and also the importance of carrying out the radio coloring studies. So the main objective is really to know how the Javan solar researchers have been doing their observation studies of the Javan solar lorries and to know about how um, they actually apply the radio coloring techniques on the lorries as well because uh, we have never done this in Singapore before so we have completely no experience on these things. And the study trip is useful because we have a few good learning outcomes. Firstly, we know that we can definitely enhance our observation studies better by recording more behavioral data of the lorises whenever we encounter them. And also, it's definitely important to do radio coloring study of the species because you need to know where the street sites and their home range are in order to find a way to increase the connectivity between the forests and uh, of course ultimately we want to increase the carrying capacity of their nature habitats in Singapore. Also, um, we learned that it is actually possible to be installing artificial road bridges to link the different fragments together to allow the lorises to have a greater range of areas to roam, to find food and of course to meet other lorises. So after we came back from the study trip, we refined our technique and uh, decided to embark on a new series of behavioral observation studies. So instead of revisiting all, revisiting all the 17 transacts, what we did is that we focused on only four transacts, but we um, conducted a detailed behavioral surveys of the lorises. In total, we conducted about 42 nocturnal surveys in a span of about uh, one and a half years. And the transects that we selected were based on the hotspots with high frequency of occurrence from the past distribution surveys, and also uh, of the lorises that we felt that might be potential for coloring because they are read, uh, quite easily accessible compared to the other spots. When we see a loris in the behavioral observation study, we will record their behaviors, parameters, and of course their GPS locations at every 10 minute intervals for a total of up to two hours if that is possible, or if not until the loris is out of sight for more than 30 minutes. And for this series of surveys, of course, we use the night vision equipment again, and also for red spotlight in order to reduce the kind of disturbance that we are causing to these lorises. And this is the data sheet that we have been using, which is adapted from the Little Fire First project. So thanks to Anna and your team, it was really very useful. So um, we can see that we are recording a lot more parameters uh, compared to the past. And we are also targeting to see whether there's any interaction between lorries and lorries and lorries and other things as well. And we also included these etograms, again, adapted from the Little Fireface project so that uh, different researchers can apply uh, this in their projects and actually know what each of the parameters stands for. So it is definitely very useful. So these are the preliminary results from the behavior observation studies. In total, we recorded 16 Sundasto lorry sightings. And the observation period actually varies quite a, a bit. Usually they are out for only a short period of time, so about 10 minutes, and then they just go missing forever. But there were a few occasions where we, we were really lucky and we managed to observe them for a good one hour and 45 minutes before they disappeared. In two occasions, we also observed two lorises on the same tree, although we didn't uh, observe any kind of interaction between the lorises. So they, they could be a mating pair, but we are not really sure of it. We also found loris, uh, one loris to be eating on 
uh, durian trees, specifically on the flowers. And the interesting thing about this is that this same durian tree was actually used by a common palm civet for at least two weeks before that. And we know that it was there for two weeks because we have been seeing the same civet there when we were doing the surveys. And so far, we have the highest sighting rate in the Central Catchment Nature Reserve. And in fact, we had one loris, which is this one on, on the right, that we suspected to have been seen at least three times. And we are able to identify this particular loris from the rest because in terms of its body size, it's actually much bigger than all the rest that we have seen. And uh, its face is uh, very round, so it's quite easy to distinguish it from the others. But the other lorises that we have seen, we aren't actually able to tell them apart to, uh, into different individuals. When we spotted the lorises, they are not really resting on the trees most of the time. And in fact, they're always actively walking or climbing. So it's actually quite difficult to track them around because they are pretty fast, contrary to the names. And this is a case study of the loris in the Central Catchment Nature Reserve. And uh, we said that this, this is the best spot for the loris so far because out of 14 different surveys, we actually spotted it in seven of the occasions. And most of them are sited quite close to the main entrance of this area. And there was one loris that was also sited on the same tree in two separate occasions. So we felt that there should be some association with this loris and this particular tree. And moving on, we would really like to start doing our radio coloring projects as well, because uh, we know that it's important to radio color them to understand uh, many, many fundamental questions that remain unanswered. So for example, for the six sites, we need to identify the preferred nesting locations and the vegetation type. We need to know what they have been feeding on and what, uh, whether there's any preference in the vegetation types. We also want to know the home range and the area of movement and their possible disposable event, disposal events if possible, so that with this knowledge, we are able to enhance the existing lorries hotspots. We want to plant more of them nesting and food trees so we can attract more lorises to be using these areas so that they can meet more lorises together and hopefully they will increase their reproduction rate. And of course, we also want to know whether there's any way that we can increase the connectivity in the canopy gaps so that we can increase the movement area of the lorises as well. So um, all this can only be done if we conduct uh, radio coloring studies of the loris inside our nature reserves. And when we actually can get a loris to do the coloring project, there are even um, more factors that we can investigate. Because when we catch the lorries, we can, of course, um, take a record of their general appearance. We can measure their body weight and length. We can tell their age and the reproductive stage. And if we decide to collect some samples from the lorries as well, then we can do investigations into their genetics, whether there's any diseases, and even venom analysis. So there are many, many different opportunities of um, increasing our understanding of the Sundarstow lorries in Singapore from just this one project. From our past uh, spatial distribution survey and the behavioral observation survey, we have zoomed into two separate uh, individuals which we felt might have a higher potential for carrying out the radio coloring study. So um, one of it is in a nature park, not really in a nature reserve, but uh, we felt that this loris is suitable because it is really located just next to the park and is in fact the one that we have been observed feeding on the durian flowers. So um, it's quite easy to locate a tree of interest if we want to capture it in the future. And the other loris, of course, is the one that uh, we think has been seen uh, quite uh, frequently. And it is in the Central Catchment Nature Reserve. And the good thing about this loris is that it is found on a very low tree, which is uh, only about 4.5 meters and sometimes lower than that. And that is obviously an advantage to us because it increases the uh, chances of capturing the loris in the wild. And in order to conduct the radio coloring study, we also did some research on the um, type of colors that are available right now, the technology right now, and what could be suitable for this project. And we decided to use the Light Track 20 series from Low Tech because this series actually has a technology which supports the remote downloading of GPS data both by VHF and handheld units. So this means that uh, instead of going out with the um, 
BHF unit and trying to find the lorries to record the data, we can actually download it when we are within the certable, uh, detectable range of the lorries. And it also has got this uh, Swift Fix technology, which allows for an expansion of its battery life, which is an advantage of, as well, because it means that we can actually record data for a longer period of time when the caller is on the lorries. So the proposed tracking period that we are thinking right now is about six months. But of course, in the middle, we will do periodic checks to try to find the animal in the forest and also to continue with our behavioral observation study. But even though we are very keen and enthusiastic about doing this project, there are lots of challenges to us, mainly because of the habitat in Singapore. Mm, the first challenge is that there is really a lack of experience in radio coloring of lorises because prior to my research, there has only been one research on the Sunaso lorry so far. So we really have no experience um, about Stolaris, which is not to talk about the radio coloring. And um, in Singapore, we are actually really protective of our trees, especially in the nature reserve. And we are also particular about the safety of our staff people. So right now, um, only people with a certified uh, tree climbing uh, certificate are allowed to climb the trees. So this will be a big barrier if we decide to go for manual capturing of the lorises as well. And even though we have a pool of people who actually have the, certified, uh, the certificates for tree climbing, none of them are actually familiar with handling animals in the wild. So uh, that is also a challenge to this project. In terms of the habitat, the forests in Singapore are actually really dense. So it's difficult to get around without following the vaccinated paths. And the trees are also very tall. So um, it is not so easy if you actually want to climb the tree to get to the lorries. And the most important factor for this is that the density of the lorises in our parks and nature reserves are really low. So in most of the surveys, you don't really even see the lorries. So that is a major barrier to this. When we do see a lorries, it is usually only active for about 10 to 20 minutes before it goes missing. So um, this gives us a very, very limited uh, light window to do any kind of radio coloring for those lorises. And the lastly, uh, the signal coverage is also really poor and it's partly because we are trying to limit <clears throat> the number of telecom towers that can be built in our nature reserve in order to safeguard the habitat. So even though the radio colors are capable of uh, downloading remote GPS data, um, the signal strain might be too poor for us to utilize this technology uh, in the end. So um, these are the challenges that we are facing right now and we are breaking our brains to try to think of solutions to that. So I invite all of you to give me suggestions and advices on how we can push through with this project. And uh, lastly, I would like to share with you some of the other arboreanos that are also recorded alongside our surveys. The most common animal that we have encountered is the Malayan colodo. We almost um, certainly will always see this animal whenever we conduct the nocturnal surveys. And we also um, do record the hospital flying squirrel, actually, uh, either by visually seeing them or we hear them uh, calling in the forest. There are also two species of civets that are commonly seen in our nature reserves, the common palm civet and the small two palm civet. And even though the long-term cat is a diurnal series and a species and not really nocturnal, we do see them sleeping on the trees when we do go out for the surveys at night. So uh, it's quite uh, interesting to conduct the nocturnal surveys in the Singapore forest, even though we don't really spot the lorises that often as much as we want it to be. And with that, I come to the end of the presentation and I invite you to give me any questions that you might have on hand. Thank you. Ha, Tia Jio, hi. So there are a lot of questions. I'll just start with a really good comment. Uh, Gehen says that uh, he or she would never cease to be amazed at how much biodiversity still survives in Singapore. Also, what a brilliant network of nature reserves. The Singapore Nature Society publish useful publications. So that's a huge compliment for you and your team. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> next, uh, uh, Dorota has a question. Is it possible to have the link to look at the various tree species used by lorises in Singapore? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Would, would it be possible to have the link 
to look at the various tree species used by the lorises? Um, yes, that's what we are trying to look also. Um, you mean in terms of the resources that can be found on IE or? They probably they want to know a list of tree species because it could help in uh, habitat uh, restoration maybe? Oh, or yes, yes, yes. Understand, yeah, or even to understand the kind of uh, microhabitat they would like to live in. I see, yes. So there is actually published papers from the National uh, University of Singapore about the, all the vascular uh, flora in Singapore and that is available online. So that is one of the resources that you can, you can look at. Uh, Cecilia wants to know, uh, were there any repeated sightings of the same individuals in the past studies for Sundra slow lorus? Is there any estimate of gender ratio? Briefly, TJ, can you stop screen sharing now so we can oh, see I you? See. Hello. <laughs> okay, do you want me to repeat the question? Oh, it's about compared with the past research, right? Uh, no, uh, have you... Uh, have, have, have you repeated, was there any repeated uh, sightings of the same individual in the yes. past? Uh, yes, so if you recall my slides, there was one that we said might be a potential loris for the coloring study. So that for that one particular loris, we think we have seen it three times. So, uh, and we are quite sure that it is the same loris based on its size and its uh, general appearance. But other than that, the other lorises are, are either very far apart or very high up. So we can't really distinguish their appearance from the other lorises. So for that part, we are not sure that it is the same loris. So is there any uh, estimate of gender ratio? Uh, for gender ratio, it's the same problem because we can't get a full view of the body of the lorries. It's usually very densely covered. So we aren't sure of the gender of the specific lorries that we have seen. Yes. So we don't really have that statistics right now. Mm -hmm. uh, are we sure that the radio collar use don't interfere on slow lorries movement? This is a question from Nora. So um, there will be some uh, effects of the colors on the lorries, but again, we can try to minimize the impacts as seen from the data fire first project. So you have to choose the color that is very light so that uh, it's less than 3% of the body weight of lorries so that the lorries themselves don't feel like there's stuff attached to them. And you, do, you need to make sure that the neck circumference is fitting as well so that it doesn't choke the lorises. So it, it has to be a balance between like one and the comfort level of the lorries, but definitely it can be done because it is a technique used by many researchers everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Samrat wants to know, when you go for behavior study without using radio collars, how sure can we be that each behavior category has equal probability of detect detection? Um, it's actually quite limited because firstly, the lorises are only active for a while. That the, the window for observing them is like maybe just 10 to 20 minutes. So we can only observe that much of them. So most of that time, you only see them like uh, walking around or like resting on the trees. So um, in terms of probability, I would say that only like a few categories will have more data than the rest, yes. Um, Anna, ma'am, you have some questions for her? Yes, uh, thank you so much. I'm so excited that you were able to join us and I'm really excited to hear your, your initial data. Um, I have first just a couple of observations. I was surprised when you said the chunky loris was larger because if you had sent me that photograph, I would have said it was subadult. Yeah, um, so I was, I was surprised that you said it's a subadult too. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm wondering, because I, I I'll just say that the, they, our lorises in Indonesia, they don't disperse till they're two or three years old and they still can be really, really fluffy and a subadult. Um, when they are 18 months, 20 months old, they still have this very fluffy fur. So it is still possible it's not an adult, but also the fluff itself makes them look a lot larger even when they're younger. So I just thought that was oh, interesting okay. and to point right. out that it still could be young because it looks very, very young. You so also had a, a photograph of another one that really looked like a Bengal slow loris. Okay. Um, so I, I thought that was also interesting. And it's possible in Singapore, you could have anything, I guess. Okay, really. maybe I should send you the photographs to have a closer look of all the lorises that we have photographed. 
Um, is because uh, it's that's obviously very interesting, um, and of course, I suppose you could have a hybrid there as well. I just wanted to say one thing though is whenever we have done surveys of lorises in the really dense forest in the um, non edge habitats, we get incredibly low densities, like you've demonstrated today, and so I they are a very um, versatile species and they can adapt to human habitation. So I wondered how much you'd looked in more urban gardens, particularly if you find urban gardens where people have a lot of flowering trees or any sort of gum bearing trees, maybe you'd have better luck in finding them there. And have you done that yet? Uh, we have not done that yet, but we do get reports of abandoned lorises found in the residential areas. And uh, when we have that kind of reports, then we will look into the type of lorises that has been abandoned there. But uh, if not, um, outside of the nature reserve, the urban areas are re actually really urban. So we felt like the chances of spotting them are really low. But having said that, we might look into some of the other possible areas that have good bearing trees. Of course, yeah. I guess that the one point about that too is we, we always think they're abandoned, but I think when Smitha speaks as well, we know that even in India, you have wild lorises living in Bangalore. So a, a really urban city. And um, we've even had lorises going into a big city near, near where we work. So they can disperse through those areas. So it just might be a good chance to radio color. Was I, even if they move in and out of that area, it might be easier. And okay. I also just um, want, wondered another idea for you, if you're concerned about your GPS collars working in the dense forest is trialing them on something like a cat, like a domestic cat, just to make sure that they work. And that could be a really valuable thing before you put it on the loris and then you know you can't get the data. So have you thought about doing that, trialing it on an easier non loris? Uh, we did think about trolley or some other uh, animals, but we were just thinking if the forest habitat is going to be so different for the domestic, say domestic cat and the loris, will that actually give us any kind of like useful data from the trial? But, um, and if we were to trial it on say like a kolugo or like a common palm seed, we are not sure whether in terms of behavior they will be on the same you know, tree height or go into the same dense areas. So, um, in terms of the results we get from the trials, we don't know how applicable it will be for the lorises. But uh, yes, we have considered that. Yes. Okay, and the final thing, and then I, I know Francisek has a question as well, is that uh, we've, we have worked very hard in the early days trying to trap slow lorises. Um, Frank Beans was able to trap lorises in Malaysia with a huge, huge trapping effort. Elizabeth Pimley was able to trap pottos in West Africa, which are similar in how they would enter a trap, but with huge, huge, huge trapping, ep trapping effort. But it, you can do it. You, and I think in Singapore, maybe you could do it more easily than where we could do it in Java. But you do need about 100 traps. And I could send you a design that's a Loris-specific trap, keeping in mind you'd have to put up hundreds of traps and check them regularly but it might be a, an option for you just because of your situation. It might be something that mm. works better for you, but yeah. a lot of work, huge amount of work, but you essentially <laughs> can't will, catch Yeah, them. we will look into that. <laughs> we will also look into maybe baiting using gum or stuff like that on the tree because there aren't other gum eating animals in Singapore. So that could be one of the way we could use on the lorises. Yeah. Well, good luck. <laughs> Thank I'm you. excited to see what comes out of it. Thank you. Francis, would you like to ask a question? Hello, uh, it was great talk, thank you. I want to tell you mainly that it was great and you do a good job. And I have really simple questions. Uh, is there any plan to do something with these uh, pygmy or possible, uh, possibly Bengal lorises? Maybe some translocation or anything? Um, if we catch them, yes, but actually the sighting rate of these lorises are really low. Like we only had one or two records of these lorises. So uh, if we see them again, maybe we will think about like uh, maybe translocating or do something about them. Yeah. But right now the sighting rate is really low for these lorises. So we are focusing more on the Sundowns. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. One last question. Have they, be, uh, have they been seen near the Ecolink Habitat Bridge? Oh, yes. So uh, um, some researchers planted camera traps along the area and 
there was one instance that they recorded a load lorry sitting on the fence of the eco lane. So we don't know whether it crossed it or not, but it was on the fence. Yes. So maybe. Okay, thank you. So Thanks. we're gonna move on to the next speaker, which is me. And so that um, leaves it to me to introduce Smitha Daniel. Um, she's one of the co-organizers of the conference and she's been working on Slender Lorises for six years. And she really deserves a huge shout out because she's only one of two people speaking about the Slender Lorises um, today. And she heads two small projects on slender loris ecology and threats in India in their natural habitats. She developed her interests for lorises after she rescued two slender lorises at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore in 2011, while she was working on other wildlife related projects. She's an independent researcher, but she's currently completing her PhD. Um, she previously conducted campaigns related to climate change education in schools and colleges across India and helped Raman Sukumar coordinate a project that involved 14 smaller projects on wildlife in India. Um, she is studying the behavioral ecology of Malabar slender lorises in the Western Ghats for her PhD. And I'm really, really excited to hear what she has to tell us about these amazing bananas on stilts. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking about the close relatives of the slow lorises from southern India. Um, you would be surprised to know how different they are from the, uh, the slow lorises and all the information that the people from world across uh, understand about them. To begin with, I would like to play so this today, small video. I turned 34 years old. I do not what know better if way you can tell what celebrate my Ian... birthday than with this little primate. This is a slender lorus. Can Loris. you hear me? Uh, can you hear the One video? One of the weirdest primates in the world. And they are so cute yes. and cool and really fascinating and really different because they are the only venomous primate. Hi. What you... So today. And he's not the only one. BBC Earth also think that slender lorises are venomous. And that's where I think it is very important for me to first clarify that slender lorises are not slow lorises, they're two different animals completely. If you see a slow lorise is on the, the left and the slender lorise is on the right, and slender lorises look so much like the slow lorises that people can just pass it off as a young one of a slow lorise. But in fact, they're two different species completely. How do you differentiate between a slender and a slow loris. Slow loris is a large hand, a hand size, I would like to say, teddy bear like cuddly animals, whereas the slender loris are really tiny. You can just hold them in your palm. They're so small. The smallest uh, slow loris is still bigger than the biggest slender loris. Uh, slender loris have absolutely no tail and hence they cannot jump. They have no venom whatsoever. They do have a very nasty bite, but they are not lethal. And uh, they predominantly are insectivores and they love, love, love insects and other anim small mammals like um, small animals like lizards, mollusks, spiders, but they very, very rarely feed on plant um, matter. And even if they do, uh, they just nibble on some gum or they feed on uh, the part of the plant that has a lot of insects sticking on them. Uh, there are two species of slender lorises. One is the gray slender loris and the other one is the red slender loris. The gray slender loris are found in uh, India and Sri Lanka, whereas the red slender loris are there only in Sri Lanka and nowhere else in the world. We have six subspecies. They're not species, but subspecies, and India has two of them. The Malabar slender loris, and the Mysore slender loris. Both of them are near threatened. The Malabar slender loris are larger in size and they have a more grayish coat, whereas the Mysore, uh, the, uh, sorry, the Mysore slender loris are larger in size. They have a more grayish coat, whereas the Malabar slender loris are smaller. They have a reddish coat. Uh, the distinguishing feature between the two would be the circumocular patch, the patch around the eye. So for the Malabar, it's round and circular. And for the uh, Mysore, it is teardrop shaped. 
So this is the distinguishing feature and this is the only way you can find out the difference when they are caught from the wild. Uh, the Malabar slender lotus are found across the Western Ghats. The Western Ghats are a chain of mountains that you have on the coastal, the west coastal region of India, and uh, they are completely isolated to the Western Ghats. Whereas the Mysore slender lotus are found all across the southern plateau of India. Uh, the, the Malabar slender lotus they prefer being in wet forests, whereas the Mysore slender lotus prefer being in the dry forest. Now, this is the only information that was available up to 2013 when people thought that uh, the scientists thought that the lotuses prefer to be only in forests. Later on, we come to know that the for the they are found outside forests as well. In fact, they prefer to be outside forests. So that is one of the major findings of my study. Now, before we go into the details of what I have found or what I have studied or the overview of my work, I would like to say that they are strictly nocturnal. They do not like coming out in the daytime. They are solitary. That means in one home range, you'll probably find only one lotus at a time, unless it is the breeding season. They're highly territorial and they have extreme territory fights where they do hurt each other and out each other's eyes. Uh, they have a home range which is less than 100 meters, which is a very short uh, home range with just 10, 10 or 12 trees at the max. In some places, you just have uh, two or three trees in their home range. They, they prefer very short small home ranges. They communicate through vocalizations, that is through very high pitched sounds and whistles. They do have different kinds of vocalizations, which I will not be playing today, uh, but uh, they all the vocalizations are very distinct from each other and they do not sound similar. And uh, the vocalizations also are very close to the uh, vocalization of crickets and other nocturnal um, fauna you find in the same place. So it's easy for a person to misunderstand a lotus vocalization to be another animal's vocalization. Uh, they are highly dependent on the undergrowth for protection because that's the only way they can keep themselves safe. They, are, uh, they have a cryptic movement uh, as their defense mechanism and hence people think they are very slow. In fact, they are extremely fast and they can disappear within seconds and I have seen them run really, really fast. But they use it as a defense mechanism and more often when people have spotted them in the wild, they're either frozen or they move very slowly. Um, and the, the most important feature of the lorises is they are anatomically not capable of jumping. They just cannot jump. For them, and hence, and hence, understanding the ecology was the first step that I wanted to answer. Out of the many, many questions that I had, first I wanted to find out what is the preferred ecology of the lorises, what do they like in their homes? So I selected Arlam Wildlife Sanctuary, which is where you find the Malabar slender lotus in the highest abundance. And uh, I surveyed the entire forest for two years, laid transect practically anywhere I could go. And I found out that the lorises were not there in the primary forests at all. The primary pristine evergreen forests of Western Ghats did not have any lorises. In fact, they were there only in the degraded evergreen forests or in uh, some patches of forest plantation or moist deciduous forests or anywhere where there was disturbance from the local public. If you see the map, this is a Google map, you will see that this entire green area is where you do not find any lorises. They prefer to be in patches across human made. So if you see, the, you have this is all the human settlement outside the sanctuary. So where there are more settlement, that's where the lorises were. And uh, we also found out that there was a huge concentration of lorises in this two kilometers. And we further, and we further grid up that place and did some occupancy samplings and plot samplings and uh, did a lot of ecological studies and this is what we deduced that one, the for a lotus to be very comfortable in its habitat, it did not matter what tree we plant. It, the species of the tree really did not matter for the lotus, as long as you have continuous canopy. The canopy can be established by connectivity between the trees or the branches, or you put ropes, or you can even uh, have climbers climb. Uh, put across or uh, here like we have put a bamboo rod just to see if the lorises are going to use them. 
so we 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 found out that the canopy connectivity is very important for the lorries if the canopy connectivity is not there they are forced to get onto the ground and what happens when they get onto the ground is a whole different story which i will be coming to in few, in less time they also need a small amount of human presence around them because uh, the human presence only increases diversity of the plants and they also increases the uh, probability having more climbers and the increase in diversity of insects that is the feeding of uh, which the lorises love eating and hence we figured out that where there are absolutely no human beings you probably would not find any loris over there they they uh, they sleep in wine tangles. They do not make their own nests, so they sleep in wine tangles. And uh, only uh, while sleeping, you can find more than one loris. But then we found out that in Arlam, where uh, uh, the density of the loris is the highest, they do not sleep in groups. And I have only seen only one loris sleeping, or during uh, the breeding time, I've seen two lorises sharing a sleeping site. I've never seen more than two lorises in one place. So this is how a loris gets from one tree to another tree. If you see, you can't even make out the difference that it is coming from one tree to another tree. This is actually crossing from one tree to another tree. They cannot jump and connectivity is of utmost importance to them. There you go. She has managed to get onto the next tree. So this is how continuous the connectivity needs to be for a slantolaurus. Okay. Another surprising, so I, uh, from my studies, we listed around 86 species of trees that you could use, both uh, deciduous trees and evergreen trees that could be used to uh, rehab, um, restore all the lotus fragments across uh, the Western Ghats. Uh, another thing that I understood was the list of trees that we had uh, found from Arlam Wildlife Sanctuary, although they are evergreen trees, they had been planted in IASC 23 years ago in the early 1980s. And uh, they uh, and the uh, brilliant finding from uh, the study was that uh, these trees, although they technically are not supposed to be able to cope with a dry climate such as the uh, Bangalore, they still grew and so, uh, thrived. They also increased uh, the uh, humidity of the area. They, they reduced the temperature by two degrees and they brought up the water table that is uh, from, 20, uh, from 60 to 70 meters up below ground level. They brought up the water table to three to four meter. Now, if you understand uh, India being the second largest uh, populated country, second highest populated country in the world, water problem definitely is one of our greatest problems. And uh, planting the trees from uh, the list that I have provided will on, only help in bringing up the water problem and it reduces uh, the climate change. But And it also has a nice, um, canopy cover, which would be beautiful for the house. Now, uh, unlike the slow lorises, the slender lorises need a very small space. So they can just practically live in your garden. So if, uh, if a person living in Bangalore, which is very highly populated, so this is Bangalore, if you see this, this red point is Bangalore and this is Chennai. Uh, both Bangalore and Chennai have lorises right in, uh, in, in, in the urban city, inside the city. And people are not aware of its presence and there are very few pockets that they are there present right now. Um, destru habitat destruction could also mean cutting off trees or trimming trees in your own garden or putting up exotic trees that do not have a good canopy cover. So uh, by planting trees uh, that are listed in my findings, it would mean a lot for the lorises. Um, and also it would make a huge difference for the people if they adapt the change. And this holds, we found out that this holds good not only for the Western Ghats, but the entire South of India. 
coming to the natural threats, uh, slender lorises are not known to have any but, uh, um, predators. You know, uh, the, we, we have a list of only potential predators. We do not know why slender lorises do not have, or there is no record of slender lorises having any uh, direct predatory, except for once, which was a one off situation that I had observed in the field uh, of a civet uh, feeding on the slender loris. But then we do not have information whether the civet ate it up or whether it was just a one off situation. But, uh, but we have, there was, there's no record whatsoever of any animal feeding on the slender lorises. And we do not know why. Although they are very safe from the natural threats, the biggest threats is human beings. Now, uh, the first threat that would have uh, due to ha uh, habitat destruction, habitat destruction for slender lorises could also mean uh, by destroying your garden or by removing one or two trees that around which the lorises live is also a huge destruction to them. They are forced to come onto the ground because they cannot jump from one tree to another tree. They're forced to get onto the ground. Now, what happens when they get onto the ground? They are so tiny, they're so camouflaged in the dark that even a cyclist, a person um, riding a bicycle can run over a loris and they can have accidents such as the case in this photograph. Another problem, another um, view of habitat destruction for the lorises is if you allow their moist deciduous uh, forest or a, a disturbed forest to convert into a primary forest, which is happening in many parts of Western Ghats. Few pa the, because of good conservation efforts, the forests are converting into primary forests, which could be detrimental for the lorises and hence it's very, uh, and hence uh, right now, the forest department and I are having a big conversation and to understand how to deal with this issue. And uh, another thing that we found out that the lorises are there more outside the protected areas than inside the protected areas. So this way, uh, by just uh, increasing the um, quality of the land outside the protected areas can also help in conserving the lorises. Um, so that's, our take on that. And uh, a huge problem uh, in India is uh, before 19, uh, the Wildlife Protection Act came into complete force or strict force after 1992. So before 1992, there have been a lot of places where lorises have been uh, hunted down for various reasons. So there, uh, while doing my surveys across Western Ghats, we found many parts or many pouches of uh, pieces of land that was really good uh, uh, habitat for lorises. And the very old locals of those areas have spotted lorises maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago, but then due to uh, extensive hunting, they have become extant in many of these patches. Now, why do the lorises, uh, why are the lorises being hunted? Now, there are many, many reasons. I'm only going to be stating few of the reasons. Now, lorises are, uh, one, uh, lorises are known as bad omen or considered as bad omen across all loris habitats in India. And uh, they, they have different kinds of belief system about the lorises. The, the, uh, one of the most common belief system that we saw is lorises take the, uh, uh, the demons of the dark take uh, the form of the lorises to come and harm us. So that is one of the, the belief systems. So they believe that if they see a, a loris, it's going to bring bad luck on them and hence they need to kill the lorises. It's believed that if a barren, I mean, if a woman sees a lorises, uh, a lorus, she will become bad and she will never be able to give birth to any child. And hence the women are not allowed to spot a lorus. You want to bring bad luck onto someone, you need to catch a lorus and let it into their house. That, so that is another belief system about a lorus. The lorises are uh, believed to be evil. They're believed to be form uh, incarnated into uh, the demons. They are associated with any bad thing um, that could happen in your house. And uh, the lorises are also used as curse words for Thevanga. Tevang is one of the curse words. The other curse word is Nanganasi. So all the curse words in um, in India are the local names of the lorises. Many people who use the curse words, um, they do not even know that it is actually a name of an animal and they're referring to the animal. Uh, why do the lorises, why are the lorises uh, being uh, caught? They're, they they are used uh, in making medicine. So what happens is the eyes of the loris is, um, 
believe to have a, a better uh, believe to give you better vision especially if you have cataract in your eyes it the a lot of medicines are supposed to heal your eyes because the, if the lorises can see in the dark then it it can pretty much see all the time so that's the belief system so what happens is they burn the eyes of the loris while the loris if you can see the photograph down here they burn the eyes of the loris when the loris are still alive and they extract the tear drops that drop out of the loris eyes and they use this um, tear drop to make potions that are applied onto the um, eyes of people who wants to have better vision so the portions are made into something called the coal or the kajal we indians we have a black kajal that we put on our waterline so these uh, medicines are uh, these medicines are made like kajal or waterline so you will never know that it has loris a common person like me if i see it i wouldn't know that it is made with loris tears uh, they use the uh, liver to make again other hypnotizing potions they also think that the medicines from liver is used to um, heal cancer and um, the fat of the loris is extracted loris is so thin i do not know how they manage to extract the fat but the fat of the loris is extracted to cure typhoid uh, i mean uh, thyroid and knee joint pain the fecal matter of loris is used for creating leprosy the loris is burnt and their ashes are also used for making many medicines for cure of many ailments this is i'm still looking into this and i'm still trying to extract more information now then we have uh, another loris in the box so you have people uh, tribal people carrying the loris in the box now why do they carry loris in the box it's not for blessing any person so the lorises are um supposed to ward off evil for example if you believe you are possessed with the evil spirit you go to the loris and the loris is supposed to lick you and ward you off the evil spirit if you have a lot of burdens or if you have a lot of sin that you want the loris to bear the 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 owner of the loris will beat up the loris and uh, will will punish the loris so that all your punishment is gone on to the loris and the loris is taking it away from you so there are different belief system the lorises are um, forced the teeth of the loris are plucked out i mean they use a nail cutter just like in the slow loris they use a nail cutter to pluck off the loris teeth for two reasons one the bite of the loris is very nasty and it can go up to the bones and hence the handling of loris is becomes easy without the teeth number two because the tooth uh, the teeth of the loris is removed the loris keeps sticking out their tongue so when they keep sticking out the tongue the 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 owner of the loris all needs to just project the loris to a point where it wants the loris to um to lick for example if a person has um cancer in breast cancer so the loris will just have to lick the breast of the infected uh, of the patient and it's believed that the cancer will go away so the loris is are forced to lick different parts of the human body the loris they also will uh, uh, give away uh thread so they have different kinds of uh, different colors of thread and each color has a meaning so if you want to ward off evil and keep uh, the loris thread with you they get the loris to um to lick the thread put the thread in the mouth remove it and then the thread is sold to the customers who wear it and believe that they are devoid of or they are safe from evil spirits um the lorises are sold as pets unfortunately unlike the slow lorises who are adorable pets um many houses in uh, many places in india actually across the world we have lorises being stored at home to ward off evil they are they believe that if the lorises are stored at home in a cage somewhere inside the house they will be uh, they will be scaring away the evil from the house and hence they are stored in the house but not as pets they are just very pathetic conditions uh the bones of the lorises are tied up in a bag and that is also stored in the house to ward off evil uh and then the lorises are used as voodoo dolls in many black magic they are mercilessly pierced uh, everywhere in the body their eyes their heart their nose their uh, limbs their limbs are chopped off their limbs are burnt um they, they for many different reasons and all these reasons boils down to uh, removing evil 
and to bring evil on somebody's life so and uh, why if this is while this uh, all this has come into limelight uh, only we are able to track only maybe 1% or 2% of what is actually happening out there because the lorises are so small and tiny and uh, uh, it's easy to store a loris it's 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 difficult for a um, us to track down all the black magic rituals that is happening um and it's easy to discard the lorises after the ritual they just need to flush him flush the lorises down the toilet um and another thing is most of these uh, rituals are happening at home inside people's houses and hence it is very very difficult for uh, the forest department or for the for, um, for us to figure out where what is happening so uh, the lorises are easy because the lorises freeze when they are under stress or when they are frightened it's easy for people to transport them like here the loris is just put in a basket and uh, nobody would suspect that the loris is in a basket unlike other animals they don't move or create noises when they are scared or uh, there are instances of people uh, shoving down lorises in their inner garments so they put the loris in their inner garments and they have uh, uh they have exported lorises outside india um lorises can even be put in tiffin boxes so uh, there are instances where they have been exported with tiffin boxes nobody would think that the tiffin would have a live animal sitting inside well these are uh the bigger problems that uh we need intervention that it's it's going to take a long time a lot of talking a lot of changing of minds of people a lot of awareness campaigns while we are facing the bigger problems we have smaller problems that could be um could be solved in the near future one is lorises have an identity crisis well you know that from the first video um animal planet do not have any idea uh bbc world do not have any idea similarly the the forest department are clueless that there are two different species uh, two different subspecies of lorises in india so often what happens this is the lidicarianus the graceland uh, this is the myosis lander loris this is the malabar lander loris the the species are uh, the subspecies are interchanged and released into wrong habitats and uh, lorises are very uh, very sensitive to uh, different habitats they die under stress and they cannot survive if they have been released in wrong habitats so that is one big problem in fact this uh, this loris on the top was brought to me to arlam by life sanctuary to be released uh, by me but then it is the mysore standard loris and it, it cannot be released anywhere in western ghats uh, and hence uh, and while we were trying to transport it to its habitat in 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 bangalore or in any other place it it passed away or it died on during the journey a uh, lot of trafficking do happen uh, the lorises have been rescued by many uh, by forest department by the police by cid by army uh, there are a lot of rescues that happen but then they have no clue what it is in fact a lot of uh, the rescues have been reported as monkey like thing or a rat like animals so that is what has been reported in few places they have reported it as a slow loris rescues uh, so mm, people are aren't aware so we do not even know at the rate at which they are being trafficked we know that this particular individual which was rescued by a sting operation costed 35 lakhs for a pair so in in the indian market so um we do not know the rate at which they are being trafficked or even the records we do not know if it's of lorus or if it has been assumed to be some of the animals so that is a bigger that is the identity crisis that we have another problem that we have is because the um, uh, the cities are ever growing they're growing into the more rural parts of uh, india where the lorises stay and hence a lot of displacement of the lorises happen but the problem is the well meaning people the people who actually want to help the loris they think the loris is the young one of a bonnet macaque and there is this one guy who picked up a you know, slender loris and said oh the bonnet macaque has left its baby over here let me go and reunite the mother and the child and he was on his way with the loris in his hand to the bonnet macaque a, a troop nearby and my uh, 
volunteer happened to be there and he ha- got him to the white house. So, so, so he is under the assumption that that is a young one. And my volunteer got him to release him like into the same habitat where he found the rest. He got him to release him into the same habitat. அதாவது <laughs> hurting the lorries another problem that we have is you have lots of people rescuing lorries especially uh, in in bangalore so and they- you're really running out of time so you're going to need to hurry it's just i've been trying to show you a sign but you have about, you're over time so okay this is the last slide ma'am okay so uh, another major problem that we have is the lorises are being caught from their habitat and they have gone they take them into the deep forest and they release them then and we now we know that the lorises cannot live in deep forest and, and uh, photography of lorises is yet another problem that is arising we are right now uh people are catching lorises tribals are catching lorises so that the photographers can take the pictures but uh very soon we if we do not intervene with the problem now we might reach here where you have them as props i will stop here <laughs> i'll take questions thank you very much we have many 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 questions um and we have 2 minutes so i'll read the first one it is a comment from gehan from sri lanka The endemic red slender loris in Sri Lanka survived right at the edge of the capital Colombo in Talangama wetland until about the year 2000 living in small patches of neglected private land that had gone wild your comments on a small home range and benefit from human presence reinforce why they survived and and even those patches are disappearing um there is a question from Hassan does any tribal group consume slender loris for its meat no. no no i haven't come across anybody or any group who consume them as meat except i've heard this is just an anecdotal information i do not know if it's true of one tribe many 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 years ago who were consuming them but it could also be due to rituals to ward of evil we have not come across anybody who or even animals who eat the lorises um we have also a question uh, do you have a le- electrocution of slender loris in your fringe areas electrocution does happen but they are very rare because uh, uh in bangalore we have had two cases of electrocution so far they are very rare uh the lorises are uh, they get on to the ground and the electric wires are generally in india generally what happens is if there's an electric wire near a tree they cut off the branches of the tree so that the electric wire is not cut by the tree during a rain or a storm so the connection between the electric line and the tree is very rare in india but in one or two cases we do have electrocutions okay there's quite a few comments that all stem to are there anyone working to change local people's attitudes about the medicine rescuing the lorises and is it possible is it possible to redirect some of these beliefs to better coexistence yes uh, there is two organizations working on uh, changing the people's minds and uh, i have a volunteer who's working with the loris poachers to help them conserve the lorises but then i uh, it's still it's st- we are still a long way right now i'm trying to understand the roots of why the people think it is it is easy to change a person's mind if it is a basic uh, information um, if they think it is evil if they think it is going to give you harm and if this belief is system is so deeply ingrained it's very difficult to remove it from them so it's um, going to be a long journey i'm still big, i'm at the start trying to understand the different cultures so slender lorises are protected in india and there are a couple of questions about is it possible to arrest or catch these poachers or hunters and do you know of any that have been imprisoned or arrested Yes yes uh, in fact the uh, the two cases that i showed you uh, all the rescue cases the people have been arrested the people have been uh, put in jail they they have um, yes the and uh, we have very few cases but then the poachers are arrested the forest department in india is very strict 
uh, it's just that the lorises are too small and easy to transport and they're finding hard to nab them. But yes, there are a lot of arrests. Okay, we're gonna to have to stop there and move on to the next talk. We are now back on time. So thank you for that. And um, Smitha, would you like me to introduce the next speaker or you have a rest and I can introduce the um, next speaker? If you on, I, I can go from here. Thank yeah, go you. Ahead. All right, I'm handing back the chairing to Smitha. Thank you for your talk. And we will be sending you the rest of the questions. Um, and we can also later spend some time answering some questions on the Facebook chat. So thank you to everyone leaving those questions on Facebook. Our next talk uh, is from uh, Professor Judeline Dimalibot. She is currently the assistant professor at the Animal Biology Division of the Institute of Biological Sciences, uh, UBLP. And she's also the curator of three, uh, three shrews and other small mammals at uh, the Nat Natural History Museum in Philippines. So uh, she would be talking to us about the preliminary study of the habitat and behavior of Philippines low loris in Tavi Tavi province, Philippines. Shall I start? Yes, ma'am. My, my screen, I can share. Sending it is hard, okay. Yeah, I'm supposed to be. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am presenting to you the result of a preliminary study on the habitat, behavior, and ethnobiology of the Philippines low loris, Nictisibus minagensis, in Seminole Island, Tawi Tawi Province, Philippines. This is a part of the undergraduate thesis of my advisee, Marisa Mitsi Hayawan, who is now a Freshman medical student. So the Philippine slow loris is the only species of slow loris in the Philippines. It is widespread to Asia, but is limited in the Philippines, in the Sulu archipelago, particularly in the islands of Bungao, Sangasanga, mainland Tawi Tawi, and Simulol. Um, it is I'm sorry, uh, my internet connection is not okay. So um, I'm sharing my screen again. Yes, yes, please. Okay. Sharing my screen again. I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, it's raining. That's why the internet connection is not very good here. Okay, next slide. So the objectives of the study is to characterize the habitat of the slow loris according to its vegetation and to observe the behavior of if we can find an animal on field and to determine local knowledge about the species. So our methodology, we selected the study sites by conducting a reconnaissance survey around the island. Um, and we interviewed municipal and barangay officials, village officials, the municipal police force and village elders to tell us where we can go uh, and work. So we analyzed the habitat by establishing transects in two barangays. Uh, in its transect, we established a 10 by 10 meter plots and the plants inside the plants inside the plots were identified if possible to the species level and were counted individually. So we observed the behavior using camera traps and we observed and recorded the behavior of an individual we saw during the day using a night vision camera from 850 hours to 1900 hours because we were only allowed until that time to work. We cannot work in the evening at all. And then we did uh, interviews uh, among 46 respondents for the ethnobiology study. So we, the according to our interviews, we can only we were given just the western part of the island to work. So we worked on three barangays on the west. And for habitat characterization, we 
uh, established our transects in Barangay Bakong and Barang Barangay Panglima Mastul. Each transect uh, measured kilometer and fr uh, the distance between transects was also one kilometer each. So the ethnobiological interviews were done in Tampakan, Bakong, and Panglima Mastul. I'm sorry, I didn't. <laughs> okay, so the vegetation of uh, Simudol is mostly disturbed forest, uh, fragmented with patches of dense thickets. Uh, fresh water is very scarce in the island, but there are underground springs towards the middle of the island. Uh, Bakong has dense underbrush growth in thickets between coconut plantations and cultivated fields planted with cassava, bananas, vegetables, and fruit trees. While uh, in Panglima Mastul, it's uh, mostly secondary forest uh, away from the coastal area near the interior. And the other side is already the beach. So the southwest part of the island has mangrove forest also. All in all, we were able to identify 47 species of trees recorded from both sites. So 40 species in Bakong and 29 from Panglima Mastul. The characteristics of the trees in Bakong, the, those with highest relative densities are Terminalia species, Nephrolepis multiflora, and Lunasia amara. And the most common ones are Taberne Montana, Pandakaki, and Terminalia species. While in Panglima Mastul, the species with highest relative densities are Exora, Terminalia species, and one unidentified uh, species which the locals call Sale. The common species are La, uh, Exora, Semicarpus, and Caparis. So there were more trees with DBH of 10 centimeters or more in Panglima Mastul than in Bakong. So we observed the behavior, we were able to observe the behavior through the camera traps. We only had two camera traps because we didn't expect that we will be able to find uh, slow lorises using the camera traps, but we, we just uh, tied them to trees near our transects and lo and behold, we were able to capture an individual. And while looking for uh, establishing our transects in Panglima Mastul, Near the beach, our guide uh, pointed us to a tree early in the morning, that was about seven o'clock in the morning. Our guide pointed up on a tree and showed us one individual, and this is it. I'm sorry for the picture, we only used my camera, uh, my phone's camera, my phone, camera phone, my, the camera on my phone. So this is, that's why it's very hazy. And we, we, um, we brought our night vision camera and we observed and recorded the, the, this individual from the morning until seven o'clock at night. Okay. So camera trapping was able to catch this behaviors. So resting and sleeping, grooming, grooming by licking its left hand, uh, grooming by licking the left, the hand and arm. And it was, uh, climbing, traveling from one branch to another or transferring from one branch to another very slowly. And then it was climbing the tree and uh, then it would stop and be alert and vigilant of its surroundings. So we were able to establish a, uh, this? oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. How can I, oh my gosh. So we were able to um, uh, establish the activity budget of the individual that we, individuals that we were able to observe. So seventy percent of the time, because it was during the day, they were resting and sleeping. And they, when they wake up, they would groom themselves and uh, they would spend about 17.5% of that, of that time grooming themselves. Mm -hmm. And they would forage or feed uh, by climbing up a tree, licking the, the trunk or the branch of the tree. So that's feeding and uh, foraging during the days, just about 0.83%. And traveling, climbing up the tree, transferring from one branch to another, uh, 
about 5% of their time and they were uh, vigilant. They would scan the area with minimal movement 6.57% of the time. So for our ethnobiological study, uh, we were able to um, interview 46 individuals. 62% uh, of them are males. And the majority age group was from 30 to 69 years old. So the youngest was 18 and the oldest was 89. So only one of them was from another ethnic group. So most of them were of the Sama tribe. These were the, uh, the tribe, the ethnic group occupying the Western part of the island. And most of them, 76% of them are farmers who practice the slash and burn uh, agricultural system. They would burn the place down and then plant. So that's 95% of them would do that. And what are, what are the local knowledge of the slow lorries? So 91.3% of them said they were familiar with the species and 75% said they have seen it. And but 71% said they didn't know what it feeds on. And they don't know of anybody who has been beaten by the species. Most of them do not know of anybody who has been beaten or scratched by the species. And because I think because of religious beliefs, they don't eat wildlife. So they don't know of anybody who consumes or eats the meat of the slow lorry. So 89.7 said no to that. That, that they don't know anybody who does it. And um, they also do not know if there are in, uh, slow lorises which have been captured, killed, or sold in the area. And of course, as um, the other rep uh, reporters before me have said, they have a belief related to the species. And uh, one of this is that uh, if you see one, you will it is a bad omen, something bad will happen to you. And they recognize that the population or the species, the population of the spe species is lesser than before, but they don't know whether uh, the species is uh, protected. They don't know whether the capture, killing and sale of species is prohibited. Okay, so from, from those uh, data that we got, we now um, came up with this research needs. We need to assess the habitats before uh, they get burned down because the, the habitat um, trees are being burned down for agriculture. We don't know the population of the species in Simonol or in any of the other islands. And also we would like to establish the home range for conservation purposes. And we would like to know if there's a human wildlife conflict because some of the, those we interviewed said, uh, they uh, sometimes they mistake the slow lorries for uh, the macaques, which are agricultural pests in farms. And we have to establish that there's an illegal wildlife trade. So as you can see from these pictures, the picture on top was, um, shared yesterday in Facebook by one um, of the authorities on illegal wildlife trade in the Philippines. Uh, he's working on it. Um, and he, if you can see from here, this is a uh, slow loris, which is, uh, what's this? It's feeding on bitter gourd. Uh, it's Ampalaya here. This one, uh, these two individuals, we, we saw this once when we were interviewing the chief of police of Simonol. And he said, he told me that uh, one of my, the members of my, uh, of my, of the police force uh, has uh, caught a mother and baby slow lorries. And I said, can we borrow it? Because I haven't seen one uh, in my at my age, I haven't seen a slow lorry. So I was very happy I was able to see it, but very sad because it was in a cage. And when asked whether they would sell this, uh, they said no, uh, they would just want to keep it as pets. So all of the studies should be done in cooperation, in collaboration with local environment offices. 
uh, in the province and in the municipality of Simonol, the local government units and local academic institutions. So we'd like to thank the Provincial Environment and National Natural Resources Officer of Tawi-Tawi Province during that time when we were there, Junel Muhammad Monel. And this one is Mr. Yunus. He was is the forest ranger who assisted us the whole time that we were in uh, Simunol. And um, his son, Sharif Ahmad Yunus, was is a forestry student. He was a forestry student when we were there. And he, uh, he was the one who helped us identify the trees. And we, we are very grateful for Farhana, Omar, and family who um, housed us. We stayed in their house for three weeks for Michi. This is Michi, Marisa Michi Ayawan, the student who did the thesis. Uh, she stayed there for three weeks, uh, okay? And for AJ Cabanas, my graduate um, advisee for the camera traps, and the people of Tampakan, Bakun, and uh, Panglima Mastulo were very hospitable and did not uh, answer all the questions that we asked them. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jude. We have some yeah. questions for you. What is the purpose of scanning around that did buy the slow lorus? Uh, again, again, as uh, Smitha. Yes, I, yes, I will ask you the question again. Okay, okay. What is the purpose of scanning around? Scanning that, around that did by the slow lorus, or what was the purpose of slow lorus scanning around? Scanning around? What's yeah. scanning around? I myself do not quite understand. I think you might you might have had in your behavior that they were being vigilant and looking around. Ah, okay. So that's just one of the behaviors. I think there were. Uh, checking whether, you know, we will catch them or not, <laughs> because um, th they would stop for a few minutes, a few moments, and then they would again move. So I think that's uh, what is vigilant. Um, they were very vigilant of their surroundings. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there any vocalization survey to identify home range of the slow lorus? Did you do any uh, vocalization surveys? No, we can. Uh, we this is the first time that uh, we have done studies on snow, slow lorries in the Philippines. We don't have data. We don't have published work that something has been done to study the the slow lorries. So I think the 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 work that Marisa Michi did was the first time. And because the University of the Philippines is very far from Simonol. We are on the northern part of the Philippines. And I think I had to travel from Manila to Sambuanga, Sambuanga to Bungao, and then take a, a small boat to Simonol. That's very far. So we, we didn't have funding. <laughs> I would like to tell you we didn't have funding. We did it just for the love of the slow lorries because somebody was working on it. And yes. I think I, I uh, once upon a time, I did uh, contact Anna. Dr. Anna, I don't know if you still remember, but two years ago, uh, I wanted to be part of the Slow Loris uh, group for Marisa. Anyway, okay. <laughs> I, would love, I would love to invite you now formally to the group. It would be amazing. I, I have actually one question for you. Um, in the rescue center, Loris, is, do you know if they measured their body weights and do you know, have any idea what they are? We don't have Lorises, I think, in a, any rescue center here. I, I guess know. I meant to say the confiscations then, the confiscation photos. I, I still do not know if there are confiscations. Okay. We don't have data on that. If there are confiscations, uh, we I didn't ask in Bungao, I should have asked this. But then um, I had to go home to my parents and uh, I only stayed one day in Bungao and then they showed me a uh, inside the university because I stayed at the university hostel with friends and uh, they told me that they saw a slow loris on a rain tree, on top of a rain tree, and they think it's a pet. I said, do you have that in Bungao? Because I need, I need to know so that I can stay and, can, and look for it. And they said, no, uh, we think it was bought from Simonol and kept as a pet and it got out of its cage. So, and do so you we don't know, have... Sorry, do you know if you did want to start a study, how difficult would it be to get permission to radio caller in the Philippines? Uh, 
it, it's not very difficult. I did uh, radio coloring in for the Palawan trees rule. There's no difficulty in it. The difficulty is the are we are, is somebody willing to go to Simonol? Uh, because that's um, Simonol is a very peaceful area. Uh, Tawi Tawi in general is a very peaceful area, but they were very. Um, we were told not to um, do work at night because we were women. We don't know the language, and uh, they're not very sure they can secure us. So I think if we go there, we should um, we should go go through all the you know the, just to be secure that we're there uh, when we're there. Uh, um, but it's so impossible to go there now because of this pandemic. I would love to go back before I retire. I'm old. <laughs> if, <you're, laughs> if you want, want to know, I'm old. But I think I was the first one who went there. I mean, you know, me and, and uh, Marisa. It was good. Marisa Mitzi is from Basilan, one of the islands in the Sulu Archipelago. And we were supposed to do a study on the Sulu Horn Bill, but it, but uh, for the peace and order situation does not allow us. And she said, "Mom, can I do study on the slow lorries?" And nobody knows anything about slow lorries. I mean, nothing is published from the Philippines, none. Right. So this gives us a very good opportunity to start something really good in Philippines as well. Yes. Uh, uh, Dorota wants to know if. Uh, he or she could follow you on social media. Are you present on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram? Yes, I, I don't have Instagram. I don't know how to do it, but I'm on Facebook and I'm on Messenger. <laughs> so there you go, Doroto. You can follow him. Yeah, you can. And uh, I hope um, somebody follows after me. I know that Leaf, Leaf was one of my graduate students also. I was, I was a member of his committee, um, guidance committee, and he wants to, to do a studies on the slow lorries. I only have three years before retirement. So I hope that Leaf will follow through. Okay. We have Leaf's talk coming up uh, in, yeah. in the afternoon. Tonight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, I'm sure he, he would be more than happy. And from his talk, I think he's more than happy to work on the slow lorises and continue your work. Um, you. Up next, we have uh, Mr. Sergei from, from Russia. Russia is not a slow lorise habitat country, but we have a talk all the way from uh, Russia. Uh, to give you a an insight about Sergei. Sergei is a member of the um, Committee on the Pygmy Slow Lorises EEP, and he has been working with the slow lorises and slender lorises for six years in Moscow. So he's going to be talking about his research and successful management and breeding of slow lorises in Moscow Zoo. Anna, would you like to play yeah. the video? I'm um, sorry, my name is Anna Watkins. I'm just going to be sharing our pre recorded talks today. So you'll be seeing my screen. Sorry, one second. Is that sharing all right? I see a, an image, but it's of course not making sound yet. Okay, I'll start the video now. And can you make it full screen? Yeah, I can. Hello. My name is Sergei Hrupin. On the conference, I represent Moscow Zoo, Russia. I would like to tell you about our work with slow lorries, our research and plans. In our primate houses, nocturnal world, we have two slow lorries species, pygmy and bengalesis, and one species of slender lorries, gray slender lorries. In 2016-2017, we did a reconstruction in our primate house, nocturnal world. I think one if important criteria for creating suitable conditions 
for our animals is creating an exhibition with conditions close to natural. To study natural history of slow lorries, I visited sanctuaries and national parks where these animals live. During such trips, communications with guides and local people can help to find and evaluate favorite habitat places of slow lorries. Also visiting the rehabilitation center FFC in northern Vietnam, I got many useful information of pygmy lorries, natural habitat and captive conditions close to natural. Besides visiting national parks, I think it's necessary to track new research articles to create a full view and get some new ideas how to create the best conditions for the animals. During uh, these two years, we modified the exhibit. Here you can see the enclosure before and after, and before and after the reconstruction. More pathways were added. To imitate night forest, different species of fruit trees were carefully selected. Trees with different branches, diameter, we are used, which we tried to unite in a continuous crowing with various paths to maximize an enclosure's area. Else we used ropes as artificial lianas. You can see how it looks on video Bengalese slow lorries. To create an additional shelter we used bamboo grooves and leaves in it we regularly renew. Also these grooves are good for the environmental enrichment. Insects could be thrown there and slow lorises readily hunt there. Additionally we reconsider the diet of our prosimens by decreasing the amount of sweet food. As an environmental enrichment, we use trunks of fruit trees with drilled holes in when to fill in liquid or crystal gum. We used this method to encourage now in which massages were gum and clean teeth. As a reward for our work, our pair of pygmy lorries gave birth to twins, a male and a female, and Elsa Bengal slow lorises gave birth to twins, which had happened in our zoo for 20 years. Despite reconsidering the diet, decreasing the amount of sweet food and fruits, we noticed a tendency to obesity in some pygmy lorises in the same enclosure with the same proportion 
and amount of the diet. It turned out that such problems appear regularly in different zoos. As is known in winter, in northern Vietnam, pygmylorises get silver frosting on fur and their body mass can double. While animals from southern Vietnam don't have such changes. The main thing about uh, these changes is that pygmylorises can go into torpor in times of food scarcity. As a result, animals by the end of winter period lose weight, gained in the summer's months. Naturally, there is a biological balance in weight during year. We started research on this problem. During the first year, we wasted animal monthly to control their hoof and photographed dorsal parts of body and bed's mask. Next, we processed uh, the data and assumed that uh, the changes in fur color and weight during the year and obesity of some animals possibly connected with the absence of changes in daily length and the same diet and temperature throughout the year. To verify this hypothesis, we continue our research. We are also very concerned about the problem of illegal trade and the use of wild animals as pets. We know that for such animals, suitable conditions are very rarely created and their owners often do not have any information about swallowers. In order to help these animals in any way, I created a group in Facebook uh, where I share information of management of this activity. This year, according to the customs services, to attempts to transport slow lorises to Russia were prevented. According to Secret Service, there has been a decrease in such attempts uh, compared to previous years. In the future, in Moscow Zoo, we are planning to give we a franchise from Ostrava Zoo a slow lorry's day to draw attention to old light trade and to uniqueness of this wonderful primate. Hello, uh, yeah. back. Does anybody have any questions you want to ask? Awesome. Hey, Sergey. Hi. Okay, so uh, there is a question from Kat, uh, Kali. Is it possible to share your diet sheets or animal husbandry uh, care sheets for the pygmy and Bengal slow lotus? Uh, Рацион, ну, послать ей рацион для бенгалов и для пигми, которым ты кормишь. Сказать или... Uh, hi. Uh, uh, do you want to share, uh, to send an email or something? Sure. An... So, uh, yes, I would ask the person to email uh, at us Firefox and we will, uh, um, we will forward the emails to Sergey and he will be able to share your, his findings with yeah. you. Is that uh -huh. fine? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, did I hear correctly that the lorises gave birth to twins? Is is this known in the wild too? Uh, uh, 
она услышала правильно, что двойняшки родились. И в природе это норма тоже для пигни. А, ну да, рождаются два. У нас родилось два детеныша. Даже три, но один был мертворожденный. Actually, there were three of them, but one of them was uh, dead, st stillborn, and the two was uh, okay. Two was alive. Калории, это, uh, принципе, for pygmy lorries, it's usually it's okay, it's fine in uh, nature. Также у нас родились два бенгальских лорика. Uh, we uh, two Bengal lorises uh, was born in our zoo also, uh, twins. Что не так часто and встречается. In nature, it's a rare thing. For Bangalores to give birth to twins. So. Oh, wow, that's a very successful breeding program. Then, uh, Carly is also wondering if you would separate males and females when breeding or during births. Ah, разделяешь ты самцов и самок при родах и при размножении? Нет, у нас довольно удачно они содержатся в парах. Пары были хорошо подобраны и в результате они у нас содержатся постоянно, причем родители и мать и отец вместе участвуют в воспитании. We keep them together uh, all the time. Uh, it's very good pairs. They are very good together. Uh, very good living together. Uh, что там говорят еще? То, что они ah, and they share uh, their parental care for, the, for their children. So a father and mother, they uh, together care about the infants. Uh, one more question. Uh, the pygmy lorises are frosted in color for how long each year? Каждый год сколько длится морозный налет у пигми? Так как у нас получается такой смазанный период по зиме и весне, то... Подожди, я переведу сначала это. Uh, we don't have a uh, distinct uh, season in our zoo. Uh, our conditions are always the same. So, у нас получается приблизительно около полгода каждый из окрас, то есть морозный половина года, потом он становится меньше. So we have uh, half of the year frosted uh, color and half of the year not with no frosted. So it's six months. Anna, ma'am, you have a question? Yes, um, thank you so much for your talk and thank you for, for contributing today uh, on behalf of the captive Loris community. Um, I'm wondering if you have any education materials in, in your zoo about the Loris pet trade and the illegal Loris trade and if any of your animals have been pets before. Есть ли у вас какие-нибудь образовательные материалы в вашем зоопарке по поводу нелегальной торговли и по поводу нелегального содержания лориков у людей? Ну, как я уже рассказывал, у нас есть группа в Фейсбуке. We have a group on Facebook. In... Uh, да, и как дополнительно мы хотим, как я тоже опять же рассказывал, организовать праздник, день как бы лорика. And additionally we want to, uh, to organize a slow lorry's day in Moscow Zoo for public. Uh, там опять же проводить регулярные лекции. And we wanted to, to, uh... для посетителей for public uh, do lectures for public about keeping slow lorries about the, uh, that you don't have you must not keep lorries as pets она сейчас спрашивала благодаря этому привлечь еще средства массовой информации как бы и более широко это and we want to um, как это сказать господи газеты тв news you know newspapers and uh, internet uh, Uh, sources get involved uh, so more people to uh, have to know about uh, slow lorries and uh, keeping them in captivity the problems uh, of uh, their pet trade я наша спрашивала есть ли у нас животные которые до этого были домашними животными да у нас периодически 
приносят, приносили в дар животных, которые... There, from time to time, some people uh, bring us animals for, to, in our zoo, because they cannot keep them anymore, any longer, because they don't know how to do it correctly. So we have uh, several animals from people, from usual, from people. Были такие случаи. Thank you very much. Uh, Ma'am, do you have any other questions? Can I go on to the next speaker? You can go on. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much, Sergei. Uh, that was a wonderful talk all the way from Russia. Up next is uh, Ms. Jenny Na Natalia. Uh, we are very uh, welcome to, uh, we are very happy to welcome the chair of the Indonesian Pascal Foundation and Program Direct uh, Assistant at the Kukang Rescue Program. Now, the Kukang Rescue Program is located in North Sumatra, Indonesia, and is primarily focused on tackling the illegal trade of Sumatran slow lorises. Jenny will be talking about the important rescue work that she is being undertaken at the foundation. Jenny? Okay. Um... Wait. Mm. Okay, hello everyone. Um, good afternoon from Indonesian time. Let me introduce you about myself first. My name is Jenny Simanjunta, you can call me as Jenny. I am currently a student of Master of Criminal Justice in a university in Indonesia. And I'm also the chairwoman of Pasal Foundation. We are run this program called the Kukang Rescue Program. So this program is mainly supported by nine zoos and Indonesia is supported by Pasal Foundation, which is this, um, these zoos are like stabling, like stably um, support us in Indonesia. We have Ostrava Zoo, Olomouc Zoo, Liberec Zoo, Hodonin Zoo, Froklaw Zoo, Zoo Nahadreku, Ohan Zoo Foundation, and Natur Zoo and Dodo Foundation. Um, the Kukang Rescue Program is a program which focusing in combat the wildlife illegal trade and also to striving to protect the greater slow lorries and Sumatran slow lorries in Indonesia, especially in North Sumatra area. The program location is in Indonesia, in the region of North Sumatra, in a small village called Bandar Baru. And there's a fact that in Indonesia, illegal wildlife trade is the the number three biggest, uh, biggest crime, uh, bi biggest, wait, the, the third highest crime after narcotics and human trafficking with an estimate transaction volume more than tri 13 trillion per year and the value continues to increase every year. Um, this fact is, uh, I got this facts from the Ministry of um, Forestry and the Environmental of Indonesia. We have like, um, five goals of this program, which is the first is cooperation with local government agencies on wildlife conservation and on the enf enforcement of illegal trade for slow lorries protection. And the second is operation of a rescue and rehabilitation center for slow lorries confiscated from the black market. And the third is setting up an Indonesian team that will implement most of the slow lorries conservation activities. And the fourth is cooperation with and support of local communities. And the last is raising awareness about the illegal trade in animals and about the conservation of slow lorries. As you can see here, we, we have a campaign called I'm Not Your Toy, because we understand that actually the, uh, one of the reason why is the population of slow lorries is getting decreased is because um, the popularity of the slow lorries itself in the social media and internet. So, we make these um, campaigns to against the popularity of um, the cuteness of the slow lorries in social media. So people can understand that actually slow lorries is not a pet and is slow lorries is not cute as they see in the videos. So um, here's uh, the first activity of Kukang Rescue Program in North Sumatra. The first is establishment of the first rescue center in Sumatra specializing in slow lorries. Um, as you can see, here is the quarantine for the slow lorries in our 
Rescue and Rehabilitation Center. And the fact is actually the this program and this Rescue and Rehabilitation Center is the first in North Sumatra because before we don't have it in the Sumatran island, but uh, you, you know that actually Solaris is really um, actually uh, here in North Sumatra. So it's really difficult uh, to against it if we don't have this kind of facility in North Sumatra. By building this specialized center, we enable the rehabilitation of confiscated slow lorries with the aim of returning them back to the wild. And the second, we have a Kukang Coffee project, which this project actually, uh, we created a community of farmers who enforced a ban of hunting protective species of animal. And in return, if they agree to make a, a joint this community, we will buy the coffee from we will buy the coffee with higher price. And actually we already have several farmers that uh, join this community and they agree to ban on hunting protective special animals. And the third is operation of the English Environmental School. Um, in the village of our partners, especially uh, mainly in Bandar Baru, we have a school called English Environmental School. And here we teach children from partner community free of charge English and Indonesia and a neglect but much needed environmental education. Because actually in Indonesia, um, even Indonesia is a uh, rich of, you know, like natural resource, but actually the education environmental is not, it's really like in Indonesia. So lots of children and lots of people actually don't understand um, what kind of animals or what kind of plantation that actually is protected. And sometimes it, it will be the reason why they, they took and they kept the, some protected animals in their homes like that. And the fourth is construction and equipment of a school called school at the end of the world. So um, because of the school that we have in Bandar Baru, um, some local community feel inspired and they want to build their own school that teach about uh, environmental and mainly about salaries. So we, we responded to requests from a community from the village of Basukum and helped them to build their own English environmental school for the children by uh, helping them construction and, the, and helping them with the equipment of the school. And the fifth is creation and equipment of two eco libraries. So in every school that we, um, in, in our partners village, we build and strengthen children's relationship with animals, nature and environmental protection through beautiful picture books and eco activities. So uh, we, we got like some help from greenbooks.org uh, and something like that. So we try to make this uh, school and libraries as a uh, eco activities, like uh, uh, helping them and teaching them about uh, animal and environmental from eco activities. Something like that. And the sixth is organizing educational events. So um, one of our main activity in this program is raising awareness about threat, threat and protection of slow lorises. We do this kind of awareness in some public places, some school, but uh, even in both, both on, offline and online. So um, we not only targeted in some people, but we try to uh, reach uh, another another um, people like from children, from um, adults and etc. Sorry. Mm. I'm sorry, it's going to it's going to stop um, screen and try again. It, it's OK, it's already work. I don't know what happened. It was it was freeze. And next is um, one of main our main activity is helping farmers 
farmers resolve their conflicts with wild animals. We understand that actually um, because of the lack of the environmental education and because of some farmers in Indonesia, it's not, you know, like they don't have really good um, education level. So they don't really understand actually uh, their kind of difference uh, uh, between some protected and unprotected animals. But in here, we, we try to helping them resolve their conflicts with wildlife uh, by discussing with farmers and advise them to on how they can protect their crops from wild animals without having to injure or kill the wildlife. Because we understand that actually due to the loss of the natural environment and food, animals are increasingly penetrating close to human dwelling and into fields where as pests, they are persecuted and killed by hum uh, humans. And especially in the some villages that are actually close to our project is uh, mainly of their uh, uh, the, their profession are farmers. So we heard a lot of uh, from farmers that actually they got some uh, conflicts with wildlife animals like macaques and solaris and etc. So from this brochure, we try to um, discuss and educate them that actually uh, we, we still can protect our crops without having to injure or kill the wildlife. And then we are uh, addressing the issue of waste and pollution. In our rescue and rebuilding center, we are trying to reduce the amount of the waste. Um, even our employees already use some reusable bag. We don't use any plastic anymore. And we have introduced some people in the um, in our place and in the, in the school or in the library to uh, the waste sorting bins. And we lead the children in our school to similar thinking and steps also. And in addition, in the rescue and rehabilitation center, we also address the issue of wastewater and we built an ecological wastewater treatment plant on the site generated during the operation of the center. And the last but not least, um, we are trying to building a chair Indonesian team because um, in the end, we still want to ensure that solar resources and other wildlife animal and their nature assets in Indonesia are professionally protected by Indonesian themselves. With their steps, the Kukang Rescue Program has been able to eliminate the hunting of solaris, pangolins, and an endangered animal the endere, thus protecting hundreds of animals. And I have short a teaser that probably um, I want to show to you, you all so, so you can see how actually our program here and how it looks. Um, here, you can check the program here. So here is our rescue and rehabilitation center. This is where it's, it's located in Bandar Baru Village in Sumatra, Indonesia. And this is our English and Indonesian and English in environmental school. With this school is followed by the local children in this village. Uh, Jenny, your uh, slides are stuck. We are, stuck? We, are not, yeah, we are not able to see the videos. Uh, so it's not open. Yeah, it's still frozen. Okay. Do you want to try stopping the screen share and then putting okay. it on? Yeah. Does it work now? Yes. I don't hear the sound, but I see the video. Yeah, okay. Oh. So here is the English and Environmental School in the village of Bandar Baru, North Sumatra, Indonesia. 
which this school is followed by um, some children and adults from the local communities that can follow, they, they can follow this school free after the formal school every day, no, every three weeks in a week, three, three times in a week. So here is our active uh, public awareness of activity when we are trying to helping the farmers in the area of our project. And here's the construction for the school from the local community that we help with construction equipment. As you can see that actually they don't really understand what is the difference of pets and the, the real pets and what and wild animal. And here are some bats. They use they they eat the bats actually. They believe that uh, the meat of the bat is the medicine for them. Here are some activities from the um, conspiration. It's the, some macaques. And we got this. This is our clinic in our rescue and rehabilitation center. As you can see, every animals that we got from the conspiration, we will take it to the center and we will um, check them first before we decide to what, what we will we do with them. So um, it's the end of my talk today. Um, if there's anything you want to ask to, uh, to me about, I will love, I would love to answer it and let's fight for Dolores. Thank you. Is there anything you want to ask more? You can contact us on www.kukang.org. Yeah. So can you stop uh, screen sharing yep. so people can see you? Uh, yes, there was a, there's a question. How do Dolores impact the farmer's livelihood? And she also wants to know how they can donate to your eco library. Um, yes, of course, we, we, we really love to accept the donation for our eco library. You can contact us in www.kukang.org and you can find some contact that you can, you can call or you can text there to donate to our eco, eco library. And uh, how does the loris impact the farmer's livelihood? What? Do Sorry, any... I can... uh, Do the lorises impact the farmer's livelihood? Farmers... Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, some farmers that actually we did interview with, they said that actually lots of farm, um, the lorries, they, they think that actually, I don't really think that the lorries really destruct, destruct or destroy the crops, but they think that actually this lorries try to eat some plantation like tomato or the leaves or something like that. So th that's why they think that actually uh, slow lorries is a pest. So that's why they are often killed or like keep them or like selling them to the market. Okay, so we do not have any more questions, but uh, let us take a short break of 10 minutes and come back at 3.30 Indian time and um, 11 o'clock UK time. So could we come back uh, in, in eight minutes? Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. We're about to start in about another minute. And so I just wanted to say to people to start getting ready for the next talk. And also we've been watching the Facebook Live and also the, the other Zoom we have going. And we are regularly having at least 100 people watching, which is really great um, to have 100 people who care about Loris's. And uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll keep monitoring the numbers and let you guys know at the end. Uh, yes. Can we start uh, the next talk? Uh, up next, we have a pre-recording from Dr. Uh, Marina Kenyon, who is the director of Thao Tain Endangered Primate Species Center in Cat Tain National Park, Vietnam. She opened this after her completion of, after completion of a PhD on golden cheek gibbons in 2008. Dr. Marina Kenyon has been actively involved in developing protocols for pygmy slow loris rescued from the illegal wildlife trade, specific protocols for individuals recently hunted and individuals kept long-term in captivity. So she would be talking to us more about her work in the Philippines, uh, no, her work in Vietnam. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity of talking to you today and sharing our knowledge of slow loris in South Vietnam. In 2008, we opened the Dao Tien Endangered Primate Species Center. This was in collaboration with the Vietnamese government, Monkey World Ape Rescue UK, and the Ping Tung Wildlife Rescue Center Taiwan. The center is located on a 56 hectare island within Cat Tien National Park. This is around three hours north of Ho Chi Minh City. We specialize in the endangered primates of South Vietnam, thus the light cheeked crested gibbon, silvered langurs, duke, and the pygmy and Bengal slow loris. Since we opened in 2008, we have rescued 104 pygmy loris, not including birds. This does not represent all the loris that have been confiscated in the south of Vietnam. There are many more loris that would have been released directly into the forest or sent to other rescue centers or national parks. Our peak of rescues was in 200, 2015, and this was when there was a peak in online traders openly selling on Facebook, leading to large numbers confiscated. Also at this time, Loris traders were going to prison for up to nine years. Today, the numbers of rescues per year has reduced. We're finding that the trade has shifted now to langurs and otters. We're getting many, many Duke langurs now um, confiscated. Most recent Pygmy loris rescues have come from loris living on the edge of forest or plantations, and they're starting to enter people's property. Health issues on arrival. Luckily in Vietnam, in South Vietnam, there does not appear to be a culture of pulling or cutting teeth. So all our loris are coming in with good teeth. They are um, receiving eye damage. This is most likely when the trader or the forestry protection department place unfamiliar loris in the same cage or bag. We have had loris arrive to us in plastic bottles. This is from the forestry protection department, afraid of the toxic bite. When they arrive, most loris have high parasite load, primarily Ascaris and Strongyloides. They can come in fat or thin. We, release, we recently rescued a pet loris, Pygmy Slow Loris, that was over 800 grams while average weight should be 400. They have snare damage, and also they have burns on their hands and face. We presume this is from loris that are caught up in plantations when the plantations are being managed and there's a yearly burn. A few years ago, we also rescued one loris that had been bleached. This was at the time when loris were being pushed in the pet trade in Vietnam. During this time, we have developed specialized facilities for our loris. Firstly, a quarantine house. We like the quarantine house because it's four meters tall. So this, when frightened loris come in, really relaxes them. They can go up high and feel secure. It has strong temperature management so the loris do not get too hot and also a concrete floor so we can manage parasites. 
Once health checks are complete, we also do socialization in this house. The house has connected bedrooms, mesh to mesh, so we can assess introductions and create social units. Once in social units, we transfer to our main house. Our main house has 10 outside enclosures, which are much bigger, soiled outsides. Half the enclosure is open to direct sunlight. But the best thing about this house is that each enclosure is connected by internal tunnels. This means if needed, we can increase or reduce the space for the loris. For example, the Bengal loris, we give three times more space. And pygmy loris that are breeding, we also triple their space. We also have forested enclosures around one hectare to a hectare in size. And these were, is where we place loris that have been long time in captivity and need greater rehabilitation before release. Social considerations, reproduction, group structure, seasonal change in behaviour. Firstly, with pygmy slow loris, there is, there is a distinct breeding season. Distinct birth peak in February and mating occurs between August and October. During mating season, we find that male testicles can triple in size, so the males during the breeding season of August to October are much ready, more ready to fight. These seasonal changes in behaviour influence how we, we manage things. So from February to June, the loris are generally less aggressive in captivity, resulting in more positive introductions, finding they enjoy same-sex pairings at this time, so we can put females to females and males to males who play wildly. Release data also suggesting more friendly wild encounters observed in February with release males hugging wild males. Thus, individual release, individuals released in the dry season may receive less aggressive encounters initially from the wild counterparts. So for better success, releasing in, in the dry season is good. Captive breeding success. Our breeding success we find is greater when, when there are more loris about. For example, if we have two female pygmy loris and one male, th that social unit is more likely to breed, or even if, just they're, if they're in close proximity to other groups. And we're also finding this the case with Bengal. When we do have groups reproducing, we keep the males within. And the photo here shows a male led down with two twins on him and mum busy grooming. So males are very proactive, helpful fathers. One problem we were finding, though, was that youngsters at three months of age would suddenly die. Healthy youngsters would die overnight. Based on postmortems, we found that this was from a toxic overload. And we presumed it was that loris in confined spaces were simply licking their infants too much, um, giving them a toxic overload. This is one of the reasons why if we have reproductive units of loris, we triple their space. With the extra space, um, the infants are healthy and do not have any issues. Nutrition considerations for immediate rescue and rehabilitation. One of the most important things is when loris come loris come in is that they are dehydrated and very stressed. So we give them honey water and then we slowly introduce them to a, a gum diet at 70 to 80 percent. And this is quite key um, for our success in loris. Problems before we introduced the dumb gum diet were over licking, too hot, incredibly high parasite load. We were having to, to provide dewormers every three weeks, low calcium levels and poor weight gain. Once you've achieved the high level gum diets, all these problems are no longer an issue. Pygmy slow loris outcome. So we are a, a rescue release centre. So our, our mission is to develop protocols of release for all the species we work with. With the pygmy loris, our Vietnamese team now can carry out radio collaring, release and post-release monitoring. We started in 2009. For the first four years, we had many mortalities for our release pygmy loris due to predation, incorrect release site and poor release protocols. We've learned a lot. Now we have excellent success. Um, although we do only monitor up to around seven months when collars drop off, we do not recapture and recolor at this point. But we now have radio collared and release over 52 pygmy slow loris.
At the moment, we've been focusing on reintroducing loris that have been in captivity a long time, over four years of age. And so far, these are the individuals that go through the forested enclosures, and we've had success with two now. And we have also, this last season, reintroduced a pigmillo slow loris that was born on Doughty N, and um, she has done very well. In addition, we have released mothers with infants at three months old, and they also do very well. So with all this knowledge, who should we educate? Community education. We've worked with local schools and markets, and the feedback is very positive. We do a lot of work in the schools in the cities, generally focusing on age groups 7 to 15 years of age. And we're finding, interestingly, that this age group of students don't really know what a pygmy slow loris is. Some may have seen them in the zoo, and they have never seen them on YouTube. Generally in Vietnam, pygmy loris are hunted opportunistically. There's no high monetary value. Often pygmy loris sell for $5, $10, $2. The demand for them as pets seems to have been reduced. Um, although they are still eaten locally, they're considered quite tasty on a, on a local level. And also there are restaurants in the, in the rich districts in Ho Chi Minh City that sell loris on a plate. Apparently, it's not very popular, not many people want it, and it's mainly people from the north working in the south who request it. The biggest problem at the moment for pygmy loris is that they are still used in traditional medicine, and they are used in airway, for airway irritations. Pollution is high in many Asian countries, including Vietnam. Many people have irritated airways and are looking for medicines to cure. So this is a big problem. But in general, we suggest that the greatest problem for loris is the opportunistic hunting due to the shared habitat of pygmy slow loris with man in cashew plantations, enabling opportunistic hunting just because they are there. So we need to look at slow loris in cashew plantations. And also, we've, we've looked at them now for four years. And we're not sure, actually, if, if pygmy slow loris in cashew is a good habitat or a bad habitat for them. So firstly, pygmy slow loris densities are much higher in plantation than secondary forest, around fourfold. We're finding pygmy slow loris walking into houses on the edges of plantations, possibly indicating a seasonal limitation in this habitat. Some loris rescued from plantations have been malnourished and with bad coat condition. We had a project running for the last two years, radio tracking, tracking wild loris in this habitat. We tracked three loris. On capturing these, we found that they had many, one had many scars and was in poor condition, suggesting high conflict in these areas. This all indicates we need further research. If this is going to be one of the remaining strongholds for pygmy slow loris in Vietnam, we need to understand it better. So we're setting up a scholarship at the present for a Vietnamese student to carry out interviews in cashew plantation. Education within government education within the Forestry Protection Department. Firstly, we're finding that identification of slow loris within the forest ranges has much improved, although eco ecological knowledge is still poor. We have provided loris posters, which go into detail about the ecology, the distribution, identif identification and emergency care, but we do need to distribute these further. Training staff on post-release monitoring and protocols has gone down really well. We find that the rangers really enjoy it and love finding their loris every day and understanding a little bit more how they exist in the forest that they protect. But we are, we still have a lot of work to do in this area, um, especially trying to generate more adoption of knowledge at the top levels. In Vietnam, confiscated wild animals go to the nearest rescue centre, whether specialised or not. We're increasingly finding pygmy slow loris, even when release protocols are known, are being ignored and released in the day with no release cage. Releases are shared on Facebook and receive high praise from national and international supporters. So we're encouraging unmanaged releases. Within, with 
Vietnamese hierarchy, even trained specialists, rangers that we have trained, have had to stand by and do releases in the day of loris, knowing full well that those loris will not survive. So we need to focus on more top-down sharing of knowledge. So the leaders of the national parks of these rescue centres understand the detail needed and follow through. They're not just small brown jobbies and it doesn't matter when you put them back in the forest. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd like to thank in particular our, our Loris team in Dao Tien, Thung, who focuses on captive care and also Vo Tan Bin, who has spent, spent the last 12 years tracking Loris in a very tough, spiky, aggressive Vietnamese forest. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have Mariana here? Unfortunately, I think because uh, of a bad internet connection, she wasn't. She's there. I see she's her. There? She's. It says that she's Jude, though. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's why my posts have been wrong. <laughs> ah, I get it now. I understand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, we have, uh, we can quickly go through questions. So what gum do you feed them and where do you, how do you source your gum? We're very lucky. The, the tree gum is one that the loris eat in South Vietnam in the forest. Um, we, we did try them on all the other zoos, the, the acacia zoo um, gums, but the loris wouldn't eat them. But luckily in Vietnam, the people also use this gum for a health drink to manage parasites, heat, stress, and all these other issues. So we actually can buy it at the market in, in bulk. But I do believe it's only South Vietnam that specializes in producing this gum en masse. And uh, does the pygmy uh, lotus live in and near cashew plantations due to natural habitat loss? When we've tracked them in the, the, the cashew, they they can spend two nights in the cashew, then the next three days they'll go into neighboring bamboo forests. So they're in and out. So as yet, not 100%, but they spend a lot of time in the in the cashew. And uh, has much work been done with the plantation owners about the implications of opportunistic hunting? Um, we've, we've done quite a lot of interviews local to Kat Tien. Um, they, own, they, they, they capture squirrels in because the squirrels damage the crops, the, the eat the fruit of the cashew, and the lorries go into these squirrel traps to eat the banana. So the local people think that the lorries are going to damage their crops. So we did a project trying to track the lorries using the local farmers as our assistants to show them actually what the lorries do and that they focus more on the insects and they're actually helping. Um, but we keep losing the loris, whether this is because they're hunted or whether when they just go into the bamboo, they go deep and disappear a, a long time. Um, so as yet, the farmers still think that the loris are harming their crops. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mariana. We'll just move on to the next talk because we are running out of time. Uh, next, next, we have uh, Pentai. Uh, Dr. Pentai Sirivat completed her PhD in, 2000, uh, in 2020 on wildlife trade in Thailand and has previously worked for uh, Free Land Monitor and WWF. She contributed to the 2019 Thailand Action Plan for Slow Lorises and she would be talking to us about trade of slow lorises. In Thailand. I can't see her on the. Uh, it's 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 a record recording. Oh, it's recorded. Okay. Yes, yes, it's recorded. One second, sorry. Hi there, everyone. My name is Pentai Sariwat. For today's Slow 2020 virtual conference, and as part of the Slow and Slender Loris Outreach Week. I will be giving a talk today on the trade of slow lorises in Thailand. So I'll start off by giving a context into my background. Um, I recently completed a PhD at Oxford Brookes University where I studied the role of the internet 
in the legal and illegal wildlife trade in Thailand. As part of my thesis, I researched online wildlife trade, focusing on Facebook as a main platform. Over the duration of my study, I recorded a range of wildlife for sale from dogs, cats, birds, all the way to exotic species of carnivores and primates. Here, I will present a section of my findings with you, specifically focusing on the trade of slow lorises. For those of you who may not be familiar with Thailand, it is geographically located in Southeast Asia with neighbors of Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Malaysia. Overall, the region is pretty rich with biodiversity, but it also comes along with problems of wildlife trade. In Thailand, there are 15 species of primates that include macaques, langurs, gibbons, and of course, slow lorises. However, there are only two species that occur throughout Thailand, which is the Bengal slow loris and the greater or Sunda slow loris. In Southeast Asian countries, habitat loss and trade are known threats to the slow lorises. The purposes of trade may vary. You may be familiar with um, hunting of slow lorises for superstition or belief, as well as medicinal purposes. However, in Thailand, the purpose of trade is nearly exclusively due to the exotic pet trade, where there's a growing demand for exotic and rare pets, as well as uh, to be used for photo props in tourist destinations, where vendors would hold the lorises out in tourist areas and charge four to $10 approximately for a selfie. Um, the photo in this slide is probably the most famous example of the photo prop using a slow loris which is Rihanna's selfie in 2013 that happened in one of Thailand's famous beach towns with two pygmy slow lorises. So a little bit about the methods. I chose to use Facebook as a monitoring platform because Thailand has a very strong global social media presence, especially in terms of Facebook. Thailand ranks eighth globally in terms of the number of Facebook users with nearly 50 million accounts. In detail, the process of data collection was that I started off by searching the groups on Facebook using common tags such as exotic pets or unusual animals. Then I joined groups that predominantly sold exotic pets and had over a thousand members or was active. For any closed groups that required entry approval, entrance was usually granted within a day. For the data collection, the details were recorded from each of the sales post. And this might include things such as species, photo date, post date, number of individuals being sold, age, price, location of sale, transfer method, and or end of sale date. After each monitoring session, duplicate adverts were compared throughout the groups and then removed if there were duplicates in order to avoid double counting. And then the seller identification was also anonymized. Specific details of the methods can be found in the paper referenced here in this slide. Species identification was checked by experts, but for some, the photo quality was not good enough or the individual in the photo was too young to be identified. In terms of ethics, the groups monitored were all listed as buy-sell groups. So they were treated like a market platform. But due to the potentially sensitive content, because there are both legal and illegal things being sold on the platform, I used guidelines from Roulet et al. 2017 for covert observations. I also followed recommendations of Kosinski et al. 2015 and Martin et al. 2018 using the guideline to collect data on a, only available on the posts, to anonymize data after collection, not to communicate with any users, and not to publish any information that may be attributed to one individual. And for the analysis presented here in this presentation, I offer basic price analysis between the species and between taxa of primates. So my findings, 
In total, the duration of the study was from January 7, 2017 to March 2019 from eight different Facebook groups. In total, there were three identifiable species that included the Bengal slow loris, Sunda slow loris, and pygmy slow loris. There was also one additional subspecies, or the Nichocebus bengalensis tenacerimensis, which is found it, which is a southern form of the bengalensis found in Thailand and Myanmar. So in total, I found 150 posts and 194 individuals offered for sale. Here are the details of the post by species. The most popular one is the Bengal slow loris, both in terms of number of posts and number of individuals offered for sale, followed by the Sunda slow loris, the Nichasivas kukang, and then the pygmy slow loris. Nearly half, however, of the number of posts and number of individuals offered for sales were unidentifiable. And this poses as one of the main gaps of knowledge for the study. Here's one example of how the sale might work on Facebook. The traditional way is when someone posts a photo of the slow loris they have and offers it for sale. And in this example, someone is saying slow loris, friendly, domesticated, tame. Give me a chat if you are interested. In the second case here is when someone is an interested buyer and posts their interests out. So in this case, someone is asking for monkeys ready to pay. Um, the first person who comments offers a marmoset, then someone else offers a long tail macaque or a pig nosed macaque. Finally, someone offers a slow loris and the interaction goes the way that they ask about this monkey, what's the price like? And then he replies, it's a slow loris. Then the poster asks if it is illegal. And the reply of the commenter says, of course it is. And later they go on to discuss the price and says, can you please reply to my um, chat? So these are two examples of how slow lorises can be found traded online. When I co collected all the price data and made a comparison between the different prices available, um, and an ANOVA test showed that there was significant differences in the means of the prices for each group, where the pygmy slow lures, which was um, the most infrequently found one, uh, was offered at the higher prices. In a wider context, I examined the different taxa of primates. And as you can see here in the study, the marmosets, which is clearly the non-native species that come from South America, were offered at the highest prices. Um, for the other four genera, the hylobates, macaques, nixocebus, and uh, the langurs, they were all offered at significantly lower prices. However, within these four, the slow lorises were uh, the cheapest one. Here I looked at the origin of the sales. The top three locations that the posters came from were Yala province, Bangkok province, and Narratiwat province. Bangkok is the capital city of Thailand, and Yala and Narratiwat are located at the southernmost end of Thailand bordering Malaysia. This distribution map in this background, it has was obtained from Somura et al's 2012 distribution of slow lower species in Southeast Asia. And it can be seen that in the key provinces where you see slow lowers trade, you can obtain other species not found in that area as well. And this might be a direct result from the trade. And in regards to welfare, the conditions of trap slow lorises from nature, like the one here on the right and the one here on the left with the eye infection, show that the slow lorises must undergo stress from the moment it is taken from the wild or hunted to the moment it reaches the buyers. Traders often remove the front teeth of the slow lorises to remove their venom as well. And so even though the slow lorises end up 
confiscated or dumped at the, the relevant agent, government agencies. A lot of the reintroduction back into the wild is difficult. And sadly, for a lot of them, the future remains in captivity for the remainder of their lives. Finally, I present here seizure data that I compiled quickly from 2019 to 2020, and it shows that the majority of recent seizures come from online trade. You are also able to glean on some the modus operandi of the traders, and some of them say that they are hunted or taken from not just from Thailand, but from abroad as well. And then the traders could be the direct trader that brings it over the border or transports it to a middleman in order to transport it throughout Thailand. Public transport is also a common tool used to send um, slow lorises around the country. Clearly, the slow loris trade in Thailand has become a threat to the species conservation in general. In terms of legislation and protection, under the previous wildlife laws established in 1992, non-native animals were not protected, which at the very least meant that the pygmy slow loris would not be protected in trade in Thailand. Here, there is a news of a photo prop trader who was arrested for the third time a third offense in, in Phuket, the same place where I first mentioned Rihanna's selfie with the pygmy slow loris. In the most recent time, in 2019, he was rest, arrested under a newly reformed set of wildlife laws. Within this reformed law, it now clearly indicates that CITES 1 listed species are also protected. And Therefore, it should mean that all ambiguities in the protection of slow lorises are now clear and should be easier to enforce. Though it should also be noted that the extent of the protection is unknown yet, since the secondary subsidiary law has not been released. However, one may hope that with increased penalties in combination with effectively enforced laws, the trade of prohibited species, such as the trade in slow lorises, will decrease and at least deter people from committing future crimes. Thanks everyone for listening. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to email me. Um, Pentai, are you here? Okay, uh, Pentai was unable to join us probably because her internet connection is bad, but please feel free to email her any questions that you have. Uh, we're gonna move on to our next speaker who is Nabajit Das. Uh, Nabajit Das, Dr. Nabajit Das, a research associate of Primate Research Center, Northeast India, Assam. He's also an adjutant researcher of a nocturnal primate research group of Oxford Brooks University. He's completed his PhD on the ecology and behavior of Bengal slow loris under Guwahati University, Assam, India, and is the first ever study on the ecology of Bengal slow loris in the wild. He is he would be talking about to us about medicinal plants, excudates, and conservation implications of Bengal slow loris in India. It would be a recording, and Anna, can you play the recording? Greetings from India. It's Dr. Navajit Das from Primate Research Center, Guwahati, India. So the, my talk is the medicinal plant exudates and conservation implications of Bengal Solaris, Nephrisus bengalensis in India. So before going about the main topic, it is a very small, brief outline of the Bengal Solaris. Conservation of lorises in India mainly centered on slender lorises. Although in India, Bengal lorises first come to record in Champang, now it's in Nagaland, in Northeast India in 1920. Till 2007, it was data revision animal, as for the IUCN, due to the lack of adequate information on its distribution and the population status. In 2008, it is vulnerable, predicted to decline by more than 30% in next three generations for continuing hunting pressure and loss of habitat in the entire range. Now it's endangered in 2020. Uh, from CITES, it is upgraded from Appendix 2 to Appendix 1 in 2007. And in Indian Wildlife Protection Act 1972, 
It enjoys the highest conservation status, that is civil one species like tiger. The two types of loris found in India, one is the slender loris only found in southern part of India and another is the slow loris, that is the Bengal slow loris, the only nocturnal primate of genus Nectisibus found in northeast India, found in only this region. So these are the two loris in India. Altogether, nine species of slow loris of genus Nectisibus. So Bengalansis, that is the Bengal Soloris, Vlata Soloris, Pygmy, Javan, Philippine, Banka, Bornean, Kayan, and last one is the Sumatran Soloris. So these are all the IOC status of their. So among these nine different types of Soloris species, Bengal Soloris has the highest and widest ranging among all Soloris species covering nine different countries of Southeast Asia, that is Northeastern India. Bhutan, Southern China, Thailand, Bangladesh, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, Vietnam. That's why it is endemic to Southeast Asia. So distribution of Bengal Soloris in India is this is only found in northeastern part of India. That is which have the seven northern states. This so these are the seven northern states. So limited information on Bengal Soloris because it's the largest distribution and geographic range among all the soloris large morphological variation indicates additional taxa it's very poorly researched especially in the wild and in india very few ecological or distributional studies so far has been done so limited information is the main hindrance to develop any conservation strategy in india these data are the part of our ongoing ecological works on bengal soloris in northeast india so there is the study objectives feeding habits to know the feeding habits, to know the food preference and for the conservation prospectus of Bengal slow loris. So this is the study area. Study area main area is the Assam, it's only northeast Indian part. So this is the study site. It's a given wildlife sensitive which have five different compartments. It's a very small area. So their winter climate is 9 degree to 27 degree centigrade, summer climate is 25 degree to 37 degree centigrade. So, it's a very small area having only 20.98 square kilometer, but it's a seven different species of primates in Gibbon or Life Sanctuary. There's a western hill of Gibbon, Rhesus macaque, Assamian macaque, Pigtail macaque, Stumptail macaque, Cape Langur, and Bengal Soloris. The forest type is evergreen to semi evergreen forest that is in Gibbon or Life Sanctuary. Now comes to the study methods. For the loris searching, we used pre-existing trail at one kilometer per hour by walking using pet gel, myo, genon, halogen, headlamp. Loris were confirmed with their characteristics orange, red, eye sign. If we, talk, uh, if we encounter any loris, we are followed and observed for as long as possible. For activity budget and fitting behavior, instantaneous sampling at 5 minute intervals, continuous focal animal sampling to record fitting boards and duration of fitting, fitting boards considered independent if they separated by 5 consecutive minutes, collected data over a 24 month period. For the habitat study, we use type transject method, use 90% of study plots where loris encountered during behavioral sampling. Length and wide of each transect was 50 meter into 2 meter. Each stripe targeted at least at least 100 meter and a random direction. Trees is more than 20 centimeter in DBH were selected for the study. Feeding and plant preference. This is the analytical methods. Study period divided in, into two major seasons: winter, that is start to October up to March, and summer that is April to September based on the aerial temperature. Divided observation into three time frames that is early night 1800 to 2100 hours, midnight 2100 to 2400 hours and late night 2400 hours to 300 hours for Doris activity budget. Estimated the percentage of the time spent feeding on different plant and food types for each season. Fender plug and Scabia relativity index used for measuring 
the relative preference for plant species where where e1 ranges from minus 1 to plus 1 a zero value indicates random kidding plus 1 indicates maximum preference and minus 1 indicates maximum avoidance so this is the result bengal sonoris encountered 179 times over a study period in 38 different trees at average height of 11 meter a total of 170 hours of observation done during 279 work Feeding comprises 20.21 percent of activity budget and in winter it is 21.33 and in summer it is 19.09 percent recorded 243 feeding hours sorry recorded 243 feeding boards in 17 different plant species so overall feeding time is is plant exudates is cover almost 80.87 percent this is almost the highest ever. So the Bengal lorries mainly use plain exudate as the main food. That is 80 point eight seven. Otherwise, the bark, fruits, nectar, invertebrate, tender leaves they also use as a food. So these are the plant species and plant food part utilized by the Bengal lorry. So this is a plant name. They are the local name. This is the family of the tree. So this is the food parts of the plant: exudates, bark, fruits, nectar, tender leaves. So exudate you see all. Uh, from the 17 different trees, lorries use 14 plants for the exudate feeding. So it is very highest number. So feeding winter versus summer. So in winter it is 85.27 percent is by exudate feeding. In summer it is 76.47 percent is. So feeding again feeding percentage on different plants. So these are the plant names. So you you can see that the green, the uh, blue line uh, blue color is indicates the plant exudates. So these are the plant names. So these are the winter season and this is the summer season. Again here the blue is the exudate. So these are the plant name, plant food name, and here the full name of the plant food with the scientific and local name. These are the your plan board. So overall summary is the total exudate feeding in winter 85.27 percent is in summer 76.47 percent is in winter 13 plan used from 11 families in summer lorries use 11 plants from 8 families in winter complicity <coughs> is the family three family highest use for as exudate feeding is the same family both for winter and summer Complicacy and complicacy. Most used tree for exudates, that's the terminal sibula, terminal orduna, mesua ferrara, vertical encephalia, and ficus spida. In winter, in summer, similarly, terminal sibula, mesua ferrara, terminal orduna, vertical encephalia, and legastomia resinae. So these are the winter and versus summer exudate feeding of Bengal solaris. So as per Van der Plaag and Scabia relativity index, so here exudate feeding in winter. So this relativized electivity index shows five plan they use or preferred most preferred plan is the five because from it is up to the plus one. So this is a positive. Similarly, in summer, these are the five different plans have the positive value. So these are the maximum preference plan for the lorries both in winter. And summer. These are the plan name. You can see the plan name here. So this Penderplax and Scabby relativity, relativity index shown five different plans which are the maximum preferred, preferred food item for the lorries as exudates. So exudate feeding preference plan. These are the five different plans. Terminal Arjuna, Vertical Encephalia, Terminal Encephalia, Spondia Spinata and Mesoferida in winter. So these are the five different plans used for the Exudate feeding by Bengal lorries. All these lorries preferred plants have ethno medicinal value and traditionally used by people of Northeast India. So, these are the Tamil Arjuna used for both prevention and treatment of heart diseases, including angina. Sibula, they have digestive use for breeding of gums. Pinata have antifungal properties used for treatment for diarrhea. Mesua fresh flowers are used as a cure for excessive preperception. 
hetical encephalia bark used in dysentery so these are the plan used for some ethno medicinal value or as well as use some traditional medicines and used by the ayurvedic medicines so exilat feeding has been observed highest among all the food items 80.87 percentage percentage study shows high exilat feeding during winter it's 85.27 The lowest preferred food plants have pharmacological importance. Use as antiseptic, antifungal, antibacterial, antiviral, cardiogenic, stimulatory, and respiratory diseases in traditional medicines. These observations suggest that the food preference and dietary composition of Bengal soldiers is highly enriched with medicinal plants, which might have the implication on its physiology and sociosexual behavior. Use of ethnopharmacological plants may also have implications for the conservation of slowries slowries are are one of the most widely used species for traditional medicines in indochina whether or not there is any scientific validity behind slowries medicines the fact that this indochina species are now known to consume plant with medicinal value is of interest other lowry species also consume medicinal plants and this would be of the interest to understanding their ecology and conservation Finding a positive relationship between lorises and medicinal plants, such as their role as potential pollinators, may aid in their conservation. So these are some other species of slow loris and sternal loris. They use these types of plant, which also use as medicinal uses, used in Ayurvedic medicine. So not only Bengal slow loris use the medicinal plant, some other slow loris and sternal loris species also use. different types of medicinal plants for their exudate feedings to a greater understanding of the role of such plants in the primate diet and how these plants can be used for health maintenance is a promising new avenue for expanding our understanding about the biological basis and origin of traditional human medicinal practices developing applications of ethno medico knowledge for humans an emphasis on the dietary affinity of the species towards the medicinal plants is offering a strong vista for successful conservation in the region so i acknowledge all these institutions and donors for my studies thanks for listening my talk um dr navji are you here yes okay um okay we have a question here what could be the reason for uh, preponderance preponderance of plant ex excudate diet especially in winter and not in summer uh if <clears throat> as per my view uh, winter there is less uh, leaves that's why they mainly depend on excudate or gum in winter season but in summer there are lots of new plants or something like other fruits or insects are there available so that's why they prefer gum or exudate in winter season so in summer they don't have gum do you have any uh, idea feed on yes yes summer have gum but they since they feed mainly gum or exudate but in summer they slightly they depend on other food source also uh ma'am do you have any questions for him um i just wonder what your advice would be for feeding slow lorises in captivity and uh based on the fact that in your study site which is one of the most wild study sites where we have a long term study the gum yeah. composition is so varied and different Okay, it will be very fine in our study site if there is any uh, other study in there in my site. The tree is always different. There is the other parts of the rest of the country, so lots of different trees in other areas. Okay, so uh, we are going to be moving on to the next speaker. If we have any questions, please feel free to uh, email us. and we would be sending the questions to dr nabajit das 
Okay, so our next question, our next speaker is Dr. Qing Yong Ni uh, from China. He is a researcher in primatology and conservation biology, studying the ecology of slow lorises and biodiversity conservation in the southwest southwest China. So his talk is up now. Hello, dear colleagues and friends. I'm Qing Yong Ni. I'm from Strong Agricultural University, China. I'm happy to meet you here in this special time. My topic is, is about conservation and research of the Sulores in China. I will focus on the status and the challenges. There are 27 primate species distributed in China in four subfamilies. Two species are considered to be extinct, and most populations are declining. This map shows this map shows the distribution of the primate species across provinces in China. Most of the wild populations are distributed in the southwest, especially in Tibet, Guangxi, Guizhou, and, and Yunnan. There are 15 primate species are distributed in the in Yunnan province, including the two Sulores species. They are Bengal and Pygmy. There are some previous studies on these two species in different fields, including anatomy, physiology, genetics, microbiome, captive behavior. But only a small number of studies is about the field behavior, and the status of the wild populations remains unknown in several decades. So the first thing we need to know is where are these wild populations. We conducted a population survey in 2014. We conducted an interview across an area about 220,000 square kilometers. So the result indicated that the Bengal Sulores is distributed in 29 forest areas in 28 counties of Yunnan and only 1,000 individuals survived in the fragmented forest. And the pygmy sulores is distributed in five forest areas, and only less than 100 individuals survived. But I still think this result is op optimistic, because we didn't find any wild individuals of pygmy sulores in this survey. So maybe in the following 10 years, the pygmy sulores will disappear from China. Here are some pictures of the Bengal sulores in the survey. The last one is an individual killed by the local people. This is still happening in some areas, as well as the habitat loss. So the first challenge is, is first challenge is the continuous threats of hunting and habitat loss. But the question is, where are the individuals hunted? We can't get the direct information from the official channel, so we turn to the web news. We use the keywords of the Chinese name of the Solaris into the biggest search engine, and we check the web news reports on confiscation. Then we find hundreds of reports, including other primate species. The results indicate that the top top three primate species in the news reports on confiscation are Sulores and Macacas. There are more than 400 individuals of Sulores are reported, but at the same period in these 18 years there are only nine individuals were recorded in the CITES database. This huge difference indicates that the individuals reported in the web news are nearly, all the individuals are nearly illegal traded. And this map shows the distribution of the lowest confiscation.
and the premise. So this, this result indicates that the computation occurrence is consistent with the distribution distribution of the primate species. And the, the Yunnan, Guangxi, and Guangdong is the source of these individuals traded from. So the second challenge is the widespread illegal trade. But the question is, where are the individuals treated? So we still turn to the web news. We find we found that most of the individuals are sent into the zoos or wildlife rescue centers. So we found four rescue centers. They are all close to the border of Chinese uh, of China, with Myanmar. Laos and uh, Vietnam. Here are some pictures of the rescue centers. A small house, or you can call it a big cage. They put all the individuals together, the several cages. Uh, their diet is dominated by the fruits, the rice, the eggs, the commercial food. So we, we, we also set up several monitoring cameras in the rescue centers. The, in these rescue centers, the individuals were sent here for exhibition. exhibition. And in the two hours, you can see the two individuals are sleeping, but, but they change the position and the posture every time because of the disturbance from the visitors and in these rescue centers they put all the individuals together you can see nine individuals in this camera site so all these terrible things result from the limited knowledge in rescuing and captive management we tried to improve the captive management. So firstly, we conducted a simple comparison of the guards microbiota of the individuals from different captive sites. We found the result is site dependent. And the individuals from the most disturbed site shows their microbiota shows the the most distinct. And then we tried to improve the captive diet of the individuals. We chose ten individuals and added uh, gums and insects to their diet. And after two months, the results indicated a significant difference between the dietary groups and in time scales. We are trying to find more relations between the diet, the microbiota, and the metabolism. So until now, we can trace the individuals hunted from the wild. <clears throat> the most of the individuals are dead and some individuals are illegal treated to the personal captivity or be confiscated and some individuals are dead and at last a small number of individuals are released into the wild but until now there are not any post release monitoring system or project in China so I'm afraid all of the individuals released into the wilds are dead at the end. But in some reports, there are some glorious individuals survived in the cities. Uh, this is a, one of the big cities in China. One of the big cities in China, Shenzhen. It's beyond of the glorious distribution area. 
but the pygmy sororities are released into the city park and several individuals survived. In the winter, the individuals climbed on the street lamp to get warmer. So we can dis discuss about this. So is, is, is it right to put the individuals in the area beyond their distribution, distribution even if they can survive? Uh, this picture shows a common relief in China that we can find nearly everything is wrong. The times, the location, climate, vegetation, disturbance, uh, population. So the fourth challenge is the hard release. So recently, we are conducted a study on the search index of the different animal, different, uh, animal species in the social media. The social media provide their own in search index. For example, the Baidu, Weixin, Weibo is similar with Google, Facebook, and Twitter. So here is an example of three species. The Soloris, Giant Panda, and the Pangolin. So the red circle is Soloris. You can note that the search index is close to zero. That means the public is unwilling to search in search the Soloris in the social media. So we are trying to find the reasons behind this difference. I think it's important to figure out a conservation plan or improve the public awareness. So the last challenge is the Soloris is neglected by the public. I'd like to thank the fund and the Forest Bureau's Nature Reserve and the Zoos and Rescue Centers in China. I'd like to thank Professor Anna for her good help in my application of the National Nature Science Foundation of China. So I have got the grants. So that's good news. I can conduct my field study in the following four years about the reintroduction of Bengal Soloris. But I have no experience about this, so I really hope I can get an uh, opportunity to join a training program in your field site. So thank you so much. Thank, thank, thanks for listening. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, we do not have Queen Yong with us today. Uh, however, uh, you could always send us your questions. Please uh, write your questions to info at uh, littlefireface.org and we would forward it to Kvinyon and he would be more than happy to answer your questions. So we will be moving on to our next speaker that is Dr. Rupa uh, Satish from Wait, South India. Sita, isn't he there? Or is his, is his computer not working? Oh no, uh, yeah, he's just there. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> I I couldn't find I'm you. Sorry, I couldn't find you. So let's yes. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, just give me a moment. Uh, just a moment. I'll just pull out I, the questions. I have a question for Ching Yong while you're doing that, actually. Yes. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. So it's lovely to see you. Thank you so much for, for participating today. Um, I think you brought up a really important point that Marina also brought up. Um, and it's a threat that we don't hear talked about enough for slow lorises is of the hard release and um, authorities or even rescue centers releasing lorises um, without any monitoring or without even knowing their distribution or without knowing the behavior of the species they're releasing and i just wonder if you have any advice or what what your opinion is or about that sort of thing because it's something that's not just a problem in China, but throughout their range. If you could talk just a bit more about it. 
um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh uh, yeah, uh, I think in China, maybe this is a problem of the authorities or the government. So I, I think I need to co cooperate with the governments to, uh, to solve resolve this problem. Mm, but I, I, I'm trying to get more factors uh, involved in this project. So maybe I can co-work with the uh, recycle centers, the governments and the NGOs to, to this, this problem. Mm. But I have no experience about the reintroduction. So I really hope I can get more advice. And I think I, I need an opportunity to a training program maybe in your field site or marinas. Yeah, that, that would be great. Uh, there are some questions that's come up uh, from Facebook viewers. Uh, historically, did the Lawrence have a greater range in China? Sorry? Historically, did the Lawrence have a greater range in China? This is a question from Nida Griffiths. Great. Great range. Greater range. Did they historically, like over the maybe in the past, did the lorries have a greater range in China, like where they distributed more uh, in more places in China? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the in the past, they they di they are distributed in the north, but now they are restricted in the south. Okay, so what what is being done to face these challenges? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to figure out the resolutions. Yeah, so I'm trying. <laughs> so another person, Kai, wants to know in the same vein, where slow lorises mentioned in historical records in China? How were they regarded? Uh, were they regarded as good or evil? Uh, I think someone think it's a, uh, it's a cute, it's a uh, lovely, but some, in some, uh, tribe group, maybe they think it's just a food or medicine. Okay. So uh, is there mention of slow lorises in, uh, the literature, historical literature? Sorry? Is there uh, mention of slow lorises in historical literature? I, I I didn't catch your means. Okay. Is is there mention of slow lorises in the past books? Books from the past people uh, uh, written from the past? Uh is there mention of slow lorises anywhere there? There are, there are few reports about the slow lorises in in the in the books of or the justice a few studies of uh, papers about this. So no, not so much literature about the species. Okay. Thank you. I'm so sorry for missing Thank you. you. <laughs> like, so Thank you. yes, uh, we're gonna move on to the next speaker. Uh, we have Dr. Rupa Satesh from India. She's a veterinary doctor in the Vannargata Rescue and Rehabilitation Center, which is an NGO run by Wildlife Rescue and Rehabilitation Center. And she has been working there rescuing many, many different animals uh, since 2009. So she has worked on um, animals ranging from pangolins, foxes, jackals, Asian elephants, tigers, cobras, kites, and even the uh, slender lorises. So she's going to be talking about her walk with uh, the rehabilitation of uh, rescued slender lorises at her center. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Rupa Satish. I'm a wildlife veterinarian working at Banargata Rehabilitation Center. 
It is a wildlife hospital that is located inside Banargata Forest, Bangalore, India. It is run by an NGO called WRRC and it was established in 2002 to cater to the urban wildlife that we were receiving from all over the city as well as the adjoining areas. We basically receive small mammals like bonnet macaques, slender lorises, bird species like black kites, brahmi kites, reptile species like spectral cobras, russell's vipers, pond terrapins, etc. All these wildlife are protected under the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, wherein these animals cannot be kept as pets, they cannot be traded in, their body parts cannot be used for any purposes, including medicine, food, and other rituals. Slender lorises in particular are protected under the Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act, which accords it the status similar to lions, tigers, and elephants, wherein it is the highest level of protection. So today I will go into the, all the slender lorus cases that we encountered from the year uh, 2010 to 2020. This number one was received uh, in 2011 and this uh, adult weighed 260 grams. She was brought with one eye, that is left eye injured, as well as a uh, left uh, forelimb, which had a burn wound. And also there was a slight burn indentation on the nose tip. There were no other injuries, but uh, suspecting internal injuries, she was kept under observation, treatment. And uh, in spite of treatment, she slowly deteriorated and died after almost a month due to septicemia. Case number two was rescued uh, in 2012, and this animal had a body weight of 260 grams. Luckily, there were no injuries, but again, it was kept under observation and uh, released after uh, uh, ascertaining that its appetite was good and uh, discharges were normal, feces were normal. Case number three was rescued in, again in 2012 with the body weight of 165 grams. The left forelimb had a very typical stiffness and uh, burn injury. Uh, there were no other uh, injuries except few burn marks on the other uh, fingers. So this uh, left forelimb was amputated under anesthesia and the wound healed beautifully. And the animal was uh, showing a very healthy appetite, good movement and agility on the three limbs. And uh, she loved her cockroaches that were fed and also fruits like banana. Case number four was rescued in, in, in 2012 with a body weight of 230 grams. There were superficial burn wounds on the uh, paws, um, fingers, and uh, these healed uh, under uh, treatment. And so case number four and three were introduced together because they were uh, brought uh, around the same period. They got along well and uh, they were released together in a safe protected habitat in presence of forest officials. Case number four was a young animal weighing only 40 grams and there were burn wounds on the uh, forelimbs as well as the hind limbs. Uh, the animal ha strangely had a very good appetite for papaya and uh, in spite of treatment died after 24 days. On post-mortem, uh, the pathologist mentioned there were very pinpoint lesions on the liver but um, uh, uh, and no other uh, lesions internally so the diagnosis was kept as cholehepatitis. This case was brought uh, uh, with a body weight of 220 grams and uh, the right forelimb was showing the particular uh, typical stiffness. So amputation was done under anesthesia and it healed uh, uh, nicely and the animal was released in a safe protected habitat. Case number seven was rescued in 14, uh, 215 body weight and uh, there were no, luckily no external injuries. However, she was kept under observation and uh, once everything looked normal, was released. Case number eight was also rescued in 2014 with a body weight of 175 grams. There were very typical burn wounds in few fingers of the fore as well as the hind limbs and also no stip had some burn wounds. And this animal, in spite of treatment, died in 20 days and the on post-mortem, uh, the found to be a female. All the organs were very pale. There were pinworms that were found in the small and the large intestine. So the tentative diagnosis was put as anemia and nematode infection. 
this adult, sub-adult animal was rescued uh, uh, with a body weight of 225 grams and they, both the forelimbs showed this typical uh, burn lesions. Uh, also, there was a fresh wound on the ears and um, the animal sad, sadly died after 31 days and um, the, uh, they were uh, heart and liver showed some congestion. So, as well as pinworms were found in the intestine. The cause of death was tetanus, trauma, septicemia, and pinworm infection. Case number 10 was rescued in 15 with a body weight of 210 grams, and the animal sadly died 10 minutes of arrival. And as, as since I was a little um, uh, suspicious of the cause, I immediately did the postmortem and found that they were bleeding from the orifices and the chest region had particular subcutaneous bleeding, the hair was clipped, and um, otherwise externally there were no other burn injuries. Eyes were also normal. Uh, oral cavity had a few burn wounds. And uh, so basically uh, found that there was a pinpoint puncture in the rib cage. There was a puncture in the heart, bleeding into the thoracic cavity, and animal di died uh, due to drowning in its own blood. Case number 11 rescued in 2015 weighed 195 grams and luckily there were no external injuries uh, was observed uh, for 72 hour duration and released subsequently. Case number 12 uh, weighed 30 grams was uh, both the right forelimb was stiff which was an older injury but the axial or the armpit had a very fresh bleeding wound and the spine was damaged the animal could not move distinctly and the history was of a cat attack. This hapless animal died in four days and uh, cause of death was kept as traumatic shock. Case number 13 was rescued in 2016. Uh, came in a very dull condition. She weighed 175 grams. And there were these typical burn wounds on the hind limbs as well as a uh, very dull condition. This animal aborted a dead fetus the next day. And... Um, Though her appetite increased uh, and got better, but she also died in uh, almost a month, 26 days after the abortion. And uh, the EM findings were all organs were pale and the stomach and intestines were empty with no contents. Cause of death was kept as anemia and weakness. Case number 14 was rescued in 2016. This was brought by a police personnel, so the poachers were booked. Body weight was 220 grams and there were no external injuries. So animal was released after observation period. Case number 15 was uh, weighing 205 grams, was brought in a very pathetic condition. The left forelimb showed the uh, usual stiffness and there was a, a fresh maggot wound in the armpit and a typical burn wound in the hind limb. This animal also died and on postmortem we find that the mucous membranes are pale and uh, though the internal organs didn't show any um, abnormality, um, so the cause of death was yes, neurogenic shock. Uh, this case was brought in 2019 with a 355 body weight. And there were uh, superficial burn wounds um, on the hind limbs as well as the nose tip. But... Um, after treatment, they healed very well and was animals was released after two months. Case number 17 was brought in 2019, weighed 230 grams. And as you can see, both the four limbs are burnt already. This poor animal died in 26 days. Cause of death was septicemia. These two lorises, weighing 275 and 370 grams, were rescued in 2019. Both had luckily no injuries. They appear to be very active, alert. Uh, and so were released after a week's observation. Case number 19 was rescued in 2019, weighed 280 grams, had no external injuries and showed no abnormality, so was released after an observation period of one week in a, a safe protected habitat. Case number 20 was rescued in 2020. She was a road accident case. She was found on the road, main road, which runs through the forest. Both uh, thigh bones were fractured, the hip joint was uh, dislocated, and uh, surgery was done. But the animal died after a period of 55 days due to septicemia. 
Now, looking at all these cases, um, I've drawn a few conclusions. Uh, also, uh, I've spoken to locals. And uh, I've come to the conclusion that all the lorises had very distinct burn-like wounds, which led to necrosis. And then, unlike the normal animal bite wounds, the, the, out of the 22 lorises that we got in the 10-year period, 11 died of their injuries, and 7 had no abnormality and were released. The lorises mostly had the limb finger injuries, as well as the palm burn injuries, 11 numbers out of the 22. The left forelimb was injured in 4 of them, whereas the right was in 2 of them. And both fore and hind limb, uh, which were burnt, were only in 2 cases. And both these 2 cases died. Uh, the superficial burn wounds on the fingers and the palms are found in nine cases, whereas uh, the eye injury was found in one case, heart uh, injury was in one, and liver in one case. And out of among all of them, the animals uh, which were treated for their injuries and recovered and released were four. Looking at all the injuries which were very typical and speaking to locals, uh, I've come to the conclusion that this is a very intentionally done uh, ritual in a black magic practice, which is done locally, where the lorises are being used as a living voodoo doll, where they are connected with the victim and then they are uh, tortured, uh, mutilated and injured using needles and pins, which are usually heated. And the areas that are normally injured are the eyes, forelimbs, hind limbs, nose, and even internal organs like heart, liver, and other internal organs. But the animals with internal injuries usually do not survive long enough to be uh, to reach a center like ours for treatment and subsequent uh, release. This uh, black magic practice is a very cruel practice that is being done uh, uh, to the slender lorises in particular. The main reason which uh, I have come found out is because they are uh, one, they do not have any effective defense mechanisms like venom or sharp uh, uh, claws or teeth to attack their, um, uh, you know, uh, capturers or poachers. And secondly, they have these uh, beautiful eyes, which is basically because of their nocturnal nature. But because of the beautiful eyes, they considered magical and tortured and um, mutilated in this cruel practice. Uh, and the only way to overcome and stop this cruel practice is through education and awareness, since the law already prohibits and is against such rituals. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Dr. Rupa, can you unmute yourself? Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, Dr. Rupa, we can hear you, though we cannot see you yet. Hi, hi. Wow. There you go. Okay, so we have some questions for you, Dr. Rupa. Yeah. Um, a person, uh, Nora asks, I didn't get the point to keep the most injured lor slender lorises until death. The As such as the burnt ones, instead of abbreviating... Uh, instead of abbreviate the pain? Uh, that's a very valid question. Uh, but I, uh, I have to inform you that in the Indian laws, we cannot, uh, the vets cannot euthanize any wild animal because since they're all scheduled animals, we need to uh, inform the forest officials who will make a committee of other forest officials to other government vets, including myself. And there's a discussion that happens which usually takes, the whole protocol takes around two, three months, you know. So by the time I get this going, the animal uh, succumbs any which ways, but it takes a lot of bureaucratic hassle to start the procedure, you know. So that's why we, we try to uh, get it on road, though I know it is cruel and the animal is suffering, but I cannot um, uh, take a decision on it on my, uh, on my own, you know, because we work under the Karnataka Forest Department. It's a government uh, policy. Okay, the next question is from Louise. In the case of released lorises, uh, were you involved in the release? And if so, when and where uh, were they done? Like, do, were they done during the day or the night? I, uh, yes, uh, I was involved in the release. And it was, uh, I cannot share the location with you, but uh, uh, please take it from me that we've released it in a location where there are lorises recorded and in camera trapping, basically. 
and uh, the time being not very late at night but evening twilight time because uh, the um, uh, the uh, um, one it is uh, the forest officials who accompany us insist that uh, we do not go late into the night in the forest you know because of uh, the problems of other wild animals uh, but uh, we make sure the animal is not too uh, confounded with all the light you know we make sure it's getting dark yeah just to add another point uh, in indian while in indian law we need special permission to go into the forest in the night yes and hence yes. we the latest we could uh, loiter around along with the forest department is 6 o'clock 6 p.m so we wait till it gets as dark as possible and the release is done yeah. we try uh, to push it later also and uh, thankfully the forest officials also very very considerate that way but it's no safety point of view because we have a lot of rogue elef wild elephants sorry so uh, yeah there there can be little trouble you know so just for everyone's safety yeah uh shashi is asking uh, which area is the black magic being practiced uh all over south india actually and i feel basically where lorises are found it is being used otherwise what happens is they will maybe use an egg they will use a uh, lime uh barn owls are being used so i feel that they use whatever is locally available and the as the animal is more and more um, rare and maybe protected under law the costs go up but the practice is very prevalent i mean if nothing is available people will use an egg or a chicken and sacrifice it during a specific time and go ahead with it so we cannot uh, stop the practice my problem is stop using the lorises you know and other scheduled wild animals i think you can use your eggs and uh, maybe domestic chickens uh, uh, though that's also sad but uh, please we have to stop using scheduled animals you know uh, yeah in this practice yeah i think anna mam has a question for you yes yeah. i do hello thank you so much for your talk um i thank you ma'am i worked uh, for several years in sri lanka and there were many stories of using lorises for for the kind of kinds of practices you're describing and um less so than for medicinal purposes it was using them in rituals for example to gain wealth or to see a particular yes. goddess and i'm yes. wondering if that's partially what you're seeing as well yes ma'am uh, more or less it's to secure a job marriage very very inconsequential inconsequential reasons uh, you know taking the life of such a beautiful animal but the i want to make a point here is it's the very rich people who are using lorises because a common poor person when he goes to this practitioner he doesn't have enough money to get a loris you know so he will maybe just use the lemon and pay 100 rupees whereas the people who are using the loris have money in lakhs you know so they are the rich people they are the affluent people and the political class if i may say so you know because that's where the power struggles are and 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 that's that's where the the will political will to stop this and completely uh, you know stamp it out is lacking though the law pro prohibits any any such uh, use of animal in ritual and and in your experience with the schedule 1 animals is the loris one of the most common or is there another highly protected species that you see as the most common one used for these purposes no ma'am it's the loris it's the slender loris in birds we have barn owls and rock eagle owls used but they schedule 4 uh, but yes they are also being used but schedule 1 it's only the loris you know and uh, uh it's quite sad and now they're saying they're using turtles they're moving to newer animals because maybe the lorises are getting more and more smarter and you know not uh, being caught as easily maybe or the numbers are declining i am not sure about that but um, uh, in mammals we only see lorises yeah thank you uh, thank you dr rupa so If people could you could always start uh, send us your questions and we will direct it to dr rupa and she'll be more than happy to answer you uh, uh yeah there's one one question before we leave is there any uh, tracking or id equipment fitted to the lorises when you have successful releases no we uh, yeah i, I uh, you know the, we lack the funding frankly you know there is no money to uh, track all the releases we do we not able to track it and monitor what is happening which will which will really give a very good insight you know i think uh, we need to work on that funding aspect and that study you know yeah but as of now no no 
Thank you, Dr. Rupa. Uh, we Thank will be you. moving on. Next is Laif. Um, Laif is a faculty member at the University of Philippines and a faculty member at uh, Philippine G Genome Center, Mindanao. His research interests are on wildlife biology, wildlife human interactions, uh, wildlife parasitology, and primatology. So today, life would be talking about the past and future studies in slow lorises in Philippines. Good day, everyone. I am Liz Erickson Gamalo, and I'm going to share information on the nature of the Philippine slow loris researchers. This short talk is entitled Past and Future Studies on Slow Loris in the Philippines, which will be based from our recently published manuscript on gaps and opportunities on Philippine non-human primate research, focusing on the Philippines slow loris. Moreover, I will also share the future plans, collaborations, proposals we wrote to fill in the gaps of information about this amazing animal. Before I start my presentation, I would like to thank the Little Fireface Project for inviting me to talk about the slow loris in the Philippines in this very important virtual loris conference. Just a short background, despite being a mega diverse country, the Philippines has only three species of non-human primates, namely the endemic Philippine tarsier, which is present in the Mindanao fauna region that includes the islands of Bohol, Samar, Leyte, Dinagat, and Greater Mindanao. Second, the long-term macaque, Macaca fascicularis, present throughout the archipelago. And the third is the least known Philippines low loris, Ectocebus minagensis, which has also the most restricted range and is present in southern Mindanao. In terms of its geographical extent, the species is found in Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, and in Mindanao, Philippines. In southern Mindanao, it is present in the islands of Tawi-Tawi, Mungao, Sangasanga, and other small islands in Sulu Archipelago. It was once believed that the species inhabits the greater island of Mindanao, specifically in Mount Malindang, but it was just a case of a mislabeled specimen of a young long-tailed macaque. Thus, the easternmost record of the species distribution is still in Tawi-Tawi. So the Philippines low loris was considered a subspecies of the Sundas low loris, previously known as the Nectocebus pukang minagensis. The species was recently split from Nectocebus mancanus, Nectocebus borneanus, and Nectocebus cayenne. The species inhabits forested areas and also in gardens and plantations, and is currently threatened by logging and wood harvesting, hunting, and illegal wildlife pet trade. Thus, the species population is decreasing and is considered threatened under the red list of the IUCN. However, the exact status of the Philippine population is still unknown. So to understand the trend of Philippine non-human primate research, we did a literature search, including those published from the past from 1989 to 2019. Theses and reports that are available and searchable online were also considered. However, general biodiversity assessment, reviews, and books were not. From this method, we were able to generate the trend and the nature of studies for the Philippine non-human primates. The search literatures were then classified according to the species being studied. Approach, if the study was conducted in the wild, captive, or using previously collected samples or data only. Type of research, ecology, diseases, conservation, behavioral studies, and author affiliations. If they are Philippine affiliated or unaffiliated or co collaboration of the two. In terms of research efforts, the Philippine primate studies is increasing. However, the number of studies about the slow low risk is still very low as shown in the figure, which was mainly done by foreign only affiliated researchers. Moreover, when we look into the approach of the research, we found out that the studies were only based on existing samples or data, such as distributional reports and museum specimens. Clearly, field-based research and research in captivity settings 
are lacking. And most of the field-based ecological studies came from populations in Borneo only. In terms of research type, um, such as behavioral diseases, genetics, conservation, anatomy and physiology, etc., all are, are relatively lucky compared to long-term macaques and Philippine tarsiers. There are actually many possible reasons why this species is understudied in southern Mindanao. First, the species has a very restricted geographical range. Second, being cryptic and nocturnal, the species is hard to detect, which probably contributes to the lack of knowledge about its distribution in the Philippines. Third, is the threat in terms of peace and order in some places where this species is present. Because of the lack of information, the species has still not been assessed at the national level yet, but the species is considered vulnerable according to the updated IUCN Red List. Relevant unpublished papers that cannot be searched for or retrieved online are existing, which have potential valuable information that can be used for the conservation of the species. Thus, we hope that the study reported here will help to encourage local researchers and students to increase the visibility of their work by publishing them. Research support and funding are also needed and is a priority to increase research effort to this understudied population. The literature assessment we did is just the beginning to fill in the research gaps for the slow lorries and other non-human primates in the country. Using the results, we have determined the priority research type that should be done for the conservation of the species. So currently, together with Mr. Uh, Muhammad Asarabin, we are already finalizing with the proposal to study the ecology of slow loris in Bungao, Tawi-Tawi. Specifically, to determine the species abundance and density and characterize the animal's habitat use. We were actually um, planning to do a preliminary visit in the site in the last months. However, due to COVID-19 crisis and lockdowns, we were not able to continue the visit. So aside from the population count, we also aim to study the knowledge, attitude, and practices of the local people towards the species, such as reports on illegal wildlife trade, as this, as this data are valuable to generate management plans and conservation strategies for the species. So these pictures were sent by Mr. Obin showing as little as being sold in the roadside in the area. And this supports the claim that the species is traded locally in Tawi-Tawi. Lastly, Dr. Nelson Donato, a wildlife veterinarian and the host of the national TV show Born to be Wild, who have documented slow lorries in Sulu Archipelago, have been very supportive and is willing to collaborate with the Philippine Genome Center Mindanao. We plan to barcode the blood samples their team collected from the species in the area. If possible, we are also aiming to sequence the whole mitochondrial DNA of the specimen and generate a phylogenetic tree to trace its ancestry. These barcodes are also helpful for the conservation management of the species, such as fighting against um, illegal wildlife trade. The success of conservation and management of a species depends on the scientific knowledge and set of national level priorities. The lack of scientific knowledge and the Philippine slow loris in the Philippines challenges conservation initiative and its survival in its natural habitat in the place. Although there are already plans to study the species, such as the few um, presented here, more are still needed. Thank you very much. Live, would you be able to unmute yourself? Hi. Uh, hello. So just hold on a minute. We're just pulling out the questions, if any. Um, 
okay so uh, we're going to give give it 5 or 10 minutes for people to given their questions so we'll just move on to the next talk and people will give in the questions and we'll get back to you i i can have one one question in the meantime um i actually i know that um what well, it's just interesting um for doing the dna barcoding um what method are you going to use to get the information from the blood or can you do your dna barcoding from any other materials like the hair of the slow lorises um, so far, um, we are doing barcodes of different wildlife species in the in in our in PGC, the Philippine Genome Center. But currently, we have already have only the protocols for barcoding on tissue samples. Um, but the, the hair, um, we don't still have that protocol yet. And how difficult is it for you to send genetic samples outside the Philippines? Are you allowed to send it to other places for like a, a full genome sequencing, anything like that? Oh, actually, we can, um, or we can, or uh, we don't have to send it um, outside the Philippines to do a whole genome sequence because um, our partner in the Philippine Genome Center in in Diliman Campus of uh, University of the Philippines. In Diliman, um, they already have this um, technology to barcode um, to do a whole genome sequence. I mean, um, but when sending samples, I think um, I know that we there are many permits that should be um, um, that should we have before we can send it to other areas, uh, even in other regions. And and again, I've. I've about doing the wild studies, are there, how difficult would it be to work in, in the areas where lorises are? Are there, are there political issues right now that mean you can't work there? Is that the main reason that they're not being studied, do you think? Um, I, I think it, it's one of the, of the reason um, the um, armed conflicts um, in some areas, but not all. Um, as what um, Mom Jude um, stated, um, not all areas are um, there, there are conflicts. So um, in 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 Bungao, it's relatively safe, and it's just we need only to have a proper coordination with the local government um, units and um, universities there. So with uh, Mr. Muhammad, um, we already. Um, um, started doing a proposal, but the problem is actually the funding. Um, yeah, but in uh, yeah, sure. Did, uh, did they did they have sightings in Bungao in the forest? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, so far, um, is it really in Bungao uh, or in Panglima Sugala? Um, it's it's in that in it's 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 in that area, ma'am. Should. Yeah, according to, to my collaborator. Um, but that's um, one of the, that's one, I'm sorry. Um, so that's one of the, of the main reason. Uh, we just want to, to know, uh, one of the reasons um, to study there is just to confirm if there already, uh, there are still wild population of solars in that area. Because when we were doing the interviews, they were saying that what they have seen in Bungao are pets, uh, which, you know, uh, maybe they weren't able to sustain the food or the cages, so they just let them go. That, I mean, that was a story. That's why we went to Simonol, and we were able to see them in the wild, except that they keep on cutting the trees. Whenever they see one, they would cut the tree. And that is one of the problems we have. We really have to do the work now. Because yeah. we'll all be gone if we don't start it now. Yes, mom, you're right with that. When you if say they are, cut the tree, is that because of a belief or is that to catch the lorus to show it to you or is it? I really don't know because the, 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 that, that individual we saw that was my last day in the island, and uh, we saw the individuals. So we we, we uh, um, so we observed it and recorded the behavior. The next day, after I left, the next day when my student, when Marisa Mitzi went back to that area, 
the tree was cut already. So I said, where did the animal go? Because it's it's very slow. It can it can transfer, but it's very slow. So um, I don't know what they were doing. And and she said, Mom, because they they told me that it was supposed to be. I mean, that area is supposed to be uh, cleared for the beach resort. So that's we need to do it. I mean, if we want to, but we cannot go there now. No, yeah. <laughs> cannot because of the pandemic so it's a problem yeah but we will but we should <laughs> <laughs> you can do it uh, i mean you don't need to go by plane you can go by land yeah that's my advantage by here by in working in mindanao <laughs> although it's very far Thank you very much Minjut, for that um information yeah. and there's one other question in the chat which is which gene do you use to do the barcoding? And that question's from Hassan. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, we are actually targeting the, the CY uh, mitochondrial genes. Um, and that's why we also aim, uh, we want to also to barcode the whole mitochondrial, whole mitochondrial um, DNA of the Philippine population. And uh, Luis has a comment. Uh, he just wants to let you know that it is possible to get DNA from chewed items such as tree bark or buckle cells or uh, saliva when obtaining DNA. Uh, I know, I, I mean, he knows as he has managed to get DNA from pine cones that uh, red squirrels had chewed on in the UK. So you could wow. try that. Non invasive, yeah. yes. Non invasive. Nice. And Dolores' <laughs> chew on gum. So probably you can pick up that as well. And uh, yeah. another question is hunting for human consumption or poaching for trade a uh, threat in uh, Philippine laws? Yeah, there are um, actually uh, many um, reports already with that um, in, 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 in social media. And uh, the study of Mamju is the first time to study the wild population. I'm confirmed that. And maybe uh, Mamju can also. Uh, they uh, actually they don't really I, I, I eat it. I mean, they're Muslims. They trade. don't eat wildlife. Well, yeah. That's very good. But uh, it's for the pet trade. They collect it for the pet trade. That's so, right. Oh, yeah. I, I invited uh, Emerson C to the to this forum because he's the one who's uh, working on illegal wildlife trade. So I hope uh, he can help us in the data. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Life, and thank you, Professor Judeline. That was a wonderful thank chat. Let's thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and let's move on to our final talk for this evening. Uh, we have uh, our uh, uh, Esther Edina, who is from the Little Fireface Project. And she has a bachelor de degree in forestry engineering and is a research assistant at uh, the Little Fireface project. She would be giving a talk on the social behavior of the Javan slow lords observed at uh, Fireface's uh, field site, Chipaganti, West Java. It's a recording. Hello, my name is Esther. I am from West Java, Indonesia. I am a research assistant in Little Fireface Project. Little Fireface Project, or LFP, is an organization that located in Garut, Cipaganti, West Java, since 2012. The project's scope of research is behavioral ecology, social, and education conservation. And today, I will be talking about the social behavior in the Javan slow loris. Javan slow loris, or Nitithibus javanicus, is one of the endemic primates in Indonesia. It has critically endangered status from IUCN, and the population declined due to habitat fragmentation and illegal wildlife threat. This is the habitat and geographic distribution of the Javan slow loris. So, Javan slow loris has a small range of geographic distribution. It is in West Java and Central Java. 
In West Java, we can find Javan slow loris in primary forest, secondary forest, disturbed forest, and bamboo forest. Only 14% of the Javan slow loris we found in the protected area, while the rest, we can find it outside the protected area. Outside of the protected area, lorises can be found in agroforestry area. In West Java, such as in Ciamis, Tasikmalaya, and Cipaganti, Garut, which is our study site. The home ranges of the Nictisebus species depends on habitat type, ages, and sex of the individuals. The home ranges influenced by food sources and potential mates. For female, female has home range between 1.5 until 3.5 hectares, and the home ranges do not overlap with another females, including the offspring of the other females while for males has the bigger home range than the females one. And the home range can uh, has range between 1.5 until 5 hectares. And female and males both are territorial and they define the territory using the same marking. This is the activity budget and social behavior in the Japan slow loris. Here is a graph of the Japan slow loris daily activity. This has the main behavior such as travel, social, sleeping, resting, grooming, freeze, feeding, explore, and alert. As we can see, exploring is the most frequently observed behavior. From this main behavior, approximately 43% of the activity budget. Exploring behavior indicates an individual is taking information about their environment, which can be for several different purposes, such as searching for food, locating family, or olfactory searching for mates. I will be highlighting about the social behavior, which is our topic from, for this presentation. For the social behavior, we have 7% approximately, and it is bigger than the travel behavior, sleeping behavior, or grooming behavior. In behavioral research, sociality can be defined in three different categories, which is solitary, semi-solitary, and group. Solitary, as we know, the animal in solitary usually alone, unless mating or raising young, and we never found them in a group. While for the group sociality, the majority of time spending with the group, they always with family members and non-monogamous mating system. Semi-solitary can be used to define many different social structure found in mammals between solitary and group. So semi-solitary covers the solitary sociality and the group sociality. They found often foraging alone, the individual raise the young alone or in pairs and have social interaction generally, generally limited to family units. For example, of the semi-solitary sociality is for orangutan. In orangutan, we find males not involved in raising young, while the female raising young alone, but may socialize with other females and their offspring. So how do we define social behavior? Social behavior is an interaction between two or more organisms encompassing any behavior in which one member affects the other. In our research, we categorize social behavior as affiliative behavior and agonistic behavior. Affiliative behavior often defined as friendly and peaceful acts. This affiliative behavior usually provide mutual benefit to all individuals involved. And affiliative behavior has function to developing, maintaining, or strengthening social bonds. While agonistic behavior as threatening behavior, aggression, fighting, or submission. And this agonistic behavior commonly occurs over access to resources such as food sources, shelter, and mates. <clears throat> this is the social structure of the Japanese lolloris. In the sleeping site, we find that individual can be found sleeping solitary, in pairs, or in family unit. Family unit for Japanese lolloris consists 
one female and one male, which is the parents, and up to three offspring. Offspring may stay with parents for up to three years. After that, they may disperse. When offspring disperse from their natal home range, they will spend more of their time alone until they establish their own territory and find a mate. Floloris communicate with other individuals such as family members or potential mate through acoustic and ultrasonic vocalization and physical contact. Males with family or mated males may enter other females' home ranges in an attempt to mate if the female is in estrus. <clears throat> this pie chart shows the agonistic behavior of the lorises, such as agonistic proximity, submission, flee, fight, chase, and agonistic vocalization. Agonistic proximity is defined as displaying aggressive behavior towards another individual, but no direct contact occurs. This aggressive behavior may result in fighting between individual. So, both female and males may fight to defend territory, and males will also fight over females. And this is the social behavior from affiliative behavior. We have affiliative behavior, many such as social groom, passive contact, playing, mating, and also include interaction between parents and offspring, such as infant being carried by the parents or parents carrying infant. I'm going to focus on four behaviors, which is affiliative proximity, social grooming, playing, and neutral proximity. Neutral proximity is two or more individuals within 20 meters of each other engaging in separate activities without showing interest in each other. So if we find the focal animals, find another uh, different animal, but they have no interest in each other, so we can call it a neutral proximity. For the affiliative proximity, it means that individuals are within two meters of each other and show interest in each other, but there is no direct contact. And now about social groom. Social groom occurs between parents and offspring and between mates. As we know, grooming removes dirt or parasites. It can also strengthen the bond between, of, between the individuals and also have mutual benefits for both of them. It maintains affiliative relationship between individuals. And the last is playing behavior. This behavior occurs between parents and offspring, and also between mates and between siblings. The playing behavior has an important role in the development of the young individual. The playing behavior can last from five minutes until an hour, and it has important role in offspring development. Fathers play equal, equal role in raising offspring and use playing behavior to help their offspring develop their motor skill and social skill. For example, we have an observation data about the father Fernando and the offspring Shakti. We found them playing for about an hour. They were mock fighting, fighting, hugging, and wrestling. And with this behavior, it can help Shakti, the offspring, in the future for socializing with another individual. While in adults, playing behavior can increase the social interaction tolerance. This chart shows behavior based on the presence of another individual. The darker colors in this chart represent when the focal individual engage in a behavioral such as exploring, feeding, or grooming, while in the presence of another individual while the lighter color means that the focal individual engage in behavior while there is no presence of another individual. As you can see, although it is uncommon, florists do engage in all of the main behaviors 
in the presence of another individual. This part, of course, social behavior has the biggest percentage of the darker color, which is presence of another individual because social behavior requires the presence of another individual. For this one, we have eye shine. It is not a behavior, but it means that we can see the lorises, the focal individual we observe. And then we have the darker color here. It means that when we see the focal individual over there, we can see another eye shine or another individual near them within 20 meters. It's also happened with the alert behavior, explore behavior, feed behavior, or groom behavior, and all behavior, any other behavior. Due to their creepy and nocturnal nature, it is difficult to observe and categorize social behavior in the Javan slow lorries. We have found that individuals divide their time between foraging and socializing. We have also found that parents use play as a tool to teach their offspring and that males have a significant role in raising their young. Despite this important relationship between males and their offspring, males may try to mate with receptive female outside of their family unit, indicating that males will act to maximize their reproductive success. So based on our observation and this behavioral data, we could argue that the Java Slowloris social structure could be defined as semi-solitary. That's all about my presentation about the social behavior in the Java Slowloris. Thank you for all of your attention and good afternoon. Okay. Esther, are you here? Hi, hello. My name is Tunga. Tunga. <laughs> okay, so um, does anybody have any questions for Esther? Just give two minutes, people will. Ah, there you go. When females have offspring, does the father always stick around to create a family unit? So when, when we have females that have babies, mm -hmm. do the males stay with the female after she's had the baby to raise yeah. the family? Yeah, based on our observation, we still see that the father still stay with the offspring and also for the female because uh, as we as I explained before that uh, Japan's lolloris is a bit different with orangutan, which is uh, in the parenting, while the father still has, um, they, the father, Mm, uh, has so socialized with the offspring often and that become the difference between orangutan and the Japan slowly. So yeah, the father still stay with the family unit and yeah. Nice. So uh, there's a follow-up question. Have you experienced a family unit where the mother has died? Does, does this affect the dispersal age of offspring? Hmm. Can I answer this yeah. one for you? I'm actually going to answer this one for <laughs> Esther. Um, hello, I'm Katie, the research coordinator here at the Little Fireface um, project. I have a little bit more background information on the project um, due to my role. We actually do have a very good example of that. We had a Loris coupling called Maya and Fernando, and unfortunately, Maya passed away. Um, at the time, they had... Um, a few offspring, unfortunately I can't tell you the ages, but their youngest offspring called Ma'af, um, as a result of his mother's death, um, his behavior and his uh, ranging became quite unstable. And this was reflected actually throughout his lifetime um, where he didn't ever really settle down. And he had difficulty finding a mate um, and finding a stable home range. Um, while his father, Fernando, who had lost his wife, sorry, his wife, <laughs> his mate, um, <laughs> uh, also had difficulty finding a new partner and he moved between a few different females in attempts to mate with them before he settled with his current mate, um, Shirley, who, who now has a family mm -hmm. with um, and currently has three offspring. 
So definitely the loss of the of the mother was a very turbulent period for both the father and the offspring um, of that Loris, that Loris individual. So yeah, definitely affected um, their movements. Um, interesting. So the next question is, what are some of the difficulties in categorizing behavior? It feels like some behaviors could fit in more than one category. So how are the behaviors observed? Tell them your experience. What do you do? About the... When you see something in the field and you're not sure what you're seeing, how do you decide? Use, use your instinct. Yeah? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it is very difficult. It is very difficult when you're in the field. Um, we have a behavioral ethogram that was developed in 2014. So we absolutely um, have a very, very detailed ethogram that helps us to define what we're seeing. Um, I encourage our researchers, our students and our volunteers to trust their gut um, because it's very difficult to give advice on something that mm. you're not seeing. Um, so generally you can use context. What, what was the Loris individual doing before the interaction occurred or who are the individuals involved? Because often that can give you a clear indication of what the behavior might be, um, but absolutely what we do is we use our gut. Luckily, we spend a lot of time yeah. um, uh, learning with these individuals and really getting to know them quite well. And that definitely helps in, um, in um, categorizing what we're seeing because obviously wild animals can't really be put in boxes and we appreciate that, but we definitely try our best. Can I just say something there as well very quickly is we worked really hard to make a video ethogram of the slow loris as well. And so on our YouTube channel, we have a series of all the behaviors on our ethogram with drawings, videos, and word descriptions. So anyone out there who wants to study snow lorises <laughs> can use that as a tool. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of resources available to become loris experts. <laughs> okay, the next question is from uh, Mary Mills. So if a male father, uh, if a male fathers are young with two separate females, Will he socialize with both families, albeit separately? Do you understand? Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, based on our observation, um, uh, basically the father is not young. <laughs> no, I mean, and then uh, they socialize with another uh, female Loris, mm -hmm. and yeah, but I haven't seen any other observation, like any social behavior outside of the uh, family mating. unit, family unit, the mating, but they socialize, socialize with another female while, especially in Easter's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, once, once the mating occurs, we don't often see any mm. social behavior occurring again between the, um, the new mother and, and the father, um, but it might be happening. It's very difficult. Um, to truly know the parentage of some of our individuals due to the, the complexity mm, yeah. of, um, of Loris um, social structure. So it's a potential question, but one that we would be better equipped to answer once we've done some genetic analysis. Go on, Anna. <laughs> I, I think the important thing to say is that we, 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 we need to call them the social father. So you have pairs yeah. that mate, that stay together as social pairs, they have really exclusive range overlap. The reason the males ranges are larger is because they have these excursions to other females. We don't know if the, but we don't know who the actual genetic father is of anyone. So maybe all of our lorises in the entire population have one father <laughs> genetically, mm -hmm. but as social fathers, they stay within their group and they parent within their social group. So it's, um, yeah, you wouldn't have a, you would, even if he was the father of someone else, he yeah. wouldn't leave his group to parent in another group. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there is another complicated uh, single parent question. What happens if a male in a family group then produces offspring with another female not in the family group? Does that female have to be a lone parent or a single parent? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we just answered that though it, it's it's essentially she still is another male so that male is just a cuckold and he has to take care yeah. of the that's not it, his. it all just gets a bit uncomfortable in the 
<laughs> in the um, yeah in the Loris society basically because yeah lots of things going on under the covers um and yeah that's just yeah they get yeah. on with their lives they have yeah. their their official husbands and wives and their their kids and you know everything's very hush hush <laughs> <laughs> so is your paper on the behavior of slow Loris published already oh okay so um esther's not currently writing a paper this is just this is just observations oh, yeah. she's made um, whilst working as a research assistant, but absolutely it's something that could be published. Yep. And I just say as well, there was a paper published on Monday, which is about the territorial behavior of slow lorises. And, um, and we looked at the home range size, we looked at the male female pairs, and we looked at how they were defending their home ranges. So that was published Monday in Current Biology. But um, and there are some social organization, social behavior papers, some social behaviors and some papers. We've published over 100 papers. So um, there is some social behavior, but not one specifically on social behavior. So that will be coming. And there are more questions. <laughs> so when you say that uh, groom, grooming and play is observed between mates, you mean between adults, if that's correct. Do adults usually play? Because I have uh, the the writer because I always understood play was not usual between adults. You can answer that one. Oh yeah. So yeah, uh, for grooming, it's happened in adults, and for playing, also happens in adult. And um, we often see subadult and adult also. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, adults can play with each other yeah. without there being offspring or mm -hmm. juveniles involved. Definitely. I think it's a big part of um, kind of like the courtship between two potential mates as well and between um, mated couples. Mm. So, yeah, it's quite quite common on our lorises. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A follow up question. As you have so detailed observations of loris behavior, have you observed mothers carrying the corpses of their dead infants? It's very common in other primates. No, um, not, no, not, no. At least, I mean, Anna might have very historic data on that, but no, we have not no. seen that. No. I, I would say we've had a very high success rate when we have an infant born. I think there was only one or two that we didn't see again, and the others all, yeah. all survived till yeah. they were older, at least. We've had plenty of deaths during dispersal, but um, yeah, yeah, we've not seen. Most of our lorises either reach adulthood or disperse um, under our observation. Okay, uh, the next question is, I'm uh, Mary Mills. I'm wondering whether the Javan slow loris thrives best in settled family units. Is that true? Whether they what, sorry? She's wondering whether the Javan slow loris thrives best in settled family units. So, um, do individuals um, have more successful lives if their family unit is settled, or mm -hmm. are they are they less successful when they're like math when they're not settled? Oh, yeah, well, based on our observation, they they more successful in their life while for while they have a settled family unit because yeah they care each other I think mm -hmm. and yeah. They are better. Yes, that's a yes to that question. They do fare better, definitely. <laughs> Louise, uh, Louise is asking, you mentioned vocalizations. Do you think they could be used to find more populations using bioacoustic monitoring? That's a big question. Yeah. Like, um, I think we're still developing the research for the vocalization, but um, maybe it's potential to have more uh finding more population based on vocalization but yeah we're still developing the research about that but yeah we find also whistling like example for example for the vocalization is whistling like it's the um, explaining aware position of each lorises so maybe yeah i think yeah i think it would be better with ultrasonic vocalizations like bat detecting vocalizations because most of their vocalizations are not audible to humans. And do they have playback, ma'am? Do slow lorises have playback? Like we, we've experimented with that, and we didn't get any results. 
Um, but I have in a rescue center seen a wild loris in a tree calling to a loris in a cage and they called to each other. Okay. So it, so, so it, it potentially could work, but we've experimented and it never worked yet. I, I experimented on um, slender lorises. They don't call back. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we never got received any call back. Uh, the last question. Uh, in case of Bengal slow loris, if the mother dies, in case where the mother baby duo is re rescued, what should we do further? Uh, in other words, if you rescue a mother along with the baby and the mother dies, what do we do? Would you like me to take this, Anna, or would you like to take this? You can start and I could finish maybe. Okay, <laughs> sure. Um, so we try our best here to not rescue animals. Um, we don't have a vet in house. so. In the cases that we have rescued lorises, uh, we either take them to her rehabilitation center or if they are healthy, then they are released immediately back into the field. Um, I would say that we have been very lucky that we have not had that situation occur. Um, and in my personal opinion, I would say that if you are a rehabilitation center, then it might be possible depending on the loris's age to rehabilitate it. Um, because they do come become quite independent um, from a few months old. Um, but if you are not a rehabilitation center, then my suggestion would be to find someone who's qualified to to assist because that is a very difficult situation to be in. Yeah, I would also say what's interesting is in our population, they the animals don't disperse generally till they're two years old and often when they're three years old. And so having these very young animals, there, there may be a lot of information that they're missing if they're released much earlier. But we've had situations um, with, with rescue centers in Indonesia where um, all of the mothers died, um, leaving about 12 to 15 babies with two mothers, two lactating mothers. So we had to intervene. Most of those babies actually died. And then um, the ones that were still alive were released. Um, and that was again a government release that we had no control over, but it's very unlikely they survived. They were just um, several weeks to a few months old. I think the better experience for that question is from Marina, who has been successful releasing lorises at their dispersal age. And she also said earlier in her talk that they had san a one sanctuary born loris that ended up being able to survive. But I think in their case, they've been working for years to develop their release techniques with a really, really good diet and really good medical care. And most re releases of lorises are by people who haven't even surveyed the habitats and don't do, don't do any follow-up and don't radio track. So the chances of those lorises are much slimmer, I would say. Um, we are opening up the floor for more questions. So uh, our viewers, are uh, you can send in questions to any of the speakers right now. And I don't know if Marina, if she's still here, is she still here? I if she would like, there. she might be gone. I think she's gone. <laughs> I would say she could have answered that question as well, but I think mm -hmm. she's left. We'll just give it two minutes. Uh, do you find dispersal age of male and female offsprings the same? Again, questions to Esther. I think it's different. So yeah, we found uh, an observation that dispersing happens in two years old and some of in one years old, it's for female. But yeah, it's a bit different, I think, for each. Um, I think female. that the best way to say it is actually that it seems to be very um, individual dependent. Um, we have had females that have stayed with their family until three years old, at which age they would be um, perfectly capable of having their own family and they've chosen to stay um, with their par parental unit. On the other hand, we recently had a female disperse at 14 months old, which is one of the youngest that we've seen a loris attempt to disperse, at least in the last few years. Um, and they were both females. Um, we have a, a recently adult male who is still um, residing within his mother's home range, although he has moved slightly, the overlap has decreased slightly, but um, he's definitely still spending time with his mother and he is, he's two years old now. Um, 
and yeah males when they are dispersing I think you could say uh tend to be um what's the word that I'm looking for they spend a bit more time looking for a suitable home range they might choose one area meet the females in that area change their mind and move on um they could stay there for a month six months a year before they move on um females generally once they find a suitable area of habitat that doesn't have any aggressive other females they tend to be quite happy with that location whereas males are more focused on finding a lady than um potentially the habitat that they're they're choosing but yes but in terms of age it depends on on the area they're in if they're in a crowded area then they might try to leave earlier um similarly if they're very happy with their family then they might try and stay um so i wouldn't say that there's a difference in sex per se I think it would be nice if you tell a, a little bit about the relationship between the father and his playing and carrying behavior of the young. Because that's something that in captivity, they often separate the father when the female gives birth. Um, but in our experience, we have such a different experience with these very loving fathers. So I just wonder if you could describe a nice story when one of the males was um, carrying to his offspring. Lovely. So yeah, uh, it's my observation with Fernando and I saw him playing with Shakti for about an hour or more. So yeah, basically they just mock fighting and wrestling and uh, yeah, I think yeah, most of them like most of the most of the social behavior playing is like that. And I also found a sub adult male with an, an adult female, Lupi and Ellen. I saw them also playing, like more fighting also, and then hugging and then wrestling. So yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, our fathers spend a lot of time yeah. with their offspring. Yeah. Almost all of the lorises we follow are in steady family units mm. where there is a mother and a father. Um, and on most nights, our lorises can be found together at the beginning of the night and spend a significant portion of the night together. Um, and yeah, they, they intersperse mm -hmm. their time feeding with social behavior between father and father and offspring, mother and offspring, um, offspring playing together with each other, um, developing their skills and yeah, very social animals. Yeah. So, um, I think the next question is open to everyone. Uh, what can be done about government-led initiatives which aren't based on good conservation science? It seems like there is a theme across the talks of government who have the intention of adding protections, but which don't necessarily mandate actions in the Loris's best interest. For example, the thing that Professor Nikaris just said about Loris's being released too young. So... Who would like to take the question? <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe we should ask Hassan. Is Hassan there? <laughs> Put someone on the spot. <laughs> Hassan, could you unmute, please? <laughs> Ooh, maybe they've all gone. Yeah, he's shying away. I think every place government have their own shortcomings and they need to um, check not only the lorries but all the animals in the ecology and do what's best but sometimes because they might not have the expertise so it takes time you need to work with them give them time to understand and um, one thing that uh, we researchers lack is we do not uh, combine all ecological studies of all the flora and fauna in that place. I think that's very important so, uh, before we go to the government, you know, join hands with all the other researchers there studying on the different flora and fauna of the place, combine all the reports and then come up with a good uh, uh, management plan. See, that would work for the government. Hassan. <laughs> Oh, good answer. I, I don't want to answer this question. 
Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I think it's very difficult because uh, there are laws that are put in place, but if the laws aren't, in a lot of these countries, lores, well, in every country, lores are protected and other wildlife is protected. Um, and so it just seems consistently that um, other, depending on the amount of money or taxes, et cetera, the government can get by dealing with that intervention, they're more willing to work on those interventions. So if we have rosewood or, or like a wood traded that the government can confiscate and still sell, or if we have something like the drug trade or arms trade, it seems to get more attention than these issues with animals. And um, it's, it's just a big problem worldwide. Even if we look at the, the notorious lorises on YouTube or these slender lorises and photo props, um, if somebody was doing the same thing with, with the drug trade, it would be put off YouTube or it would be put off Facebook. But when it's an animal, nobody cares. So it's, I think it's a harder, um, it's considered a less urgent uh, set of initiatives for the government to take. And that's a big problem. And I think it will take people not going to certain countries for tourism or um, local people really rallying their politicians to get more onto wildlife issues than currently, and maybe something like a pandemic and diseases arising from wildlife markets will help that, um, but it hasn't so far. So we'll see what happens. Uh, in slender lorises, I think uh, the government is doing their part, but then the lorises exist more outside the sanctuaries, uh, the unprotected areas, the areas where people, which belong to the people on private properties and plantations. So. Uh, we are trying to change the minds of the local people more than the government to protect them. So the roles are kind of reversed. Yeah. We do have another general question too, um, which is from Nigel Griffiths, um, which is generally, do you think that the greater challenges for loris conservation across their range relate to individual interactions with humans? For example, for pet trade, superstition, electrocution, or a habitat loss and fragmentation a greater threat? I would say personally that um, of course habitat loss is the greatest threat to all of us, even to humans, um, because it's important for climate and et cetera. But lorises could do well, we had found out today in, in disturbed habitats. And so the fact that they are so persecuted by humans makes, that, makes it an incredibly greater threat. If they weren't persecuted by humans, they could at least persist a lot longer. But the persecution by humans at almost every possible way, as you said, from pets to medicines, to photoprops, to roads, to electrocutions, um, it really is, uh, it, it's definitely makes them, that's one of the reasons they're threatened, is a, a current declining loss on top of habitat loss. I'm sure one of the other panelists will have something to say about that in their own country and their own experience. In India, it's definitely the humans. The humans are uh, creating issues for the lorises, definitely. Local extinction is happening because of uh, hunting, over hunting of lorises, more than the habitat uh, destruction because lorises can adapt. They, they can adapt to changing environment. They can adapt to changing habitation. They can live among human beings. They can live away from human beings. But if the human beings leave them alone, I second what the Anab Man says. We do have a couple more questions and I know that we are right on time now. So do you want to take the extra questions or shall we finish up and then reply to those people on Facebook? We have three minutes, let's just see what they are. What, go ahead, why not? Um, so one of them is from Adrian Lingdo, which is, would it be better to release the loris to a protected area or release it back to the unprotected forest from where it was taken? rescued is what the villagers say. I, I, I very, feel very strongly about that question um, because we've had a lot of experience with that in Indonesia where we had lorises taken from an agricultural area and decided it was a good idea to release them or the, the re rescue centers decided it was a good idea to release them to a protected area. It didn't have the food sources they knew. It, it, it wasn't what they knew what to eat. If they didn't have the trees they knew as their home trees and they kept running out of the forest to go back into the agricultural area, which they perceived of as home. And I always say that as humans, uh, someone may come and look at us and say, oh, you should live in the rainforest naked. 
you must be so unhappy living in the northern hemisphere clothed and they pick you up and they drop you into the rainforest naked and they think you'll be happy but you'll likely die and this is also what's happening with lorises so i think more education is needed that lorises can live in human areas and we tend to think oh maybe it's a pet that escaped but often they are actually living in the human areas they walk on roofs they use power lines volleyball nets bridges roads we've seen them doing all sorts of crazy things one of the most amazing things i saw today was that laura's swimming um and so i think it's uh, they're very adaptable and they're very adaptable but they know where they are from they don't want to go somewhere that they don't know that would take a lot more rehabilitation I think one of the most one of the things that really struck me that you said recently was that they are like they're similar to squirrels in ways they like to live at the end of people's gardens or like on farmland um and I think I, I'm I'm not a researcher but I think that's kind of an imp an interesting way to look at it like it makes people understand exactly how adaptable they are um we do have one more question which is from Carly Murray um and she says is there any def definitive research related to the reasoning behind the whistling communication? For example, do you see whistling in the wild in the breeding seasons? And do the males or females whistle more? So I guess that could be one for Esther and Katie or, or you. Can I give the slender Lawrence view? Oh, we have lots of whistling happening at that time. There is an overwhelming whistling competition that happens. Who is louder than the other? Lots of running around and uh, whistles and grunts and fights. Um, and uh, I, I have not. And the communication happens so quickly, and it's quite dark. So making out, making uh, out the difference between males and females is not something that I have succeeded in. But uh, yes, uh, slow lot is. Someone else. Would you like to add anything? You... <laughs> sorry, everybody. Very sorry. Um, <laughs> just sorting out technical things <laughs> on all sides. Um, we're talking about vocalizations. I mean, it is very difficult for us to, to hear vocalizations in the forest because, as Anna said, uh, we think that a lot of the vocalizations that are occurring are actually ultrasonic. So the acoustic vocalizations that we hear um, are a very small portion of what we think is actually occurring. Um, so we do have equipment that we take into the field. We have an echo meter that um, detects ultrasonic uh, vocalizations. So this is something that we have, we have done uh, in the past, uh, a few years ago, um, we have done some small work on vocalizations but it's not something that we focus on specifically for a little while so we are hoping that it's something that we can look at more in the future now we have some nice new equipment um but it from what we have seen already vocalization is an incredibly important part of slow loris communication especially considering the size of their home range um the difficulty in finding each other they are small they are cryptic um and they are highly social so vocalization must play an important part in their um, in in communicating and having a social structure because simply they wouldn't you know they'd have a very difficult time finding each other um, if it wasn't for vocalizations and things so absolutely sorry about to join by a cat um, <laughs> um, so yeah absolutely it will play an important part in in mating it plays an important part in um, parent and offspring relationships and things like that. We hear a lot of um, agonistic vocalizations between males, um, particularly fighting over females. Um, so it is a way to both both communicate with um, in an affiliative way with, with your family members, with potential mates that you're interested in, but also a way to make it very, very clear that someone is not welcome in your home range or with your wife. <laughs> Okay, I think um, there's a question that, yeah, Francis or Jenny might want to answer as well about, does anyone have any experience with the process of rehabilitating captive born slow lorises with proper post release monitoring or that earlier question as well about, um, about working with animals and rescue centers, I don't know if you 
um, about releasing back to a protected versus unprotected forest. I don't know if either of you would like to comment on that. Yeah, I just wanted to mainly add uh, or agree with your answer that it's always better to release lorises in the place where they are coming from. It's happened to us in Sumatra that some farmer bring the young lorise to our center and uh, he just uh, wanted us to accept it and uh, take some care about this uh, lorise. It from I and he just told us that the lorise looks uh, uh, sick and it's why it's why he take him and but lorise was pretty well and uh, we just uh, had speak with him and uh, explain uh, that the lorise is uh, endangered and protected animals and it's better to keep it in the place where he take it from and then he just accepted it and we took it with him and released it in the same place and it was all well. So uh, in general, uh, it could also answer the question about uh, government release. I think we all as the Loris community should make Loris is more popular because we are quite small group and uh, we know a lot about Loris is, but uh, general public don't know this anymore much, uh, much and uh, it's same problem with the government. They don't know what this is, what this animal is they don't even like locals don't know it often the children don't know it often and they don't know it's protected animals and uh, then these situations happens so i think it's goal for all of us just make the popularity more popular and then it will bring more attention and less problems maybe And I, I guess then we should wrap up with the last question. And it would be lovely, whoever's still on board, if you could make one sentence, um, which is, um, are there any take home actions that we can do to make a difference to lorises and help conservation? So I think all the panelists will have a, a view on that if, if you're still there and we can go around and maybe Francis, I can start because you're still on the screen, <laughs> on my screen. Francis, we're waiting for you to give the one one line answer. Sorry, you didn't hear me. I, I was... how, how would you like people to uh, help in conversation, um, co conservation of lorises? I, I think I'm a little bit lost because I was speaking like one minute and you didn't hear me or? Oh, we heard about the government and we heard about getting, I guess you gave a good answer. We need to make them more okay. popular. Is that what you mean? Yeah, so how would you have people make them more popular? There's a better answer. Oh uh, yeah, how? Uh, uh, it depends, like uh, we all are uh, like, we as the conservation program have some, uh, some education programs and uh, some, some working with children in local level and some online uh, online programs, but uh, I was just uh, trying to motivate all of us to put more attention to not only like uh, like you are you do all all of you do great research and uh, we can use it for make it more popular. I'm like Anna do great job with everything and I saw that that you got to National Geographic yesterday and it's great job, but. We also need to more work with local governments in local levels and try to show them these articles and explain them that uh, loris is our issue and not only orangutans, for example, because there is like a huge community interesting about orangutan, tigers, everything, but they don't know what is what is loris and they don't know even it's living in their country. And uh, when they got this uh, to the hand, they just they just uh, do most simple thing and it's just release it behind the garden, I don't know. So we should like more cooperate with local governments and with local people. And so I don't have like clear question of how to do that. It's maybe more to our locals, uh, local people like uh, our local coordinators and uh, ask them how we could better reach governments and general public in Indonesia, India, everywhere. Um, Dr. Rupa, would you like to comment on that? 
Uh, yeah, I, I, will, I will always think that lorises are so fascinating. We should make a good animation or a movie or, you know, like Kung Fu Panda, like how, what it did to the pandas. I think uh, uh, we, sh- we need to do something about the lorises, you know, contact some Hollywood or Bollywood and make a very good animation and using your knowledge about the uh, life of lorises, how loving they are, what good fathers they are. I think we need to like bring it on to like mainstream kids are watching and maybe make a game you know like a video game and and like i don't know i i really want to do an animation series on the life secret lives of lorises you know what do they do what do they eat you know the vocalizations and i think they're so fascinating you guys really need to uh you know put your skills of what you've collected such lovely information into like a uh, movie you know and and get it across to children especially who will then become adults and then uh, you know it it gets around you know like the lions and the tigers and the pandas uh, so yeah get it mainstream you know i think they are uh, for too long been in the dark at night elusive nocturnal we need to bring the shine the light on them you know like not like the poachers but uh, yeah you guys need to really put your heads together you know and hopefully something good should come out of this thank you I see Professor Jude is still there. Do you have a a message from the Philippines? Yeah, maybe we really need to, because there are only very few areas where we have the slow loris and it's so far from us. So we really need to have an information campaign. Uh, I don't know how we can do that where we're in the north and they're in the southernmost part of the country. But um, we could start with the... schools maybe we can start with the schools there uh, wh- what we did in palawan that's another part where i uh, i work with um, wildlife conservation is to uh, give materials to the uh, grade schools uh, develop materials for grade schools and the children are the ones who tell their parents that this species is endemic to palawan then we need to conserve this. So I think because Simunor is such a small place, that should be very easy if somebody does it there. The problem is it's too far. So maybe um, if Liv can go there because he's in Mindanao, uh, maybe I can help too. Yeah. We can develop something. We can copy from, your, uh, from what you have done. Um, cartoons, uh, animated films, you know. Yes, very short films for children to enjoy. I would just like to say we have a couple of really charming children's books that could be translated into all of the range country languages. And we've already had them translated into Vietnamese, into Urdu, into um, Indonesian, into Thai. So I would love these books yeah. to be translated into other languages and we can make them all available at the very least online um, and then hopefully get them distributed. Yeah, the problem I, I can translate maybe maybe in Tagalog. That's our national language, Filipino. But the local language there, very few people know Tagalog in the south. You know, uh, you have to find somebody who knows the language because it's a different language from what we are, what from what we have here. So I would be very thankful if you can send us English and then we can translate. Okay, thank you. I think we, does anyone else have a last message they would like to say? I have one. Yep. Uh, I, I don't know if I don't say something what already happened or it's already agreed, but uh, from this last sentences, I just got the idea that it would be really, really great if from this conference would be made some Facebook groups. It should be kind of slow loris coalition where all of us can share all our work experience documents and everything uh, and so it could be way how all of us can stay more together and close and know each other and know about our work and uh yeah let's let's make kind of slow loris coalition all around the world I think that's a, that's a wonderful statement. And it's a, it was actually um, one of my 
you know, when we talked about what we would do for this Slow Loris Outreach Week, and then with Smitha, um, we got connected with the Slen Slender and Slow Loris meeting each other. And we were hoping to find someone from almost every Loris range country who could present something today for the first time using the Zoom as something to be able to be connected because it's so hard to fly everybody to one place to meet. And that's not an environmentally friendly way for us to connect. So since we do have the internet now and the internet is a force being used against slow lorises, it would be wonderful for it to be a force to be used for slow lorises and to, as you say, store all that information. And I think that's something where for, for all the speakers, you have been invited to a, a little after discussion uh, in one minute uh, from now, we still can have a break, but we, we can go on into that other Zoom session and we can discuss the, making that a possibility because I think it's really important. Um, so I would just personally like to thank uh, Smitha and Anna for really helping to organize this conference. I would like to thank everybody who watched and who asked questions. And I really hope people have learned more about Slender and Slow Lorises and are inspired to do conservation work for them and maybe even be inspired to help do some of these field studies, games, films, any of these things. Uh, just contact it up. You can contact us via Facebook. And if we get this coalition, we could share your information with others. And you also can write to us at info at littlefireface.org. And um, again, I can connect you with any of the speakers today if you are interested. So thank you so much. And Smitha and Anna, any last words? Thank you, everyone, for being so cooperative and uh, for tolerating all our countless emails. Uh, thank you for making this day happen. Thank you. And I just wanted to say thank you to all of our amazing speakers. Uh, the standard of the talks has been so high. I'm really impressed. Um, thank you for being so communicative with us as well. Um, and I hope that we can work together to improve the conservation of lorises. So thank you very much. And thank you to all the people who watch live on Facebook too. It's been great to have you. Okay, with that, I think we should stop this live stream onto Facebook. We will leave this Zoom meeting. And those of you who have a bit more time, go get a drink, cup of coffee, glass of water, whatever, and we will hopefully see you in the other Zoom link, which was sent. I can resend it through right now, just in case you've lost it. And we will see you over there. Okay.